Honorable members, we have went through the bill entitled Virgin Islands Trade Commission Act 2020, clause by clause. I therefore call upon the Premier and sponsor of the bill to report to this Honorable House. Mr. Speaker, I beg to report that the bill entitled Virgin Islands Trade Commission Act 2020 and the bill entitled as amended to also to now be read at Virgin Islands Trade Commission Act 2020 has passed through committee with amendments. Mr. Speaker, this is a golden moment for the territory. And I beg to report, and I beg to move that the bill entitled, as amended, Virgin Islands Trade Commission Act 2020, be read a third time and passed as amended. Thank you, Honorable Premier. It has been moved and seconded. Sorry, is there a second? Mr. Speaker, I stand to second the motion. Thank you, Deputy Premier. It has been moved and seconded that the bill entitled Virgin Islands Trade Commission Act 2020 be now read a third time and passed as amended. Those in favor? Those against? The motion is passed. I call upon the clerk to read the bill a third time. This act may be cited as the Virgin Islands Trade Commission Act 2020. The bill has been read a third time and passed with amendments. I call upon the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move uh, the this second and third reading of the bill entitled Consumer Protection Act and I move that it um, be read in 2020. And Mr. Speaker, I move that the bill shortly entitled Consumer Protection Act, uh, it was on the order paper, it's 2019, but we have to change it to 2020. So we will do that in the committee stage, and when we come out, we'll amend it. So Mr. Speaker, I would move since it has to be amended in the committee stage, and I'll start again by saying I move the second and third reading of the bill entitled Virgin Islands Trade Commission Act 2019. I move that the bill shortly entitled uh, Commission Protection Act 2019 be read a second time. Mr. Speaker, while I'm on my feet, I crave your indulgence to be able to explain some of the bill's objectives and some of the objects and reasons also. Mr. Speaker, this is a good day for the territory. And Mr. Speaker, today we have the second reading of the Consumer Protection Bill. Mr. Speaker, during the budget presentation in April and on May 7, the Consumer Protection Bill 2019 was tabled for first reading in the House of Assembly. Mr. Speaker, there's some highlights of the Consumer Protection Bill. And the Consumer Protection Bill provides for the promotion and protection of consumer interests 
in relation to the supply of goods and the provision of services to ensure protection of life, health, and safety of consumers and for other related matters. It is one of the interconnected pieces of legislation which forms the trade policy framework where the Trade Commission will be, administrative, will be the administrative body for giving teeth to the Consumer Protection Act when it becomes law. The Consumer Protection Bill, also before a select committee, was debated last year in the House of Assembly. As a result, some recommended amendments were made with regard to the regulation of price in order to address issues such as price gouging, especially during times of disaster, pandemic, and economic hardship. Government realized that there was already legislation to this end on the books since 1959 with the distribution and price of goods ordinance cap 286 of 1959. What we have ventured to do through the Consumer Protection Act is to repeal the old ordinance under customs by way of section 120. Once repealed, this would allow for the provisions of section 1192A of the Consumer Protection Act, where the minister may make regulations for regulating the distribution, purchase or sale of goods, or any class or description of goods. Upon approval of the bill in the House of Assembly, the minister, by way of cabinet decision, will make the necessary regulation to ensure fair business practices during times of disaster, pandemic, and hardship, uh, such as hurricane disaster and COVID-19 pandemic, among other catastrophic events. During times of crisis, changes in prices must be justifiable. Suppliers must furnish invoices, especially on needed items and those that have jumped exponential, exponentially. Price gouging will be tracked and offenders face some penalties stipulated in the Consumer Protection Act. Consumers are asked to keep receipts which should have the date of purchase as proof of increased price. It is important that with the implementation of such policies and regulations, consumers don't always assume the worst when dealing with purchases during difficult times. Not all price increases will be considered price gouging because price increases may occur globally and as such, it passed on to the, cons to the customer. We do, however, encourage vendors to also shop around for other suppliers for best price possible by monitoring trends and demands for their customer base. As you can see, the regulation will seek to create the balance needed between businesses and consumers to ensure equity and fair business practice. In keeping with the spirit of the constitutional traditions of the Westminster system, I wish to place on record that I, I am not engaged, neither directly nor indirectly, in the supply of any goods or services. Thus, I have absolutely no conflict of interest with respect to this consumer protection bill in that regard. Like all other residents of these blessed Virgin Islands, um, I am, however, a consumer. Mr. Speaker, I must make it clear and give credit that this bill started under the previous administration. Mr. Speaker, not wanting to preempt the members opposite, I think it is only fair to point out that the work on the legislation commenced under the previous administration. The then Junior Minister for Trade and Economic Development, Honorable Malam Penn, now Leader of the Opposition, led this initiative, so I know that it is important to him. In fact, except, except for the provisions of opera, operationalizing the Act and quite a few other adjustments, the other provisions are the same as those contained in the, in this, in the original version of the bill. Mr. Speaker, it's time to move this bill forward to implement consumer protection legislation to discourage unscrupulous business and consumer practices even during one of their most vulnerable times in their lives. Mr. Speaker, we all would remember that during the devastation that followed hurricanes Irma and Maria in 2017, there were reports of certain businesses hoarding goods and engaging in price gouging. The prices of items were, ex were essential to survival, such as 
foodstuff, water, cleaning supplies, candles and matches were hiked up on a desperate population. When these acts of inhumanity were exposed, Mr. Speaker, they began to pile excuses on top of excuses and mirror the subject of consumer protection in finger pointing and blame games. Mr. Speaker, it is no secret that many citizens felt that the reason consumer protection did not get off the ground was because of conflict of interest, a case of the fox standing guard at the hen house. You can doubt, you can doubt them. You can shout them down, Mr. Speaker, but they know the reality they live through. Mr. Speaker, more than 30 years, the people of this territory have been clamoring for legislation to protect them from unfair and unscrupulous trade practices. Numerous attempts at developing and introducing a framework for consumer protection have all been stillborn. For 30 years, all we have been getting on the topic of consumer protection is talk. And a big part of that problem is that consumer protection has been kicked around like a political football, presumably because of conflict of interest. Powerful, influential forces wanted to continue to exploit our people, and it was in their interest to keep our people vulnerable. Hence, the reason that it's clear that the hard-working then junior minister could not get the bill moving forward. I'm proud to say, Mr. Speaker, that the government that I am privileged to lead has been able to deliver on yet another long overdue critical contentious item. You see, Mr. Speaker, this government is not about playing games with the fortunes of our people. And Mr. Speaker, had it been moved forward before, it could have, this statement could have been said by those who have moved it before. And that's why I thank the junior minister, Mr. Speaker, for keeping the flame burning until we arrive. When Virgin Islanders elected us into office, they did not mandate us to sit on our hands and to warm our seats in this honorable house. They charged us to make the tough decisions and to solve the problems that have been undermining their quality of life and creating injustice for our people. It is about having the political will to do what is right for the people without fear or favor, affection or ill will. Mr. Speaker, in terms of public consultation, I need to highlight a few, areas, a few factors and areas. Mr. Speaker, it took only about four months of this government being in office to get the bill ready. And between July 9th to July 15, 2019, we held four public consultations on Tortola, Virgin Gorda, Annie Garda, and Justin Dykes for the general public and two sessions with the business community. And this was led by the then Junior Minister of Trade, Honorable Shari De Castro. Mr. Speaker, the purpose of these sessions was to increase public awareness and public education and to get feedback from the population with regards to the draft bill before bringing it to the House of Assembly. The views and concerns expressed by residents and members of the business community were taken into account and as we review the bill, we have tried as far as possible to incorporate as many suggestions as we could. Mr. Speaker, now moving forward, once the bill is, is, is approved by this honorable house and assented to, we will see, Mr. Speaker, that the new junior minister, Honorable Shireen Flax Charles, will be leading the charge on this. So, Mr. Speaker, this bill would have been historic from a point of view of junior ministers that it would have traversed between three junior ministers, Mr. Speaker, before coming to fruition. And I would have to add a fourth one, Mr. Speaker, because um, when there were some musical chairs on the government side, then Honorable Alvaro Maduro Keynes became the Junior Minister of Trade. So it would have traversed between four junior ministers, Mr. Speaker, before now coming to fruition through one Minister of Finance, which is now present. So I want to thank all those four junior ministers, three who walked with it before and the one who's going to walk with it now, Honorable Marlon Penn, Honorable Alvaro Maduro Keynes, Honorable Sherry De Castro, and now it's going to be Honorable Shireen Flax Charles, who will be leading the charge as junior minister on behalf of the minister for the subject, which is the premier minister of finance. So, Mr. Speaker, this bill is balanced. It passed through two men and two women. So, I want to say com commendations to the team, 
And on that note, Mr. Speaker, I must thank and congratulate the hard-working team that brought this elusive consumer protection legislation to reality. Mr. Speaker, I cannot forget the staff at the Department of Trade personnel from Premier Special Projects, the Honorable Attorney General and his staff, our consultant, Mr. Speaker, a hard-working young lady that uh, we will retain because we have about 49 more, uh, about 47 more bills to come forward to make sure fair practices and also entrepreneurship in many other areas and how we're going to divide persons who are in the wholesale from the retail and many, many other legislation will be coming here to make sure that there's a balance of fairness between the consumer, Mr. Speaker, and the, the business persons, Mr. Speaker, and teeth that will be in each bill which will be passed to make sure that there are consequences for actions where the, when there's not fairness among those who are selling and those who are buying. So, Mr. Speaker, our consultant, Mr. Speaker, I must thank uh, Ms. Aisha, our junior minister, as I said, all four of them, especially Honorable Sherry De Castro, who took up this project and uh, the, went through with the businesses and all the public meetings in 2019. And, Mr. Speaker, I must thank Ms. Mr. George in the Premier's office and all uh, Ms. Elbia Madhu and all those who helped with the paper and the, the PSs and the members of the business community as well. They had a very integral role to play, especially in the public meetings. Uh, so the business community as well as consumers who contributed their voices to the process. So Mr. Speaker, this was able to be properly ventilated in the public in 2019. And now, Mr. Speaker, I must say that in that light, I'm not, there's no, nothing about taking sides. And when I said that, Mr. Speaker, I want to state at the outset that my government is as much pro-business as we are pro-consumer. We believe in treating everyone fairly. This is not about picking sides or trying to punish or control anyone. You will find when you examine the proposed bill that there's an attempt to strike a balance. While the law will impose certain expectations on businesses, there are provisions to prevent abuse by consumers who may try to make frivolous or fraudulent claims. So, Mr. Speaker, but we must make sure that we do this because not all businesses are bad. It is necessary also to acknowledge, Mr. Speaker, that the vast majority of businesses in the territory already practice the highest standards of morals and professionalism in treating with customers. For these businesses, there's not much that you will need to do. There are just a handful of proprietors who abuse their position as suppliers and who have given the business sector a bad name. It is my hope that those errant individuals will take heed of the letter and spirit of the law so that there will be no cause for them to experience the consequences of this law. So, Mr. Speaker, that's why the consumer protection is about fairness. Mr. Speaker, as you will be aware, consumer protection has to do with the rights of consumers, fair trade, competition, and accurate information in the marketplace. It is about ensuring that there is clarity in the mind of the consumer over what he or she is paying for and what they receive for their money, whether it is goods or services. Part of that process involves honesty and accuracy in the advertisement of the offer. The price should be fair and clearly identified. There should be no deception. The quality, features, and functionality of the item should also be clearly and truthfully represented. In, represented. There should not be any hidden surprises. What is delivered should match what was ordered and the customer should not be forced to pay for goods or the return of goods that they did not order. These are some of the issues that consumer protection legislation addresses, and our consumer protection framework will address these issues. Mr. Speaker, that's why we must apply international best practices. Because, Mr. Speaker, the, pro the proposed bill is based on the model CARICON Consumer Affairs Protection Bill which sought to harmonize the law in relation to the protection of consumer interests in the region. Consumer protection legislation in most jurisdictions 
tend to address more or less the same issues and situations. In this regard, we are not reinventing the wheel. And might I add, neither was the former administration when they were working on the consumer protection. By following this model and enacting consumer protection laws, we are also streamlining ourselves with international best practice for trading in goods and services. We have to remember, Mr. Speaker, that the BVI's customer base consists of not just locals, but tourists and foreigners. So we have to align ourselves with international best practice, especially if we want to look at exporting our goods and services in the future. Mr. Speaker, one may ask, how will the act work? Well, I'm glad that they asked. In a nutshell, Mr. Speaker, when this legislation is implemented, the Virgin Islands Trade Commission will have the power to receive complaints about possible breaches of the Act. The Commission, if it is satisfied that the complaint has merit, can initiate an investigation into the matter. The Commission can also initiate investigation on its own if it feels that a situation warrants it. If the supplier of the good or service is found to be in breach of the Act, they will be so notified by the Commission which will issue directions on what the business must do to rectify the situation. If the company fails to comply with the directions, then the Commission can institute proceedings against the business before a tribunal or in the court. Persons aggrieved by a decision of the Commission can launch an appeal before the tribunal within 30 days of the receipt of the decision. Mr. Speaker, there's also the relief through the court. It is important to note, Mr. Speaker, that an agreed consumer sh still has the option to seek redress through the courts instead of through the Commission. However, the consumer cannot pursue both options simultaneously. This raises a very important point for business owners to take note of. Many of the issues with respect to quality, performance, safety, and negligence can already be pursued by a consumer via the civil courts. Certain types of issues can currently lead to criminal prosecution. So from that perspective, Mr. Speaker, the customer already has rights, and the customer already always had an avenue for recourse. But we all know that going through the court system can take time and cost money. And sometimes, depending on the value of the item at the heart of the dispute, the candle may cost more than the funeral. However, the Consumer Protection Act will provide a faster and less costly option for resolving these disputes. This, of course, means that where, whereas in the past the customer might have been better off cutting their losses and moving on, with consumer protection being brought into effect, this may not be the case anymore. So justice is being brought within the reach of the ordinary man. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we also have to have protection from frivolous claims. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, I must point out the Act offers some protection to businesses. The Trade Commission, which will be responsible for administration of the Act, will determine whether a complaint received has merit for further investigation and will investigate if necessary. Either party has recourse to appeal if dissatisfied with the outcome of the complaint or investigation. It should be noted that the Commission will have the power to initiate investigations on its own. The Commission will be the shield between the business community and individuals who may wish to attempt frivolous or fraudulent claims. Such claims, the Commission has the power to deny or to discontinue. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure businesses that government is not trying or will be running your business. Mr. Speaker, it is also necessary to assure the business community that consumer protection legislation does not mean that the government is coming to micromanage your business or to dictate how you should price or what profit you should make. As in all free markets, consumer preference and market forces are the ultimate arbiters with respect to marketing decisions. Consumer seeks value for money. Poor quality goods or services unreasonable overpricing and poor customer service will discourage business from an informed customer.
The only situation in which this act will intervene into pricing and supplies issues is in the case of a natural disaster or state of emergency where it is necessary to prevent hoarding and price gouging of basic essential items as occurred in 2017 when back-to-back -back hurricanes crippled the territory and certain suppliers held residents to ransom to squeeze an extra buck out of them. You see, Mr. Speaker, we are well aware of the dynamics of the business environment. Most, if not all, of the goods we consume has to be imported because they are not produced within the territory. The cost of goods can be affected by clim climatic or social conditions in the country of production or manufacture. Fuel prices with, if affect, will affect shipping cost and other forces that the consumer may not be aware of, but which the importer and wholesaler or retailer faces. Additionally, the business also has its overheads, such as utilities and salaries, which also add to the cost price. And these are costs that have to be passed on to the consumer. Plus, the business needs to make a profit. There's nothing wrong with that. So BVI businesses must thrive and grow. Mr. Speaker, the success of our economy depends on our business community being able to do well. The government wants to see all businesses throughout the territory prospering and growing. Our business community provides employment for citizens and residents who contribute to the economy. The more our businesses thrive, the more they contribute to the economic system and the more cooperation tax revenues they provide, the more cooperation tax revenues they provide for the government to implement its development program. You see, Mr. Speaker, it's a win-win. A rising tide lifts all boats. It is as simple as that. In the task of restoring vibrancy to our economy, the business community is an essential partner for achieving that. The BVI has tremendous untapped potential. There are areas that we could be excelling in right now, but we have to stop majoring in the minor. And that's why we've been developing new business opportunities. Mr. Speaker, I've said it before, a lot is changing in the world. The things that have worked well for us in the past cannot be relied upon to take us into the future. We need to increase our revenues. We need to develop new revenue streams and new industries. Our BVI businesses need to be able to compete among themselves as well as with other businesses in the global market. In due course, Mr. Speaker, the government will be inviting the general public to tell us how we in the government can facilitate the development of new industries and new economic opportunities and what we can do to help existing industries to grow. Mr. Speaker, we have done this already and Mr. Speaker, we'll be opening up to do it even some more amidst even COVID-19, Mr. Speaker, because we are in this together. So we believe in a revamping business environment. Mr. Speaker, in order to facilitate and drive this revolution in our business sector in this new regular and living and working with COVID-19, the government is working on a number of policy initiatives that will create the kind of environment that is conducive to healthy business activity and growth. Mr. Speaker, as stated before, Mr. Speaker, there are around 49 legislations geared at coming towards this Honorable House for approval to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we create entrepreneurs, make sure there are best practices for consumer and or business people, Mr. Speaker, and to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we leap the BVI into another dimension, a higher dimension of economic activities and prosperity. Businesses must be proactive though. Our businesses, business model are becoming less viable daily. And that is why the transformation is necessary. And this is why I want to urge the business community to approach the arrival of consumer protection legislation with a positive, proactive, optimistic mindset. I want to ask suppliers of goods and services to look at what the act requires of them and use that as a guide to guide and to ensure that you do what you are supposed to do. For the most part, most businesses, as I stated before, are already doing these things. But the act can serve as a checklist so that gaps can be filled in and minimized. Once a business is paying attention to its details and being honest in its dealings, 
Mr. Speaker, no one should have anything to complain about. Mr. Speaker, that's why it's important for consumer satisfaction. Mr. Speaker, the watchword in today's business environment is customer satisfaction. And when you look at the provisions of this bill, they really follow the basis of what uh, good business practices. Good practices satisfy customers. Satisfied customers become repeat customers. They encourage others to buy. And this grows your profits and your business and your reputation, but also our country. Conversely, Mr. Speaker, one dissatisfied customer will discourage 10 others from coming to your business. And in today's age of social media, they can communicate to hundreds and thousands, even overseas, in just seconds. So treat your customers well. Show them respect. Satisfy their needs and give them value for money. And they will give you repeat business and refer their friends and family. Do the opposite and they will buy from someone else. And that truth holds regardless of what laws are on the books. So Mr. Speaker, I turn to our service industries. Mr. Speaker, we hope at the, some point, and we hope at some point in time to attract a high volume of tourist traffic. Mr. Speaker, now is the time for us to take a step back and appreciate the impact that customer satisfaction has on our national economy. And building a quality ecosystem comes into play at this time. Mr. Speaker, it is my hope that as we tackle issues that affect the domestic consumer market, in the process, we will automatically address our, cons our customer service standards. And we would start moving in the direction of creating a quality ecosystem. We need to recognize how everything is interconnected and by making quality a part of our culture, it will become engraved in everything we do. It will become second nature. We need to create a culture of quality. We need to build a quality ecosystem and consumer protection legislation may be the catalyst to get us moving in that direction. This way, I see us moving stronger than ever. And the way I see it, Mr. Speaker, consumer protection legislation will increase our awareness of the quality of the goods and services we receive and provide. This will lead to greater care in how we treat our customers and eventually it will become second nature and will no longer be having discussions about inadequate customer service. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's why we must look at the bottom line benefits. Because, Mr. Speaker, providing quality goods and services and value for money by adopting a culture of quality and using the consumer protection legislation as a guide, our local businesses will see an improvement in their bottom line. Poor quality goods and service can cause a business to lose money in several different ways, sometimes simultaneously. Substandard goods and services drive away customers. They cost the business, in, 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 they, cost the, they cost the business sometimes to be in recall or replacement, or sometimes the cost is to rework. They can cause proprietors in litigation and paying damages to affect customers. In the absence of quality, standards and cons consumer protection, a company's competitors can engage in unfair pr trade practices and put the business at a disadvantage or cause that industry to crash. Adopting a culture of quality minimizes and even eliminates sources of leakage and results in an increased revenue and profit to businesses. Increased retained earnings can then be invested into new business ventures and make even more money for the business owners. I am sure you would agree with me, Mr. Speaker, that when you look at the consumer protection from this angle, it does not seem like anything to worry about. And there are a lot of benefits for both consumers and suppliers, many of which do not get popular airplay. Consumer protection was one of the high priority issues identified by citizens when they handed us our mandate. The legislation will improve our citizens' quality of life. It will go a long way in creating the business environment that the BVI needs to take 
on the economic challenges that lie ahead and which we will have no choice but to confront and conquer. Mr. Speaker, having said all of that, I say to God be the glory, great things he has done for allowing us, Mr. Speaker, to finally bring to this honorable house the Consumer Protection Act, Mr. Speaker, for debate, and then, Mr. Speaker, to go in the committee stage for full de deliberation and ventilation of all areas so that when we are finished, Mr. Speaker, we can bring, for, bring forward a bill that will be passed that will improve the quality of life of the people of the Virgin Islands and be able, Mr. Speaker, to fulfill a 30-year long cry of the people that seem to have been unheard but now will be answered. And Mr. Speaker, for that I say thank you and may God bless our Virgin Islands. And Mr. Speaker, I so move. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second this bill and while I'm my feet, I'll, I'll make my contribution. So this bill has been moved and seconded. The floor is open for debate. Leader of the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I want to officially, first and foremost, put on the record my support for the passage of the Consumer Protection Act 2019, but eventually we named 2020. So, Speaker, this bill has been long in coming, and I want to join with the sentiments raised by the Premier, not all of them, but the guidelines that spoke to what the bill represents and what its intent is. Uh, I think he laid out very well um, in the objects and reasons, um, the aspects of the bill, and how the bill intends to help the people of this territory, not just the consumers, but also the aspects that deals with the business sector. So speaker, we have debated this bill already last year. I think we were very exhaustive in our debate. So I wouldn't go, wouldn't be too long, I wouldn't go in depth in terms of those specific details. But what I would say is that this is a good day for the people of this territory that we finally, both business and consumers, that we finally at the finish line at least to have the legislature and the statute put in place to ensure that there's some level of regulation as it relates to the consumer markets and the way business operates within the territory and protection for businesses and consumers. I, I also want to let persons know that this had to precede the Trade Commission because the Trade Commission is the vehicle that will drive the activities in terms of consumer activity and the specifics as it relates to how issue of fair trade and fair practices will operate. The commission will be the vehicle or the, or the um, statutory organization that will handle the operational apparatus of these pieces of legislation. Speaker, I, when I came to the House in 2011, I came to do the people work and, I, and the people's work. People of the district first and foremost sent me here and I was given some tremendous opportunities in leadership positions so far in my young tenure in the Honorable House of Assembly. And I work for the people of this territory. And I, I'm glad that, as I always say, government is a continuum. This project started, this process started many years ago. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that the Premier and his government saw it fit to continue the process of making this law a reality for this territory. And all 13 of us, I have, I have no objection. I don't see any, I didn't hear any in the last debate. I don't expect or foresee any now in terms of moving this piece of legislation forward for the benefit of all the people of this territory. And I want to commend, and, I, and there's always this notion that how because we're in opposition, we just oppo opposing for opposing sake. There are a lot of things that we agree on. And when I agree, I will stand and say when I agree. And when I disagree, I'll also do the same. And this is one of those instances where I agree. This is something that is in the best interest of the people of this territory. And I stand here in support of this bill. As I said, I won't be too long, but a couple of things that I want to point out. Specifically, 
as it relates to the repealing of the section in the customs ordinance. I think that's one of the areas that we were discussing when I was working with this legislation in terms of how are we going to be able to protect persons, not price control, but have a level of protection in areas of disaster, in areas of, of severe hardship. I know we looked at the way St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands does it through, through, through their, their statute and through their legislation, where when there's a, 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 a pending, a impending storm, they put in place um, a, a list of, of goods, key goods and services, key, key goods and services, and ensure that the price is kept at that price. And, and during the disaster, there's no increase in price or, or price gouging, as you would say, unless there's a show where there's an increased price in terms of the importation of those goods um, or application of those services. I know there's, there's some, uh, an amendment that is coming forward, Honorable AG, in this current legislation to support disasters, to support um, pandemics, as the Premier said, and other type of hardship. I think we just have to be very careful how we craft that amendment. I'm looking forward to the discussion, but I think it's important to have those kind of measures in place because we see what happened after Hurricane Zoma Maria. Ice prices shoot through the roof. Price, the cost of a bag of ice, basic commodities that persons needed to survive, water, ice. And even after COVID-19, we saw some suppliers were selling a case of water for $10. Um, so, so those are the instances that we have to guard against for our people to ensure that there's su sufficient coverage for sufficient protection of the working population or the consumer base from persons who are unscrupulous. And the reality is the majority of our businesses are good stewards, good corporate citizens, oftentimes give back in, in disaster situations, hold on to employees even though they're not working, pay them half salary and do a lot of the good things that good corporate citizens should do. But there are always those persons that we have to guard against. And you need to have those protections in place to ensure that you have the mechanisms in the legislative framework to protect your people. So I'm happy that we found the language to be able to have that level of protection. I'm looking forward for us going through the legislation clause by clause to ensure that that is put in place in particular because I know it's important to protect our people from those type of unscrupulous behavior. The other thing, other area, which is not currently in this legislation, but something I want to bring to the attention of the list in public, is that the issue of fair trade, this fair, fair trade legislation, which should be coming shortly. I know the Premier mentioned the list of legislations that were drafted previously and some new ones that, that they've drafted. This one is important for many reasons. We have to ensure that there's a fair and level playing field in the consumer markets, in the business arena. You heard the issue where the persons who are bringing in the products, the wholesaler, is still at the same point competing with the persons who they're selling the products to. That can't lend itself for fair competition. You need legislative framework to be able to guard against that type of behavior and ensure that there's no unfair competitive advantage to persons who are trying to survive in the business market. The whole issue of antitrust and monopolies, that is a critical component that we have to really look at. And I think the, the antitrust legislation in the US, as big as their economy is, to ensure that they protect businesses within their economic climate and economic environment. And we in the BVI, as a small economy, also have to be very careful how we allow big businesses to come into our territory, how we allow them to set up shop in the BVI and, and manage the, and understand the implication, the tacon implication of those businesses operating within our economic environment. We already have the advent of the Amazons of the world. And what Amazon has done in terms of its impact on small businesses functioning in, within an environment, while you, you don't want to restrict persons' right 
to have variety or right of choice. We also have to look at how these entities impact the businesses on the ground that drives the economy of your territory. And we also have to educate our public, our populace, on how their consumer behavior sometimes have an adverse effect on the overall global picture and the overall local economic picture and how we could create some, that, some, some dire situation for businesses, for infrastructure, and all the things that trickle down from economic activity in our territory. So we have to be mindful of these things. You know, there's an education campaign that, has to, that, that we have to conduct. We also have to help our businesses to step up their game as well, to be able to be innovative, to be able to offer this, the variety that persons are looking for um, in a creative and innovative way. We have to look at how we could, 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 could create that diverse offering, product offering across the scope. And sometimes it might mean that we have to work collaboratively in our business climate to be able to compete. And, and those are things and those are discussions where the Trade Commission and the education arm of the Trade Commission will come in to ensure that they help and protect and develop and, and, and prop up our business, businesses within our community, to help them to be efficient, to be more effective in the way that they do business. And all these things are all tied into each other. So, so it's important for us to ensure that we not just put these pieces of legislation in place, but ensure that we, in, that we ensure that the educational aspect of it goes out there. We have the, the continuous public campaigns to ensure that our businesses understand, our consumers understand, and that where we have to put the mechanisms in place to protect, to some degree, the economy and the business sector in the territory. So I rise with those few words just to, to really strengthen what the Premier did so well, um, most of what he did so well. All the other things I, I, he, I can't speak to, some of them, um, but it is what it is. We're here. Nonetheless, a lot of work went in to this. A lot of support was given, and, and I want to publicly acknowledge the team at the Premier's office for the work that they did to get this legislation to the point that it is right now. Because, I mean, I, I think we had a, a, a less than a four-man, three-man crack team that, that worked tirelessly. We, we, we went all around the region. We had meetings with the trade task force in the Reef Caricom Trade Task Force that had a framework already in place that we worked along with them to ensure that we were part and included in that process to ensure that we, whatever benefits the rest of other Caribbean nations had, we had. We had the support of COSME, an EU program that helped us with funding a lot of the work, the consultancies that we needed, funding a lot of the, 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 the detailed work that was required to get this legislation up to where it is right now, and the policy documents to where they were, and get us to really engage with our, um, with our agencies around the region to get ideas from how they're doing and applying their consumer protection legislation, which went into in the final document that we have today. So we really, we really is important, those partnerships with the EU and whomever are important for us, the CARICOM, the OECS, to ensure that we work collaboratively, that we don't go out and try to reinvent the wheel, try to, to go out there and start things from scratch, where there are models that could work and could be tweaked to our special and unique circumstances within the territory. And we were able to do that with the support of, of all these organizations. We were also able to join um, KAIPA, it's a Caribbean Association of Investment uh, Practitioners, where we now have, as part of the Trade Commission, the investment portion of it, the investment portfolio. So you now have a, des a designated, dedicated arm through the Trade Commission responsible for investments and management investments in the territory. And that's not just foreign direct investments. That is investments in terms of local investments on the ground. We have a lot of our Virgin Islanders who have had made significant investment in the economy of the territory, the infrastructure of the territory, 
and they need to be treated just as we treat our foreign direct investors. They need to have access to a streamlined process to ensure that their applications are expedited. If they're doing, looking at doing a, a further investment, we need to hold their hands and support them through that process, just like we do for the foreign direct investments and foreign direct investors. So these things are in place, are going to be in place now. I think it's a, it's a good time for us to start to look at fast-tracking the whole issue of economic diversification. It is critical for us, especially in light of what's happening with COVID-19 and all the, the, the things that preceded COVID-19, the floods of August 2017, hurricane, hurricanes Irma and Maria, and we saw how vulnerable we are as it is to these disasters in our businesses, how vulnerable our businesses are, and the need for us to innovate, the need for us to diversify, the need for us to ensure that we have that business continuity plan in the event of any disaster, in the event of any uh, pandemic or anything that might come our way. Because I'm sure we were here saying, all of us were saying, have, didn't expect COVID-19. After Hurricane Zoma and Maria, we never thought we would go into, it could have been another hurricane or earthquake, but not something like what COVID-19 has thrown our way. So business continuity, planning, and innovation, and innovative thinking in terms of how you operate your business is important, it's critical. And the commission is will be responsible for ensuring that that conversation stays alive, that those opportunities are, are, are looked at. Even before a business person comes up with an idea, they should have a series of ideas or possibilities in our current business climate, new opportunities that persons could explore. So there are those things that are, that, that are intended, what, that were intended when we were working on this legislation. I know that the thinking is still the same, Premier. I know you've continued along that same frame of thought. And I know that you have good people behind of you in the, in the ministry to get that done. Um, Lizette George, again, I commend her. Ms. Aisha, Sammy, who worked well uh, with us to get, this, get us where we are as well. And all the other persons who worked in the background to make this this piece of legislation, all the ones to come, um, bring them where they are today. I really want to, to commend them. I want to um, acknowledge them for their efforts. Um, oftentimes, you hear all the negativity about the civil service and what they're doing and not doing, and et cetera, et cetera. You hardly hear about the good stories and the hard work that many civil servants do on a daily basis to keep this country going keep the public service lights on, and to, to start a spark the innovative train of thoughts throughout the development of this territory. So I want to commend all the hardworking public service, public, public servants, public officers. I, I think we, we, we've done away with the, the term servants. So all the, all the hardworking public officers who continue to do their part to keep the the territory of the Virgin Islands moving. And I think you need to be commended for your efforts, especially during times of tragedy, times of disaster. You continuously go above and beyond the call of duty. I also, before I close, want to acknowledge the junior ministers who have taken up the mantle to move this initiative forward. Honorable Maduro, Maduro Keynes, Honorable um, De Castro, and Honorable Flax Charles, who, who's now taking the mantle to move this forward. I know they're all three very good, great women who would work hard to do what's in the best interest of the territory. I support this piece of legislation, as I said, from the offset. And yes, we don't always disagree. There are always some commonalities or, or things that we do agree on. Sometimes it's just the methodology in getting there. But Premier, I commend you for bringing this legislation to the House. You have my full support, and I look forward for us to have the more detailed discourse and discussion in the committee stage. I thank you. I thank the Leader of the Opposition and member for the 8th District, the Honorable Marlon A. Penn. At this time, I recognize the Deputy Premier and Minister for Health and Social Development, 
and territorial member, the Honorable Corbin Malone. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for affording me the opportunity to um, speak on this very important uh, piece of legislation here. The, the fact is, is that um, when you when you work and when history records what all you have done in this House of Assembly, sometimes these very important measures get overlooked. They're not brick, they're not mortar, and um, you can't go and touch them, but it improves your life. And it takes a lot of time to get it here because here we are, 48 years since 1972 when President Kennedy first got this consumer rights into the American legislation. And as the members have said, and in fact, they have done such a marvelous job in terms of introducing this, and um, the honorable leader of the opposition would be quite keen that um, I allow him to rise to his feet and second this bill because of the many works. I was looking for, uh, you know, in terms of all of the persons who have lent, lent their time and their support and their efforts in making sure that this happened. And I would have to create some balance because with the rights of the consumer come also the responsibility of the consumer. And I was doing some research on this and um, when was this first introduced to the House? It was in 2019, way back in January or sometime, and so forth, and then it had to be. Well, not introduced, but in terms of, um, you know, um, it, was, it was in the making for quite a bit. That's right. So, so it's, uh, <laughs> data are always important. They're the responsibilities of the consumer, we'll get to that, but Let's look at, um, and these were repeated, but just um, to emphasize them. We started with six rights of the consumer, but they're now up to about eight. And there are going to be more that's added. The right uh, for basic needs, the right to safety, the right to information, the right to choose, the right to representation, the right to redress, the right to consumer education, and the right to healthy environment. So all these rights converge to make sure that when you go to the supermarket, to the store, to a service center, that you are protected in all ways in terms of getting all of these rights protected. You're right. We have, in some regards, quite, um, quite a challenge because we don't produce any of the things that we use. And some, some, in fact, some of the packages come here and they say, well, they come from other places and they say for export only. Now, what I am never sure of is whether or not they cannot be used in the markets from where they're purchased because of some relaxation in um, quality, in content, and the whole manufacturing aspects of it. So I'm always curious when a product comes and say, for export only. Mr. Speaker, the, um, it creates a challenge only in that if you get this product and you have spent money to take it from certain parts, well, America is where we trade with most. We, we, uh, we get it from Washington State, for instance, and you have to pay for it to get to Florida, have to pay to, to get to the transit port, whether in Puerto Rico or St. Thomas, then you have to pay to get it over here. 
and you come and you find, well, this is not what I ordered. <laughs> um, if you purchased it through the, to the supplier here in the Virgin Islands, well then, you can beat up on that person because at the end of the day, they should have brought to you what you ordered. If you purchased it directly from manufacturer or from wholesaler, well, of course, well, then you have an issue. So some of these rights will go into effect because you don't have any, I think the AG will agree with me, you don't have any jurisdictional authority over some, <laughs> some of the other areas um, that you will purchase these um, items from. But, Mr. Speaker, the, um, when, we, when we look, because uh, it was so simple back then, I, I'm not afraid to say, you know, when you, when you grew up in the early 60s and 70s, you, you, um, you go, you buy your bread, and you lay it in it down with butter, and you put some cheese between this, and you go ahead and you eat away. Now you have to look at, you have to read the label. What is involved in, in your cheese? What's involved in your butter? What's involved in your yeast? What's involved, even the packaging that you have to make sure that we'll do. And um, I'm into the recycling issues now, so we have to make sure that all of the protection from your supplier is afforded to you. And it is just amazing that the more advanced a society comes, the more laws they need to protect you. The more advanced a society, the more laws they need. Because you can't, um, well, Premier, I'm using more and more of your quotations. It is not what's expected, it's only what inspected. So you have to look at dates and labels. You have to make sure that um, if you um, justify or if you promote that taking this pill would lose you 20 pounds in 20 days, that you don't have the false advertisement. But that might well be what's written on the bottle, on the can. So you have to then rely on uh, what is written there, and um, you can well can you get in trouble for that, AJ? If there is a false promotion on it? This one, no, that for this one now. But you did not manufacture it. Yeah. That pill came in. And um, at the end of the day, I am looking for my scale to read properly. 20 pounds in 20 days gone. It didn't tell me to eat less, exercise more, or anything. 20 pounds in 20 days, that's what it says. So. <laughs> So at the end of the day, so it comes then to the responsibility of the consumer. Consumer has a responsibility to, to inform yourself before purchasing. While consumers have the right to be informed, they must also inform themselves to the best of their abilities about products and service knowledge. Whether you are purchasing equipment for your home or receiving treatment at a hospital, you need to know what other comparable products are on the market. With the information you have to, uh, you have a chance to choose the best product and service for your needs. If it is too good to be true, then uh, you know, you have to do it. 20 pounds in 20 days, all of us will be um, like my honorable, fashionable minister. Slim, bam, but he watches what he eat. So he doesn't rely on this false advertisement, right, for information. You have the right, you have the responsibility to read and follow the instructions. Read the manual. Most males refuse to read the manual. It is only when, <laughs> it's only when they cannot get the apparatus configured and they can't use the particular product, they go back and see what the manual says. Read the manual. Um, under the tree, I say, you know, add a few more words so that you could clearly understand each other. So products come with instructions. 
warnings, and fine print. It is, important, uh, it is an important consumer responsibility to read the literature that comes with the products or service when buying. Often consumer injury, misuse, and the uh, breakage happens when instructions are not followed or fine print is not read. The fine print that comes with a credit card agreement and the warnings on children's toys are especially important to utilize. Sometimes reading a four font instruction is quite difficult. And I think that some of the warnings come so that you don't read them. Because you know, um, the higher up you get in age, the, the worse is your eyesight. So you, know, um, you can't do. You have the responsibility to use the products and services properly. If it says to take two pills four times a day, it is not as effective to take the eight pills on one sitting. You have to use it properly, Mr. Speaker. Two pills four times a day assumes that you're going to take some six hour intervals. You cannot take all eight one time. You have to use products properly. You have the responsibility to speak out against wrongdoing. One of the main legal rights of consumer is to speak out and defend yourself when you feel a company or an organization has wronged you. This is an ethical choice in the hopes of preventing other consumers from being wronged by the same business. Most companies have a complaint department uh, you can call um, and you can advocate your position. You also have the option of contacting the, um, you know, the services. So as we go along, there's always going to be the protective right division, uh, the place where you can go and lodge your complaint. I think we have the complaint uh, commission here. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can carry your, your findings to the complaint commission and, and have it addressed. Um, you have to know the consumer responsibility for purchasing. It may seem to go without saying, but your consumer rights avoid in many cases if you have not purchased a good or service legally or in the way it is intended to be purchased. We have many examples of that. You can't buy a stolen product and go to the court to say that um, you have been wronged. Is this isn't this not true, AG? Or if the good is illegal, you can go buy illegal goods and then complain that <laughs> it is not doing the job. I still have a low. <laughs> and you know, you get in this particular product that was intended for other purpose. So Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, the consumer have responsibilities. Now, as I said, we must be mindful, Mr. Speaker, that in some of these, because there have been a, there have been a, um, there been a cry, because um, um, Honorable uh, Vincent, since he's not here, I would, I would, um, I would leave the job of defending the vendors to Honorable Vincent Whitley. He's not here to tell me no, so I'll leave the job to him. Because we have some, <laughs> some of the other uh, protection that we have to do. Because um, in, in a place where, as I mentioned before, the cost of business could be deemed as higher than the direct, because America found its way in terms of commerce because it linked the farthest northwest state, I think it's Oregon or Washington, to the farthest southeastern state, Florida. And you can drive from Washington to Florida interstate, whether by vehicle, whether by train, or you can indeed fly. So commerce was made less expensive because you can get your goods to market. Here we are in the Caribbean. and. 
if you want to get a product, and I think that the Premier has been brilliant in terms of getting the, um, all of the island nations together to see how best we can get products to market. We have things that we do here in Virgin Islands that can go to other places in the Caribbean. We have places, well, other places in the Caribbean that can bring products here. But the cost of bringing your product to market has been a cost prohibitive factor that must be addressed, whether or not you'll do it. Um, the good old Liat has been um, on life support for quite a bit. But if you cannot get from point A to point B, then you have issues. So whether it is by transportation, whether it is by getting the, um, a fruit or mango or a coconut, a sour sap, because we used to feed, we used to feed a lot of other places. <laughs> we used to carry or, or meat down or cattle down or agricultural products down. And then of course, with all of the um, US, what is it, US, AD, uh, US, um, where they monitor and they, they do, you can't take mangoes down to put, uh, FDA, right. You can't take mangoes down to St. Thomas anymore. And we used to feed St. Thomas with mangoes. All of a sudden, you have, to, you have to have these 21 rules before you can take an uh, apple, a mango, um, all of these other things down to St. Thomas. We used to give, we used to catch or um, through our zone, get as many of the pots of fishes, all kind, and be able to sell down there, not anymore, or white sheep or the particular products that we have because they want to make sure that this is done. The FDA, I think that there is a, that there is a movement afoot, Honorable Minister of Agriculture, in terms of getting the, the meats and the different things um, identified here and have them valued, have them, right, you know, have, have it so that you can then begin to sell their particular products. And with COVID-19 comes a lot of opportunities. Is it two or is it $4 million that's available to the farmers and fisher persons? Well, I think it's two or four, two million. Um, that we have. I thought it was two before and two again. So we have, we have some monies so that we can then get back to basics because at the end of the day, we are not out of the woods, not only in terms of the virus, but in terms of the effects of it. Tyson chicken, down. So we have to make sure that um, Al and all the other guys are up and running. We have to make sure that all of the, um, all of the farms, whether it is um, poultry, whether it is with the sheep, whether it is with the pig, uh, my, um, especially with the fishing, because some members don't eat any, meats of any kind. So we have to be, go back to basics, and at the end of the day, we have to, this is why the backyard farming becomes very important, Mr. Speaker. We must be able to do this so that we can then bring our goods to market, and I know that the minister is very much engaged in terms of finding a central marketplace, both for the fishery and both for the agricultural products so that we can then get it and we can get all of the produce in, get all of this done. So the protection, we want fresh food. The only way we can get it, we can't get it more fresh than growing it ourselves. We want fresh food. We have an abundance of it in other islands, but the transportation to the market, getting it to the market becomes cost prohibitive in some instances. We want fresh food, so we must make sure that it is not the for export only products. So, Mr. Speaker, whether it is the right of the consumer, the responsibility of the consumer, or the benefits of the vendors, we have to work in tandem and do whatever we could also to assist the vendors in making sure that they can get the product for a best of price possible. And this then will include some collaborative effect in terms of getting the transportation costs down. It is an issue. And sometimes when vendors have to carry up the cost during a storm, it is because the market
carry up theirs. And when you look, you put and put, and you put the consumer out totally. So we have to look at all of the um, ingredients. We have to look at all of the effects from all segment of this that will give the consumer the protection they need and to increase the responsibility of the persons who are buying the products. I would not be long. It was very well introduced, and Mr. Speaker, I endorse and will support this bill. Thank you. I thank the Deputy Premier for his contribution. Floor remains open as we debate the Consumer Protection Act 2019. I recognize the member for the second district, the Honorable L Melvin M. Turnbull. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I too, like the two members before me, the leader of the opposition and the at large member and minister for health, along with the Premier, I stand to support this bill, the Consumer, Virgin Islands Consumer and Protection Act 2019 to be amended 2020. Mr. Speaker, after hearing the objects and reasons read by the Honorable Premier and then the comments made by my Honorable colleague and um, I would say the initial author of this bill, the Honorable Penn, and all that worked along with it, Mr. Speaker, I must say, um, after going through this bill the first time and then seeing the amendments that have been made, this document, Mr. Speaker, is 98 pages and counting. And I'm only saying and counting because I know for sure there will be um, the regulations and the other pieces of the document that will be added. So I want to commend, start first and foremost by commending the Honorable Premier and his government for bringing this legislation to get it this far um, to be passed through this Honorable House. I want to congratulate and thank the Honorable Marlon Penn for his drive. I remember when, when this started, even when I came in in 2015, he was talking about it. And when, after becoming the Junior Minister of Trade, he pushed very hard to, to get it done. And for reasons stated and some that I would not state, it didn't go any further than the way it went. But I think, Mr. Speaker, this is evident because it also went from the Honorable Penn to Honorable Keynes had part to do when she was junior minister, then Honorable De Castro, <laughs> Honorable De Castro, and then now currently the Honorable Shireen Flax Charles, who is now junior minister of it, all headed under the Premier's office. Mr. Speaker, what, what I would say about this document and what I would say about this bill, it is a testament to when young people, when you allow young people the opportunity to be creative, to be intuitive, and to be researchful in terms of the information that is necessary and that has been compiled in this legislation. And I also want to recognize the legal counsel uh, represented on putting this bill together. But it's important, Mr. Speaker, that even as we look at this institution, as we were having this conversation about the institution being 70 years, Mr. Speaker, when you, when you hear 70 years, it, it seems old, but in this BVI society, 70 years is still relatively young because our people live much longer than that. 
But Mr. Speaker, for an institution, 70 years, 70 plus years, when you have, I think, Honorable Penn was at the time, he wasn't even 40 at the time, um, led the charge to, to develop this and start to put together le legislation on something that has been needed, something that has been on the minds and the hearts and the cries of the consumers, including myself, uh, for the people here in this territory, because it is something that is real. It is something that we feel. It is something that affects each and every one of us. And not only is it just to help the consumers, Mr. Speaker, is also used and developed to guide and help guide the business persons and the producers um, within the territory. Mr. Speaker, I hope I don't bore you, but I am going to do something so that people know. I know the Premier went through the objects and reasons, but I'm going to read, Mr. Speaker, and this is going to be the crux of my contribution to debate with one additional point. I'm going to read each section in this particular document and act so that the persons that are listening, especially uh, the young people and especially the business owners and the persons that are throughout the territory that have had these complaints so that you understand that this is not just another piece of legislation that is being brought to the House and we don't know what it is, we don't understand what it's about and you just hear it and you know we vote I and you know where it is. Mr. Speaker, the thought the thoughts and depth that went into this, in this legislation. Part one starts with the title and interpretation, the act and the purpose of the act and the application. But now part two deals with the administration and the responsibilities, functions, and powers of the commission. Part three, complaints and investigations. Number seven has a section for complaints Number eight, grounds for complaint. Nine, investigation of a complaint. Ten, power of investigate, not precluded. Eleven, commission to examine complaint and response. Power to conduct and continue investigation. The power to summon persons to give evidence. Obligations of persons summoned. Services, service of findings of investigation failure to comply with notice, review of decisions and appeals. Mr. Speaker, this is just part three. I only started. Right there, Mr. Speaker, off the top, we realize that the complaint section, just, just the, the initial beginning of this document, just that it deals with the complaints and investigations, you see the processes already set out clearly, set out and identified, and the recourse of what the process will, will do and how the procedures will take place um, for people being summoned to all the way to the end when they have the ability to appeal. Mr. Speaker, the document continues. Part four, the consumer's rights. 19 says the ambiguities to benefit the consumer. 20, rights in relation to unsolicited goods or services. Right to select suppliers and products. 22, right to authorize services. 23, right to choose and examine goods. 24, right to respect, to right to inspect, right with respect to delivery of goods or supply of services. 25, acceptance of goods or services. 26, right to cancel reservation, right to rescind or cancel uh, agreement, the right to, of information in English language, the right to information in plain language, and the right of the consumer's estate to choose whether to uphold the agreement. Mr. Speaker, this is the consumer's right here in part four. Now, the part that jumped out of me, Mr. Speaker, is something that the Honorable Minister for Health just spoke about. 
that we have the right to select, we have the right to inspect, and we have the right to refuse. But if it, if, if it leaves anything as clear as mud, Mr. Speaker, 28 and 29 states, the right for information to be in English language. And 29 is my favorite one. The right for information to be in plain language. Speak plain to me. Don't talk dirty to me. Speak plain. This is a way that the average person in the territory is able to understand and break down what is happening and what their rights are and, and, and privileges are under this legislation. Part 5 gives the duties of the suppliers. The duty to inform the consumer, duty to display price of goods or services, the dual pricing, identification of supplier, product labeling and trade descriptions, disclosure of environmental facts affecting goods, disclosure of used reconditioned, rebuilt, or remade goods, duty to supply sales records, measurement of goods, warranties, warranty as to the quality and fitness, damages resulting from the use of goods or services, supply of damaged goods to consumer, return of defective goods, return of materially different goods, approved and non-approved services, suppliers offering repair services, advertised delivery date, conditions of demands and accepting payment, general standards for the promotion of good services. Mr. Speaker, under the duties of the supplier, what I would highlight from this section, and I, I have quite a few, but I'm, I'm not going to bore this honorable house or the public with the details that I've written down because I think as the now junior minister will continue to take this show on the road in terms of the promotion and, and getting the businesses as well as the general public to understand what we are now doing here in this honorable house. Um, she will then have the opportunity to explain more um, as well as, as, as the premier and all of us as it is our responsibility as this legislation is here. But Mr. Speaker, I, I just want to point out under this particular section where the suppliers, Mr. Speaker, clearly identified are from 31 to 50, all the way from warranties to their measurements to supplying of sales records. Mr. Speaker, these are where this legislation shows us that even though it is, in fact, the consumer protection, the suppliers, the business owners also have their role to play. And what's all equally important, Mr. Speaker, when you look at the, the disclosure of environmental facts affecting goods, the disclosure of use, uh, recondition or rebuilds for goods, this legislation, Mr. Speaker, crosses all borders. Because I know for certain the Minister of Health and his team from, from the Environmental Health Department will also have to play a role in terms of them inspecting goods and services of, of businesses as well. So I think, Mr. Speaker, this legislation coming in at this particular time will help further to, to give not only the Minister of, of Health and his team a little bit more strength but the legislation in itself creates some teeth. And Mr. Speaker, that's one of the things that I've been saying in this honorable house when I look to regulations and I look to legislation that has been passed, I'm looking for the teeth. Because while we have all these laws on the books, it makes no sense if we continue to put them and not give them teeth. So, Mr. Speaker, I continue to part, this is part now, part six, unfair trade practices. 51, false, misleading, or deceptive representations 
restrictive trade practices, unfair trade practices, unreasonable transactions, unfair transactions, unconscionable conduct, 57, renegotiation of terms, bait advertising, to print in good faith, referral selling, pyramid, pyramid schemes, we know that's a problem, rescission, defense for contravention of this part, and the court order payment for damages. Mr. Speaker, we all know that in every business, in every situation, in every territory, there are those who will and who have and who will try to continue to contravent or contravene the law, go against the law. Let me speak plain. The things have to speak plain. Let me speak plain. Who will try to break the law and get over somehow or some way? Mr. Speaker, I remember, I think it was in this honorable house in either 2015 or 2016, I could be wrong, but I think it was 2016, Mr. Speaker, when we, the issue had come up where the bank was charging, whether it's 3%, 4%, or 5% on the use of the credit card to the supplier. And then the supplier was transferring that cost on each transaction. So every time you would swipe your card, Mr. Speaker, the bank, the, the, the supplier started to charge you as the consumer that 3 or 4 or 5% on each transaction. And Mr. Speaker, we sat in this honorable house and we passed legislation. 2016? 2016. We passed legislation that stated, and it's on these books in this honorable house, Mr. Speaker, in this territory, that stating that cost is the cost for the business owners, for the suppliers. That's a cost for you doing business in the territory, doing business with the banks. It should not be passed on to the consumer. And Mr. Speaker, it was a lot of uh, back and forth. There was a lot of conversation. But Mr. Speaker, I, 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 I must confess to you today, still today, there are still those businesses carrying on that practice. And whenever it happens to me, or it is attempting to happen to me, Mr. Speaker, I speak up on it. And I let them know I, I am not paying what you're supposed to be paying. That is a cost that you're supposed to be paying as the business owner. And Mr. Speaker, it is under this section that you see now this department and this, this legislation now will have different arms and legs and toes and teeth and tongue to be able to now to go out and investigate. Because sometimes, Mr. Speaker, what we have been become comfortable with is having reports come in to us or come into the Trade Department or complaints being made. But now you have an investigative capability where within the De Department of Trade and Consumer for Protection, I hope I get the name right, Trade, Economic Development, and Consumer Protection. Junior Minister, I'm, I'm correct? We now have the capability to give the, our officers and officers in that department so that they can go out and inspect some of these businesses, some of the unfair practices that would be lodged in, in their office or just on inspection. You could just observe and see the things that need to be corrected. Mr. Speaker, part seven, the unfair terms. Unfair terms, 66, written terms to be plain and intelligible, 67, non-exclusion of this part, indemnity, loss or damage from defective goods or negligence of the manufacturer, effect of obligation, satisfying reasonableness where agreement is terminated, 
reasonableness. Part A, Mr. Speaker, product liability. Interpretation of part eight, the liability for defects, defect inferred, damage given rise to liability, prohibition on exclusions from liability, defenses in civil proceedings, applications to the Crown. Consumer safety, Mr. Speaker, part nine. Number 80 says, interpretation of consumer safety. Now, I was trying to avoid it, but I need to read it so that persons understand what this definition states, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, consumer safety, in this part, consumer safety includes A, the reduction of risk, risk to consumers in the supply of goods and services. B, providing information or instructions in regard to the keeping, use, or consumption of goods. C, the reduction of any harm or damage to the consumer by taking preventative and proactive measures. So the general safety uh, requirements on 81 goes in, a person shall not supply any goods which fails to meet the general safety requirements, B, offer or agree to supply any goods which fails to meet general safety requirements, and C, expose or possess for the supply of any goods which fails to meet the general safety requirements. Number two, for the purposes of this section, good, goods fail to meet the general safety requirements if they are not safe, have a regard to all circumstances, including the manner in which and purposes for which the goods is being or would be marketed. B, the packaging and presentation of goods. C, the use of any mark in relation to the goods. D, any instructions or warnings which are given or would be given with respect to the keeping, use, or consumption of the goods. E, any applicable safety standards, and F, the existence of any means by which it would have been reasonable for the goods to have been made safer. Mr. Speaker, this section continues all the way for one and a half pages as it relates to the consumer safety and the importance of ensuring that what is being put on the shelves or what is being put out for sale to the consumers, the consumer is protected and their safety is here protected in these laws, Mr. Speaker. Part 10, the recall of goods. 86, for compulsory recall of goods, effect or recall notice, loss or damage caused by the contravention of goods recall notice, conference to be held in certain cases, exception in exemption, exception, sorry, in case of danger to the public, power to obtain information, documents, and evidence, power to magistrate to issue warrant, voluntary recall of goods, supplies to be given notice in certain cases, certain actions not to affect insurance contract. Mr. Speaker, again, I don't want to keep belaboring because we're going to go into the committee, but I just want to give strength, Mr. Speaker, and additional support and information to what has already been laid before this honorable house by the premier, leader of the opposition, and the minister for health, that this document, Mr. Speaker, has gone above and beyond to try to cover, and, and there are still amendments that will be made. There are still areas probably that once it's passed, we would have to amend. It's not a perfect document. No document is a perfect document. But Mr. Speaker, the importance of what I'm highlighting is the fact that a lot of thought and research went in to putting this document together to be placed on the laws of this territory for the people, the consumers, and the suppliers in this territory. 11, the distant selling, interpretation, giving effect to the agreement, application, 
prior information, acceptance, etc. And then part 12 covers the miscellaneous in case we forgot anything in any of the other 11 parts. Void position, provisions of the consumer agreements, goods or service acquired by installment, apportionment of payments where services not received, supplier purporting to act on bill of sale, trade coupons and similar promotions, promotional competitions, overselling and overbooking, layaways, protection of consumer rights, written consumer agreements, rights reserved, no waiver of substantial or procedural rights, approval of laboratory, amendment of schedule, offenses by bodies corporate and the regulations. And then you have the schedules, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hope that would have helped the public to understand the depth of what four honorable members of this House of Assembly has now had the responsibility to give their input and give their leadership and direction on for the consumers. And Mr. Speaker, before I take my seat, I want to reiterate something that the Honorable Premier mentioned, I think, the first time that in 2019, when this legislation was being brought. I'm not going to say all the things that he said politically. Uh, but, no, tw I'm, I'm talking about 2019 when this Premier, when this Premier spoke about it. He stated that there would be an additional 49 pieces of legislation that will go along to support this consumer protection. And Mr. Speaker, if I am permitted, I just want to highlight, I just want to highlight in one of those additional regulations that while we have the consumer protection, I think we also need to include the consumer price index. Because Mr. Speaker, having spent some time in, in finance and, and budgeting and management, it is important that we understand and keep track of the ongoing cost of living in this territory. The CPI is tied to what a basket of goods are supposed to cost at any given time. And I know pieces of this document hint and, and point towards that. But Mr. Speaker, it is just another piece of documentation or legislation, if you would call it that, that would guide, help to guide. Because if I have the 13 members in this honorable house, all of us would have stores or shops. The CPI will dictate, Mr. Speaker, based on the average co cost of living, what, for example, an AC is supposed to cost. So one can't be at $2 when the other one is at $200 and the other one is at $50. It should be something that while there is still room for competitive pricing, Mr. Speaker, it doesn't allow suppliers to be all over the place. The consumer price index, Mr. Speaker, basically keeps the pricing curtailed at a considerable number. This is the number, this is where we should be at at a range from whether it's you have from 10 or 50% or to go between that to be able to, to realize your profit margin. And I, I believe something like that, Mr. Speaker, will go a long way um, in, in helping. And what it also allows, Mr. Speaker, it, and it helps to promote the undercutting of businesses. Um, sometimes I might have 
a wholesale or being able to get something of lesser quality and I'm charging it less and I'm undercutting somebody who is going this way or that way. So Mr. Speaker, I believe the, the CPI, the, the Consumer Price Index, will be an additional strength to, to join in the 49 other pieces of legislation and documents that will go in hand in tandem with, with this Consumer Protection Act, Mr. Speaker. So while we go into, when we go into committee, Mr. Speaker, the, as we go through it, based on the standing orders, line by line, clause by clause, um, anything that jumps out between the 13 or 15 honorable members in this house, I think we will do our very best to ensure that we have covered all the bases on behalf of the people of this territory. So, Mr. Speaker, as I stated before, I will end and say that I support, Mr. Speaker, the Consumer and Protection Act 2019-20 for the people of the Virgin Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the second district for his contribution. All the members, it's now 2.30. There's a request for three more persons to speak. I am, well, four. I'm guided by whether we go straight ahead or we take a break now. An hour lunch break or we continue. Am I here in lunch break or am I here in straight through? Straight through? Okay. I now recognize the deputy speaker and territorial member, the Honorable Neville A. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to be very short, Mr. Speaker, very, very short. <laughs> um, I stand here to support this bill. But what I want to say is that this bill is a very, very important document. This bill here is full of volume, full of spunks. This bill, this bill here is something that we have to take seriously. We cannot just bring this bill here and then expect it to work by itself. Once again, we have to talk about actually enforcing what we have here in this document. If we do not really police this document and do what we have to do by this document, it will not work. And I want to make that clear. If we do not enforce what we have here, it cannot work. So I'm speaking to the people who will be working with this bill, the staff, the teams who will be working with this bill, that this is not a bill to sit on. It's not a bill to just you have it, you look at it, and you don't go there. We have to promote this. You have to go there and investigate. You have to be out there every single day, see what's going on. Because just like how we create this bill to catch whoever's out there doing it wrong, they're going to stick this bill, they're going to try to do something to even, even outdo this bill, that they could still do what they want to do. And that's what we have to realize. It evolves and things are changing. So every second somebody's going to find a way to, to beat your system. So I'm speaking to the creators and the, the staff who'll be working with this bill that we have to really sit down and, and, and look at how we're going to work with this thing. We cannot just put it down and, and, and say it's going to work by itself. It's not going to work. I'll give you a few examples of what I'm talking about, what I'm looking at. For example, the supermarkets. We have supermarkets out there selling food, selling produce. We have, we have restaurants buying food to go sell, but they have the restaurants competing with the supermarkets, who's selling food? Somebody might even want to sit back and say, hey, no, because that's what's going on. So when you have a document like this, it, it speaks to that. This document speaks to that also, so we have to really realize what we are saying in this document. Like I said, I support it. But the staff that comes to work with this document have to realize that too. You can't turn your, a blind eye to these things that's going on. Another example, what you have to look at. Can we talk about fair trade? We talk about how we do things. Um, a good example, again, is when you go into the supermarket, stuff that is expired and have expired dates, what happened to those stuff? And they have a restaurant inside there. 
So how do you know? I'm not saying it's happening, but I'm saying, but how do you know that they're not using these same products to cook the food and sell to save themselves money? So these are the things, it's a reality. So these are things that we really have to start looking at and not just thinking that this document is going to work for itself. It's a lot of work went into this bill. But we have to make sure that we enforce every part of this bill. We cannot continue sitting down and creating bills and then they're not being enforced. I, I would also like to thank all the members who take part in, in, in getting this uh, bill up and going, and Ms. George and her team, for the hard work. This, like I say again, this is not, this is not a light document. The honorable, for the, the honorable minister, the honorable member for the second, got up and read a lot of this document into the record here for the public to hear. And if you listen to that document, there's a lot of stuff that some of you all don't understand. So that's why I say we need to do a lot of promotion also that people can understand what this document really is about because some people might think that this document means there's, um, there's price control. Some people might think it's price control and it's not. This document really comes in force when there's a, a, a hurricane or when there's some sort of disaster. A lot of this document comes in, into play with that. So we need to educate the public very much about this document so they understand what their rights are, and also the consumer, also. So that's my contribution to this document. Um, really and truly, it's a very lovely document. It protects both parties. So it's not a biased document. But like I say, we have to enforce what is in the document. Having it here not put into use, and not having the staff know what, what they're into. They have, to, they have to learn this document. They have to read it as if it's their Bible also, so they know what they're looking for. Mr. Speaker, that's my two minutes. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, for his contribution. At this time, I recognize the Junior Minister for Tourism and Territorial Member, the Honorable Sherry B. DeCastro. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to lend my voice to this bill. Mr. Speaker, as noted before by the many speakers, this bill has been around for quite some time, as far back as 1995. Um, it's been written, rewritten, updated, um, and now it's here before this honorable house to be passed and to become law. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to be a part of the administration that takes this effort forward. As the Premier has stated, we do recognize the efforts that has been done by the past administration, specifically the leader of the opposition current. And truly, we are placed here in this position to represent the will of the people. And the people have been asking for this bill for a very long time. And I'm glad that it is here before this House. Mr. Speaker, just to highlight that this bill does not just provide consumers with recourse, but it also shields suppliers from frivolous and vexatious claims um, from the consumer. So it is a very balanced bill, and, and, and I wanted to make that clear just because we've, you know, there is some rhetoric in reference to it being consumer-based um, in terms of bias versus having a balance where businesses um, feel protected as well, and that's something that we have ensured is suitably informed in the bill so that there can be a balanced approach moving forward. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Trade Commission that was previously passed in the House is a vehicle that will institute uh, and monitor uh, the Consumer Protection Act. Um, there will be consumer protection officers as well that will go out to the various establishments to ensure uh, that this is adequately enforced, which is commendable and needed for us to truly allow enforcement to take place. Uh, as a consumer myself, um, it is amulated to note that things like putting the price on goods will be now mandated. Uh, having gone into the supermarkets almost weekly and we see that the price isn't reflected on the items, I think that it brings the business community in a place where they have to now uh, basically 
take things to a different level and ensure that the consumers are readily informed on the pricing of the products and, and the various details of the products as necessary so that they could make an informed decision upon purchase. Uh, the, the other thing that is very important is to understand that receipts are extremely important now. They are the contract between the supplier and the consumer. And so it is extremely important for businesses to ensure that receipts are in play as well as for consumers to retain their receipts if they would like to make a claim. So Mr. Speaker, briefly, I, I just want to stand in full support of this bill. I believe that the slew of additional uh, bills that will be coming forward to the House to support this bill is very important. We hear a lot of debates about issues uh, such as even uh, landlord and tenants, and we understand that that would have to be brought up in a subsequent uh, bill as well. And so this is just a fourth step. Uh, this is just one piece of the puzzle, and we look forward to passing the other legislations that will ensure that we have uh, a very... Uh, unbiased, a very protective uh, business environment so that both consumers and suppliers are adequately uh, taken care of. So Mr. Speaker, with those few words, I thanks for, thank you for allowing me to lend my voice to the debate. Thank you. I thank the junior minister for her contribution. At this time, I recognize the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities and member for the 5th District, the Honorable Kai M. Reimer. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I too want to rise in support of this Consumer Protection Act uh, 2020. Um, many other of my colleagues have gone in depth with, the, with this bill, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I too want to add in congratulating all those that played a part and played a role in getting it to this point. Most members spoke about the four the four junior ministers, but those junior ministers also, um, they work under the premiers. And we must acknowledge the honorable premiers too, that's um, Dr. Diolanda Smith for making this a priority. We understood that it, it started from uh, 1995, that's a long time ago. And now we, had, we have now this government that is bringing it forth. Um, there will be amendments to it, as other members have spoken of. But, Mr. Speaker, I just want to speak to a little bit about the, the benefits of, of this Consumer Protection Bill, where we'll see consumers being protected, protected based on price and, and, and various services. Mr. Speaker, a lot of persons talk about the, the supermarkets, but we have a lot of other services that are provided. And in this honorable house, we have spoken about, you know, the telecom companies as well. And the, the service that you receive for what you, you pay for. And Mr. Speaker, I know that is an area where a lot of persons are affected. And we hope to see uh, with this consumer protection more competitive uh, pricing in terms of the services that would be provided. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we know we have a lot of resellers. Uh, we, we, manufa we manufacture nothing really here in this territory, so everything is basically imported. Mr. Speaker, no, it, it, it's, it's where the, the business is. Must be responsible and, and be mindful as to the, the goods that they will be offering to the, the consumers. Uh, Mr. Speaker, for instance, we have where you know just touching on the supermarkets where we have some outdated and, and expired stuff goods and mr speaker now that is where the the businesses need to be mindful as to what they're important and i know it'll be a difficult task and mr speaker with this and the 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 bills that would complement this i think we need to also look at uh the the shipping costs and how competitive those would be as well with this consumer protection. Because yes, you can purchase goods from overseas, the United States and so forth, but by the time it gets here, the, the price has doubled and tripled. So Mr. Speaker, whether it's for, the, for us as a government to look at how we can 
assist with the shipping or the shippers need to be a bit more competitive, I think that would, would also help with some of the prices that, um, uh, that are being charged. I heard the members speak about a consumer price index. And that is something that is important because we, we see the cost of living continue to increase here in our territory um, from house rent. We have where we, you know, the banks charge high rates. We have insurance agencies as well. So those are things that we need to look, look at collectively in terms of having an overall look as to how um, persons within the community can have a better affordable rate of living. And Mr. Speaker, the businesses has a role to play as well as the consumer. And now we know that they will be protected. And Mr. Speaker, we, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see the, the, the entirety of this, this bill where it goes through the process of from the complaints to the investigation, um, all the way to making sure that the consumer is being responsible as well. And Mr. Speaker, as we go through um, section 64 of the bill, um, the member for the second went through the entire, the entire bill. And I just, what, what stood out to me is the, um, the damages, the consequences. And Mr. Speaker, I'd just like to briefly read that out where it says, upon the conviction of a supplier of an offense under this part, the tribunal or the court may order the supplier to A, make to the consumer restitution of any deposit made by the consumer, pay to the consumer by way of damages a sum representing the cost reasonably incurred by the consumer as a result of the offense, and pay to the tribunal or to or the court such sum as represent the reasonable costs incurred in relation to the prosecution of, of the offense. Mr. Speaker, what that says is at the end of that process, those would be the consequences. And I always like to understand as we, this house, we make multiple laws, what the consequences of those laws would be. And Mr. Speaker, once we understand that, the consequences would be dire, then I'm, I'm sure that all persons involved would be responsible. Because, Mr. Speaker, as a, a community, we've had successful businesses and it all derived from the services that they provide, provide here. And, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure, um, not looking at what happened in 2017 where we had some unscrupulous behavior um, with some price gouging and so forth. I think we have been responsible um, up to a point. And you know, that needs to be applauded because as I said earlier, we are not a, a community that manufacture anything here. So all is imported. We understand the rationale um, amongst the high prices. And uh, Mr. Speaker, as we work to, to make laws to protect our people, we also look to protect the businesses as well. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I, again, I am happy to be a part of this administration that would pass this consumer protection and it would finally reach to the point where it can be implemented. And Mr. Speaker, for all those that work on this bill, I, do, I say I, I think it needs to be recognized and you know, we are grateful for the work that you have done this far. And you know, the, the, the hard part now is implementing and making sure that it works. Mr. Speaker, again, I just, you know, lend my support to the bill, and I uh, appreciate the ability to say a few words on this. I say thank you. I thank the member for the 5th District for his contribution. At this time, I recognize the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor, and Immigration, and the member for the 9th District, the Honorable Vincent O. Whitley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As my other colleagues, have gone in great depth with this bill, I shall be rather brief. Mr. Speaker, like the member for, I think the second or the eighth said, government is a continuity. And this bill is quite a hefty bill. 60, 98 pages. 
It's been through many iterations over a very long period of time. We heard one member say it started as early as 1995. But this is the year 2020. Just goes to show that sometimes these things do take time. So I want to commend all those persons who labored through time to get this bill to where it is today. And like was said before, there will be amendments. Society is continuing to evolve, and as we evolve, things adapt to the new season. I must commend Ms. George and her team, the Junior Minister of Trade and also the Premier, for bringing this bill. I mentioned the last time we were in the House that as we evolve and develop as a society, we have to build institutions. It's what brings balance, what brings accountability into any, in, into any society. And this is one more step in achieving that goal of accountability, of building institutions to help our development as we, as we progress along the line. The member for the fifth mentioned the intention of the bill. And intention is good because we do want to protect our consumers you know, from bad goods, expired goods, because we know the, the, the persons who manufacture goods, their primary reason for doing that is finance. They're not, they're not particularly interested in your health and how that product is going to affect you. The vendor is also interested in a transaction. Your health, or any other, whether financial or otherwise, is not, a, is not the primary concern. So it's through this kind of legislation here that we help to protect the consumer from the vendor. Most things, if not all, have been considered in this document. So a lot of thought, a lot of work went into this document. But Mr. Speaker, what I'm a little concerned about is not the intention of the bill, but in life, whenever you do something, but it's something so significant, there are always unintended consequences. And my only concern is from where I sit, where I see a lot of the, or what happens to businesses on the negative side, what happens to employees when I see many businesses as struggling as they are. And I can see, I see it because the effects of the struggle plays out sometimes in NHI. It plays out in social security where persons and business, and you think they're really making money, but in truth, in fact, they are barely surviving. So in what it tells me that somehow between their pricing that they need to be a viable business, when you match it against the price they need to sell at for persons to be able to buy it, it tells me that the business is kind of on shaky ground. So when you bring a uh, document like this to help the consumer, my only concern is, how does this now affect the business? I heard one minister say I am I'm pro business. Um, I wouldn't say I'm pro business. I am balanced. I like to see balance because the same way the employer and the employee must survive in a symbiotic relationship, so too the business and the buyer, the consumer, must survive in a symbiotic relationship. So trying to get that line right is what this bill has tried its best to do. I guess time will tell if it, if it survives or not. I don't think any well-meaning vendor is going to sell expired or spoiled goods. I think what they're actually trying to do is maximize the profit to remain viable. But in the process of trying to be viable, sometimes we harm the consumer. The bill steps in there. So it is not the complete part of the package that the Premier said. It's a suite of legislation, I think some 49 pieces that makes the full package, because we have to make sure that the businesses remain viable, particularly, Mr. Speaker, small businesses. We, in this era, are pushing very hard to encourage our young people or entrepreneurs to get more involved in business. But we can't make them feel that while we're saying get involved in business, at the same time, we're putting all these things that appear to be roadblocks in their way. So trying to find that balance there. And I think that the legislation has done a pretty good job in and of itself to make sure it's not harmful. When other pieces come, I think they will bring more balance to the other side. So Mr. Speaker, I, I fully support this legislation. I fully support the intent 
of the legislation. And again, I must commend the Premier and his team from his office in, in laboring through all these years to bring it here. Now, I think if all went well, it might have been brought here by the last government because they are the ones who did a significant amount of work on it. But some things, Mr. Speaker, are just not meant to be. And it's not about unfairness. Some things aren't meant to be. Just like Moses spent 40 years with the children of Israel through the desert, and one little slip up, and God said, you can't go into the promised land. The bill had issues with the last government. That's why it never made it here. There were little things in there that it couldn't come. The same way Moses could not go into the promised land. Yes, I'm saying there were issues. God had an issue with Moses. God didn't tell Moses to go to the rock and speak to the rock and water would come out of it. Moses was upset. He went to the rock and he struck the rock twice. He was no obedient. Because Moses was more concerned about the people who were behaving like rebels than he was with God who gave him the command. So he was conflicted. So this bill had to remain a little longer to be brought to the house by a non-conflicted party. And that's so happy to see this bill has finally made it here. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the ninth District for his contribution. I recognize the Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture, and member for the 7th District, Dr. The Honorable Natalio D. Wheatley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll surprise the whole House and be very short <laughs> in my uh, comments. The reason for that, uh, Mr. Speaker, is we did have the opportunity in, in 2019, I believe it was, to, to debate this bill, uh, this proposed bill. I thought it was, was well debated. And also, uh, Mr. Speaker, we had a great round of public meetings as it pertains to this bill and the then junior minister along with the Premier, uh, led that, uh, along with um, uh, employees of the Trade Department, uh, Lizette George, as well as the consultant, and others. And I want to thank them for the great work they did in ventilating this in the public. Uh, certainly, a bill such as this would garner lots of interest and I think that was reflected in the stakeholder consultations as well as the, the meetings for the general public. And we had a, a nice debate on it in the House of Assembly. And of course, the, the House was prorogued, uh, so we had to, to bring it back and do it all over again. But I'm grateful for Mr. Speaker that uh, this, govern, this government has delivered something that persons have been speaking about for quite some time. And I, I think we'll see lots more examples where this government will go ahead and deliver a lot of things that have been speaking about for years and years and years, and we just talk about it over and over. I think that it emphasizes the fact that this government is a government of action, and it's a government that delivers on promises. And um, this is going to be something uh, that will continue uh, throughout this administration under the leadership of the Honorable Premier, uh, Honorable Andrew Foy. Now, Mr. Speaker, what many persons are concerned about when they talk about consumer protection is prices. And persons must understand that this consumer protection bill is not price control. It is a recognition, Mr. Speaker, that consumers have rights. Consumers have rights. And in the business environment that we have here in the Virgin Islands, Mr. Speaker, we often rely on the good intentions of businesses and vendors. 
And of course, the market forces as well. If somebody um, treats you poorly, you might just go to another establishment and do business with that other establishment. So there's that type of, you could say, competition that has an impact on business practices. But if we want to elevate the level of, of business activity in the Virgin Islands, we need to recognize that all consumers have rights. And business persons have rights as well. And this uh, bill, Mr. Speaker, I think uh, puts an essential component in place for raising the level and attractiveness of business in the territory. Without even knowing it, even though, of course, there are much more obligations on businesses. This actually works in the business's favor, Mr. Speaker. I've spoken to persons who they do, um, some of them don't like to do business in the territory. You heard them speaking about doing business in the United States of America, in uh, the United States Virgin Islands, and a part of the reason is because of some of the same components which are here in this Consumer Protection Act. The protection for the consumer, let's say for instance, the ability to be able to return a good. Let's say something's wrong with the good or for whatever reason you purchase a good, you have a good reason why you have to return it. That's in here, Mr. Speaker. And you'd notice that you go to some businesses and they have policies, they have it written up there. Once you buy it, that's it. You cannot return that item. So this will place some additional obligations and rules in those type of businesses who attempt to have those type of policies. But they, might, they may not think it's helping them, but it actually is because it's gonna make the business environment much more attractive. But we all know, Mr. Speaker, that ultimately we have to address the issue of prices. And with prices, we have to look at both the regulatory factors and the market factors, okay? It's not simply a matter of just saying we need to control prices uh, here in the Virgin Islands, because we understand we are territory heavily reliant on imports. And there are external factors which affect price. So what we need to do as a government and what we are doing, Mr. Speaker, is looking at a number of different areas that will have an impact on the ability to offer a more competitive price. And I can look at some of them that we are already looking into and those which I know under the leadership of the Premier are coming. Let's take a look at energy, for instance, Mr. Speaker. Energy is a huge cost to business. But the Premier and this government, in our wisdom, are looking at energy being able to have a much more reliable, consistent form of energy which we control. And what is that form of energy? We're talking about alternative energy. This government is making a huge splash in a solar energy project. And I'm sure you'll be hearing more about that in the future. And I'm glad that we've taken the step to ensure that we have a process through which our people can be trained to participate in this huge solar project that we are about to undertake. But that will help to diversify our energy supply and provide an energy supply that we are more in control of. So we're not simply, we're not simply at the mercy of um, international um, oil prices or, or whatever arrangement we have locally as it pertains to, to fuel. We diversify the energy and it gives us much more control in terms of uh, the cost of energy. 
Mr. Speaker, I know that rent is a huge cost to business persons, and I applaud persons who've started business packs to be able to allow uh, cheaper spaces for persons to be able to rent. I, I, I see there in Fatags Bay, uh, I have an office actually in a building where um, they, they created several spaces for businesses. And, and, and to be able to have an affordable uh, place to be able to rent. And I know that this will have a huge impact in persons wanting to open businesses and to be able to offer competitive prices. And I think that we need to look to do more of that. And I think persons who have the means should be able to, 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 to execute and implement such an idea of having business parks here centrally on the outskirts of Road Town, in large population centers like in the east, and certainly we'd like to see something like that, something similar to that in, in the west, but you, you see a place like um, Parkwood Pond, where we have the, the r and complex there. You know, similar type of concept. Uh, and we need more of these types of spaces. Mr. Speaker, we've invested in local production of food. And in addition to the stimulus uh, that the Premier has, in his wisdom, provided during this COVID-19 era, we have legislation that we're looking at right now, looking at introducing a statutory body that will help with the operation of the food industry. And it's going to become much more efficient and much more effective. And with locally produced goods, again, you have more control over the price, as opposed to being uh, at the mercy of the cost of price abroad. And of course, we know the challenges with health with, with, with what goes into the products, uh, chemicals, and otherwise. We have much more control, Mr. Speaker. I've heard the Honorable Premier speak in the past about shipping and some great ideas in terms of shipping. And I can even, at this very moment, Mr. Speaker, encourage persons to get together. And this is part of what on the same statutory body we're talking about for food is going to be doing and what the Agriculture Department does for persons when they do mass orders as well. Let's get together and do shipping together, try to see if we could get some uh, shipper, um, um, more competitive pricing uh, for shipping. But I trust the Premier, and I know that the Premier is, is looking at that issue of shipping. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think we need to have a conversation as well about um, duties, fees, tax structure, to see how we can become, uh, uh, the, the, the vendors can become more competitive. And something that's in this bill, Mr. Speaker, uh, that speaks directly to prices and persons should be aware of, aware of, in section 119, it deals with a basket of goods. Now, the basket of goods is important, Mr. Speaker, because it's not saying that we want our every single um, item to be regulated in terms of price. Let the market take care of some of these items that we're speaking about. But there's a recognition that there are certain essential items that we all need. There's no need to put price control on a bar of chocolate because that's something that's not necessary. It's a luxury item. Person should go to the store and make a decision whether they want to buy that or not. But there are certain things which are essential goods. You know, you have your toilet paper and your paper towel and, you know, you have certain fruits and vegetables and your bread and your, your yeast and all of these type of things. These things are essential 
And this bill gives the, the, the authority to create some regulations that will give you a specific basket of goods. And this bill gives you the power to be able to regulate the prices of those baskets of goods, which is extremely important and I think will have a massive effect on the lives of persons who are struggling with prices right now. To be able to provide those essential items needed for their very survival. So Mr. Speaker, I promise not to speak long. So I, my colleague said it's too late, but I think it's probably at least a third of a fourth of the time that I usually speak. So Mr. Speaker, with that, I give my full endorsement uh, to this Consumer Protection Act 2020, and I'm looking forward to its implementation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the seventh district. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? I recognize the junior minister for trade and economic development and territorial member, the Honorable Shereen D. Flax Charles. Mr. Speaker, it would be remiss of me as the junior minister for trade and economic development not to lend my support to this bill. It's been a long time coming, Mr. Speaker, and um, I fully endorse it. I just want to say, Mr. Speaker, a special thank you to all of the persons that have worked to make this a reality. But I especially want to thank the employees at the Ministry of Trade or Finance, as well as the Department of Trade. Too often, and I know some members have given them their kudos, but too often we forget the persons that do a lot of the, what we would call the grunge work, Mr. Speaker. And I, I just wanted to make sure that they know that we appreciate all of the hard work that they have put into this bill so that we can make sure that we protect our consumers. I would go a step further, Mr. Speaker, to add to the en enforcement of uh, what is in this bill because that is very important. Many times we forget to enforce when we pass a law, and that is something that we must um, make mention of. And I want to reiterate as well that we also have to look at the businesses while we're protecting the consumers, as Honorable Vincent Wheatley mentioned. Businesses are hurting, and they've been hurting for quite a while. And so we have to protect businesses as well. There must be balance when we move forward in the BVI. Without it, there will be no, B, no good BVI and not a good business environment. So Mr. Speaker, I will stop there for now and again say that I fully support it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Junior Minister for Trade for her contribution. At this time, I call on the sponsor of the bill, the Honorable Premier, to wrap up the debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank everyone for their input uh, into this bill, the Consumer Protection Act 2019. And when it goes into the committee stage, we will amend it to be the Consumer Protection Act 2020. And just for clarity, we'll say in 2019, because that's when it was brought last year, and we, 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 it was moving forward, and then we prorogued the House, so it had to come back in the first reading, because once the House is prorogued, then whatever matters were, in, were on the agenda of the House, uh, even if it was up for a second reading, it has to come right back into the first reading again. So just in terms of for our education lesson, for persons listening, uh, and knew that this was uh, debated before, how come it has come back up again? It was because it was not passed before the House was prorogued. So now we are back here, Mr. Speaker, um, and making sure that we move towards uh, the Pro Consumer Protection Act 2019. Uh, I thank all the members for the input. And uh, Mr. Speaker, this government uh, does what is rare. We give credit to where credit is due. 
the, the, the junior minister uh, is, uh, for the past administration who started it, the now leader of the opposition, we give them credit, uh, Mr. Speaker, and then, uh, but we also know, Mr. Speaker, that has been worked on in the past administration for quite a while. He did some work, but it never came forward. And Mr. Speaker, we knew too as was a lot of reasons why, one of the main reasons was conflict of interest. Um, you know, stopping the member from bringing forward the bill. And, but Mr. Speaker, now that that has um, taken care of itself uh, after the February 25th, we can now put the people's interest in front and bring forward the, the, the bill. And, the, and that's why the leader of the opposition could have got up so briskly and seconded it because he knew that, um, that finally now his, his, his labor could would not go in vain. So, Mr. Speaker, I also want to thank all the other junior ministers that worked on it, Honorable Alvaro Maduro Keynes, Honorable Sherry De Castro, who went out in the public meetings, and she was able to handle it pretty well because there was uh, some tough public meetings as the business people thought that we were coming to intrude on them. And then the consumers, um, some of them really thought that, that it would only be in their favor and nothing um, to protect businesses, but they all got to realize after a while that we were able to manage a balance. Now, what we have done in this bill, this bill originally when we went to the public, as speakers have said, did not have a section in it to handle uh, uh, price gouging mm -hmm. and, and other areas of hoarding, etc. But what we did since then is to, to put in a section of it until the substantial bill comes to deal with those areas. But we put in a sec, uh, an appendix into this consumer protection that allows during times of disasters, during times of pandemic, like we have in um, COVID-19, during catastrophic events, during all those kind of uh, unforeseen times that, that when people are most vulnerable, that some business persons take advantage of that time and take advantage of persons and, and just carry up their prices without any justification or, 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 or any found, solid foundation. So now this allows in these kind of errors to the minister to, to make such regulations to deal with those matters. So now while we're in COVID-19 until the vaccine is found, I think that that gives the minister enough time to put some regulations in to make sure that COVID-19 era, that no price gouging would take place any further in case it has happened already. Because we saw that this has been the cry of persons in this territory, the history for the past 30 years. There's certain things that we have found uh, since taking office that has take, have been discussion for quite a while. This um, bill was discussion for 30 years. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and never was able to, to move too far. There was some work done with it before, but was never been able to move too far, far because of persons' concern about, about how it would affect their business when they were in the political realm. But I always tell persons that I learned from some seniors in Caribbean that taught me never worry about, about, about what you're going to put uh, legislation or policies in place. Don't worry about them uh, put being working while you're in. Worry about if you can live with them when you're out. And now, Mr. Speaker, what we are seeing here is that we have to work about uh, in such a manner. We have to work in such a manner to create legacies for the territory, not for ourselves. Mr. Speaker, if the people had been put in front of, of personal agendas, then this, Mr. Speaker, would have already been in place. And it could have been in place too, Mr. Speaker, during Irma. Let me state clearly, because it was ready from all, back then it was being discussed and worked on in 2018, it, it basically ramped up some more. And yes, we did a lot of work on it since then, but the same way now where we have come and said, let us put an appendix onto it, a legal way for us during disasters or pandemics, to put in the price gouging uh, um, uh, measures to protect us from it, that could have been done then. There's nothing legally was stopping it from being done then, except the will. 
Mr. Speaker, except for the will to have done it, to bring forward, to protect the people, Mr. Speaker, so that they could get more value for their money. And um, those businesses that are already doing this has nothing to worry about. But we also protect from frivolous claims, as said before. If you're claiming um, that you, you that a business was involved, so was involved in price gouging, then you have to prove it. And and once it goes to the commission, and the commission does an investigation and it shows that it's not so, Mr. Speaker, that is done so that you could protect the name of the business, because we know we live in a territory that's long on rumors and short on facts. And, and the rumors get out there, especially with social media now, it get out there so heavy, Mr. Speaker. Like, we, we have heard some rumors about, about this weekend with persons who, who came in and they're out on the street. And we went and we looked into all of those, Mr. Speaker. And up to this point, up to this point, we have found them not to be factual. But, Mr. Speaker, if you talk to most of the persons in the BVI, it's out there so heavy, it seems like the truth because there's 24 hours security. Yes, there are areas that we have to adjust, but not um, to the level or to the point of what we're seeing coming out in some of the social media. And Mr. Speaker, it is up to all people on a tangent that if they see these things and they know the person, so say because we're dealing with a virus, an invisible enemy. So Mr. Speaker, their uh, persons give some names and when we check on the names, those persons were here before the first lockdown but they were inside and they didn't come out. Now they see them, they say that they, they got here all of a sudden and the person saying, well, how come? But in the areas where there are issues, Mr. Speaker, when we recognize them, we're gonna deal with them. This is not to get in a mode of trying to cover up anything, but it tells us that whether it's consumer protection or COVID-19 or whatever, we have a civic duty to report directly so that we can get these things dealt with, even if you do it confidentially. But, but one person that posted, when we asked them, they said, well, all right, it was a friend that told them. But if you didn't see, don't post it. So, so, so these are the kind of areas that we have. But we believe in bringing these things to the House, Mr. Speaker. It's very important to keep the House informed. And I might add that even with our $40 million grant from Social Security, we're bringing it to the House so that the House can see how it's breaking down, what all has been done with it, so that we can make sure that the house is accountable, that um, the, it will be accountable to the house of, of what has been done with, with, with the, our money, as our money, Mr. Speaker. So I'm just talking about us making sure that we're responsible at all times, and that's what the Consumer Protection Act will also be doing. Because one thing with this administration, you can't fault us for not knowing. Uh, you can't fault us for, 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 for not giving out information. But we, we want to make sure that what we, we, we do is accountable and transparent and that we can live by our decisions, Mr. Speaker, because what is popular is not always right and what is right is not always popular. But this is a good day for the people of the Virgin Islands. It is a, is a, a beautiful day for the people of the Virgin Islands that we have finally come to the point where we can hold co uh, businesses accountable uh, for prices it's not, not a price control, but, but it's the closest thing we have until those legislations come to the House because it allows us to control it um, in, in the times of pandemic and disasters, etc. So I'm proud of this moment. I want to thank everyone for, for getting us to this, this time. We, uh, the consultant has been used, is the same consultant that was used by the last administration, and we just continue the the, the contract with, with the young lady because she is definitely knowledgeable in the area and uh, one of the best um, in the region. So we use her expertise to do this, Mr. Speaker. So that is one of the consultancies that we have and continue from the last administration that, that has yielded um, great value for money. And Mr. Speaker, we want to make sure that we continue to get support in um, our different areas and uh, uh, because we want to do what we have to do to make this territory a better place for us all, so that when we all are out of politics, we can say, God bless the day that we went into the House of Assembly and started from last week, but, start, but on the 8th, because today is the 8th of June, 
the 8th of June, a special day for Honorable Malone. Yes. 12th. Oh, he's 12th. Okay, good. 8th of June. Um, Honorable Natalia, yes. 8th of June. Today on the 8th of June that we can go and we can now say that we have passed on the 8th of June, when we are finished with all the deliberations, the consumer protection. And persons now can say, God bless that the, 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 the government had a day moved to get this done and make sure that we get it implemented. And so will be all the things that we will bring to this house, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we help with the economy, to make sure we report the $40 million that we got from Social Security, to make sure that we, we, we have um, new areas, new industries that we will be opening up. Some will be popular, some will not, but forward we shall go and forward we must go. So Mr. Speaker, I want to thank everyone who is involved and Tom Kuhn, um, the business at George also, who has helped try tremendously well. And I know that he's going to give her great joy because it's so long that um, this was coming into being that I believe when I landed first, I told her that she probably thought that it wasn't going to happen. But, but not only that it has happened, we have passed the Virgin Trade Commission. And now we are passing the consumer protection with more legislation to come to allow fair business practices. I can't wait for when we bring the legislation to separate uh, retail from wholesale. That's on the way. It's by time. Because a lot of our retail stores can, can sell more products at better prices, but sometimes the wholesalers, some of them hold on to it and put it in their stores and only give them what they want. And I don't know why they don't understand the concept that the more you help the smaller businesses, the more sales you will have for your, your wholesale. So because um, they have become greedy is what causes some of the smaller stores to have to look elsewhere for the product and, and they have to sell at such a higher um, um, amount and then persons all have to flock to, to town. When, when any right-thinking business person will sell, I, I am the distributor for these products, let me sell it to all the retailers for a certain price so that we all could sell for, for, for um, on the off the shelf for a specific price so that we all will benefit. That will mean that they don't have to go out to get the product in from somewhere else and cost more to the consumer or have to go and look for lesser value of products to sell as a as a, um, what you call an intimate, um, uh, uh, Im well, not an imitation, like an imitation brand, uh, meaning that if you have a one brand name something, the other brand name something, but both, like food cocktail, but two different brands, Dole and some other lesser brand in terms of quality, in terms of choice of words without calling the other brand. Because persons now would, would have to buy that other brand because that's all they can afford. And, you, and there's no problem with them. There's all they could afford. But at the same time, though, if, if the person who is selling the, 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 the known brand that has a higher quality or known as a higher quality is the, the wholesaler, and they can sell to all the retail stores from Anigata to Justin Nice or Justin Nice to Anigata, and all those other retail stores can get it for a certain price, then they won't have to be opening these set of stores competing with the same retail stores all through the place. That does, that does not make any business sense. But because those monopolies were allowed to set up, a lot of our people suffer financially because they, they are, no one was looking out in those areas. But that legislation is one of them is, that, are, that, are, that is coming. And I want to thank the, the, the um, consultant again for her work in that area. And one of the things that she told me here someday when she was speaking to me about some of these bills, she was afraid to say it, but then she ended up saying, Premier, well, you're not, you're not fearful or, or, or have any conflict, so you could move forward. And she said it in her creative way. I said, no, bring them all. Don't have any interest in these things other than the interest of the people of the Virgin Islands. So like telecom, you'll be hearing some things very soon about that. You're not against anyone, but when will the people's need be dealt with? Everything has to be driven by the people. You can't bankrupt the businesses because all people are in the businesses also. But, but we have to create a better balance. Right now is our balance in terms of the consumer and businesses. Not saying that they're not 
that there does not exist businesses that are doing well and I commend them. But, but for too long, we have allowed some of the major ones to get away with things that they needed to be pulled up on, but there was no law to make sure that, it, that it's done. That is the power of the people. And the power of the people, as I said in here, is what have to drive our, 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 cons, our, our next constitutional review. Not the politician, not the political party, the people have to drive the need for the constitutional review and, and, and what they want to see in this territory. So, Mr. Speaker, with that, I want to thank everyone for their input. And I look forward to a fruitful uh, com uh, committee stage because we have some amendments that will be made to strengthen the bill. And uh, I'm looking forward to that time so that when we do come out, we can come out with almost as perfect a bill as is possible so that the people out of the Virgin Islands now can be protected in during disasters, pandemic, and other catastrophic events from price gouging, among many other acts that we do not condone, that are not in the best interest of the people, nor their pocket. So with this, I present this bill now, Mr. Speaker, for the committee stage, and I so move. Thank you, Premier, and move of the motion. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled Virgin Islands Consumer Protection Act 2019 be now read a second time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. I call upon the clerk to read the bill a second time. This act may be cited as the Consumer Protection Act 2019. Pursuant to Standing Order 55-1 of the House of Assembly, this bill now stands committed to a committee of the whole House to be considered clause by clause. This House is now in committee. Further to
At this time, I call upon the Premier and Leader of Government Business to report on the bill. We can't. Hmm? No, but thing is Mr. Speaker, today is a historic day in the House of Assembly, and it's a day that we all will remember. And all our names will go down into the past and of this Consumer Protection Act. It was 2019 when it came in, but on the amendments, it'll be 2020. And Mr. Speaker, this indeed is a good day for the people of the Virgin Islands and the businesses of the Virgin Islands and for the protection of the consumers and also for the protection of businesses. Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, it's with great joy I said to God be all the glory. And I beg to report that the bill entitled Consumer Protection Act 2020, as it has been amended, has passed through committee with amendments. Mr. Speaker, sir, I invite the Leader of Opposition to second me on this, given the work that he has done. So, Mr. Speaker, so I move that the bill entitled as amended Virgin, uh, sorry, Consumer Protection Act 2020 be read a third time and passed as amended. Testing. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion and I also associate myself with the comments just raised by the Premier. I think it's important that we've gone through this process and this bill has passed through very strenuous situations and times, and I think it's a red letter day that we have been able to accomplish this here, this afternoon, this evening. And I think to God be the glory and to the people be the glory, for all the persons who work on this piece of legislation, it's an important step in moving forward and moving the economy forward and strengthening the economy of the Virgin Islands. And I rise gratefully and humbly rise to second this piece of legislation. Honorable members, the bill has been moved and seconded, entitled Consumer Protection Act 2020, and I ask that it be read a third time, a third time as amended. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The motion is passed. I call upon the clerk to read the bill for a third time. This act, this act may be cited as the Consumer Protection Act. 2020. This bill has been read a third time and passed with amendments. The Consumer Protection Act 2020 is now passed. Okay, members, just to keep you abreast of the order of the day, remember that seven became six, and seven will be the statement by ministers. So we continue now with a motion, and I call upon the Premier and Minister of Finance, the Honorable Andrew A. Foy, and member for the First District. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, where is Section 673E of the Virgin Islands Constitution Order, UKSI 2007, number 1678, provides that subject to subsection 7, an elected member of the House of Assembly shall indicate his or her seat if the member becomes a party to a contract with the government of the Virgin Islands for or on account of the public service, or if any form in which the member is or becomes a partner, or a company of which the member is or becomes a director or manager, be or manager becomes a party to a contract with the government of the Virgin Islands. Whereas Section 67.7 provides that if the circumstances, if in the circumstances it appears just to do so, the House of Assembly may exempt an elected member from vacating his or her seat under Subsection 3E if the member before 
becoming a party to a contract with the government or before or as soon as practicable after becoming otherwise interested in a contract discloses to the House of Assembly the nature of the contract and his or her interest in the contract or in any form or company involved in the contract. Whereas Honorable Carbon Malone, a member of the House of Assembly, is an elected member of the House of Assembly. Whereas the House, the Honorable Member is a director in a company known as Island Block Corporation Limited, which is situated in Rotong Registration Section 2837B, Parcels 132 and the company is desirous of providing paid services for the rental of its properties to the government of the, as follows. Lease of 6,000 square feet on the second floor of the Fleming Street building as a temporary records center for a period of two years commencing on a specific date of June 2020. The services shall be waived and the formal contract has to be drafted and signed. Whereas honorable members has disclosed to the House of Assembly his desire to provide these services to the government of the Virgin Islands, and whereas the Honorable Andrew A. Foy, the Premier Minister of Finance, has by motion moved the House of Assembly to exempt the Honorable Carbon Malone, member of House of Assembly, from vacating his seat as an elected member of the House of Assembly. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the House of Assembly of the Virgin Islands exempts the Honorable Carbon Malone, member of House of Assembly, from vacating his seat as an elected member of the House of Assembly. Mr. Speaker, this motion uh, has been read, but it cannot be just allowed to um, be hanged out there by itself. There's some background here that is needed because whenever one hears a member of the House of Assembly, especially since we have taken office, come to declare their interest on in something, they say, well, all right, it's going into a politician's hand and it's not um, what, what happened to other persons. Well, this is a case, Mr. Speaker, where there are very little persons left that have not been benefiting from what is happening here. We have had disagreements on how the complex should be fixed, Mr. Speaker. But I want to state to the, uh, to the Honorable House, Mr. Speaker, that I don't see any other way for the complex to be fixed at this time, given the state that it is in, other than making sure everyone moves out. And I want to give the backdrop of the process that was done. It was not done by elected members. This is under the deputy governor's office, and there's a, a committee that is set up, and they went out and they look at all the available buildings in town, right out of the outskirts of Road Town, um, whether it be going to the east or the west, or north or south, in terms of the outskirts of Road Town. And they went and they looked, and they brought back a listing of the buildings. Mr. Speaker, this was not the first building selected. It was not selected at first. It was put down as an alternate building. But because sometimes the wheels of government don't turn too fast, when uh, we look one of the spaces that was supposed to have already been, been occupied by one of the government departments, because of how long it took to occupy it and do some of the things that this building is going to do now, it was rented out to other private entity that, that move much faster. And this is not the only building that um, falls in this, but this one, the member is part of a company that owns the building. So now it is, is left to use the only one that is um, left that can facilitate the needs of what the deputy governor's office uh, um, team that they put together dealing with the rental of businesses can cite, and the Ministry of Finance also had a hand in it. So it's nothing that has been trumped up by the Minister of Finance, a mayor, the messenger. The process has been transparent, it has been accountable. And uh, Mr. Speaker, we want to make sure that we, we be forthright and honest with the people of the Virgin Islands uh, as this government that any dealings that we uh, might have to have, uh, that we bring it to the people prior or within the time that's allowed, but hopefully we've been it prior because we don't want to, to, to do anything uh, and then come afterwards. We do not want to do it. Sometimes those things happen, but we pray that we don't ever fall in that spectrum. Mr. Speaker, the building itself, I don't want to say too much of it to put uh, any um, negativity towards government, but it's, it's, it's not in the best condition 
for anyone to be walking at in this time, especially if it rains. Especially if it rains. I'll, I'll leave it there. Along with other areas of concerns that have been to that building for quite some time. The, the Minister of Transportation has been leading the charge for the, for the refurbishment and the, uh, of, the, of the building. And this has been since the hurricane 2017. So this has also been, been one of the projects that this government has taken on and says it's time for our public officers to be in a better working environment from 2017 to now it, it cannot uh, continue. Uh, since then, we, you would know that we came in here and we did it in a time when some persons were saying, wait until it was finished um, being rebuilt and, and remodeled and uh, recovered, so to speak, before we rename it. And we, we move forward because never let the perfect become the enemy of the greater good. And most of the times, whenever you're leading, you'll have 360 reasons why not to move in this direction. Uh, and if you, if you take all of them on, you never get anything done. And uh, when the Minister of Works told me that he was going to, to make sure um, that he brings the motion because he and the Minister of Health discussed it, and the, and the Minister said, well, right, this is a decision the two of them uh, have an have, um, idea. And I told him that's a good idea. And when the Minister of Transportation brought the motion, I tell him, said he wants to bring the motion, I tell him, let's move ahead. And we name it the Ralph T. O'Neill Administration Complex. And it's good that we name it at the time that we did because who, who, who knew that Mr. O'Neill was going to die not too long after? No one knows. I mean, he was down sick, but no one knew that he would, be, be, he would pass away not too long after. And he was able, while he was living, Mr. Speaker, to at least get some fruits of his labor seen. And his wife now, who is also a blessed memory, so I'm glad that we moved before it was completed because I see that as a, tra as a, 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 a marker now to put down. And I, I strongly suggest that we get a name up and from now so that whenever we see the name Ralph T. O'Neill, we know that we a complex that we have to move faster to make sure that the building reflects the name, it reflects the character of the name, it, it, re it reflects the ambience of the name, it reflects the, the work that that name has done. It, it reflects uh, everything that, that, that Honorable Neil has, has fought for by making sure that the building is back up in an excellent manner. So, Mr. Speaker, I commend the Minister of Transportation and Works when he brought that motion. And all of us have to leave. And I know, Mr. Speaker, that um, in this Honorable House, we would always hear the debates of what could be done. Um, could we move on the other side? The whole roof was bad. And the minister is trying to complete the roof. He just signed a contract with um, OBM Limited, OBMI Limited, where Mr. Flax was a leading person there to do with the, with the design and to do with um, also putting an elevator on the other wing and, and make it more modern and more uh, 21st century-ish. With the, with the whole design and ambience of the building. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Transport is here telling me that, that I'm one of the last persons that won't leave the building so they could get to start. So, Mr. Speaker, I, my, my Premier's office also have to leave. We all have to leave. As a matter of fact, all the departments have already left. I, when I'm looking for the AG office, I have to go up the road. When I'm looking for my ministers, I have to go across the road. And um, you can't reach some of them in walking distance now uh, because everyone had to leave so that the building can get uh, fixed and modernized in the best way possible. And Mr. Speaker, if you come into the complex right now, there are sections where the roof is being held up with, 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 with some plywood on top and, and, and um, two by four underneath holding up the roof. And, and you, you dare not walk in those areas. So there's a lot of hazard. And from 2017 to now, um, that is quite a while, Mr. Speaker, and we have to address those areas and address them now. And it has been a while getting some of the things done. We, first, we were working on the, on the roof area. Then we were working where the minister moved forward, and then he was able now to sign for, to complete the, the full designs of, of it. But the good thing is that he's moving. And, and things are being done. And 
We're making sure that, that we negotiate better prices because he was able to renegotiate a contract with OBM from, from where originally he was with the last administration, about two point something million, six million or something. He got it down to one, one million and change because we were able to relook certain areas. So there's a lot of work being done. Uh, um, most, I would say about 90% or if not 95% of the offices have already moved out of the complex with just a few to go. By the end of June, everyone would be moved out of the complex, including the Premier's office minister, so you wouldn't have to ask me again, uh, or before that, because he's anxious. He's a young, vibrant minister, um, or GQ minister. He's vibrant, he's ready to go to get the complex, looking as good as how he dresses. And um, I let him to know that he will get that done, Mr. Speaker. So this now um, came in as one of the alternate buildings since some of the buildings um, were, were, were already, as I said, that were already selected, were not available anymore because we move at the speed of governments. So when you move at the speed of governments anywhere, you know how fast that goes sometimes, and, and um, the private sector can move right ahead of you and snatch it from under you. And I might add that um, there are other um, entities of government where this happened, but because those persons were not elected or because they're not in a company that owns a building that I, that I elected, we did not have to come to the House of Assembly. And I am proud to know that we do these things, Mr. Speaker, because we know that I have sat in the House for quite some years and watched a lot of things happen where persons did not declare. And Mr. Speaker, we, the, the records of this House will show that there was quite some dance on those, but nevertheless, we leave sleeping dogs lie on those. But now that we have reached here, when we have to come, when we must come according to the lie, tell them don't hide it, come ahead. If there was a other building um, that could have handled uh, what was being done, that was exhausted, and then the decision was this, because I knew that we have to come to the house, and there are persons that will take this in the, in the, in the wrong light, and Mr. Speaker uh, tried to make it seem as if this is something given to the member, which it is not. And Mr. Speaker, I'm always amazed because uh, when persons talk about certain things uh, when you're elected, it is as if everything must, all your businesses must go dead. It's not a matter of that. It just means you cannot use your position to advance your business cause. And the, here in this um, section where the minister has not even had a hand in it, but it's one of the buildings that have been selected. But as I said, he is part of the company that owns it. So Mr. Speaker, let us make sure that we are forthright and transparent and accountable in our actions and come to the house despite his, his small part in the company, yet it's still a part, um, he's still a, a partner in the company that owns the building. So I, uh, he agreed, let us go and do the right thing according to the law. So, Mr. Speaker, I just want to put that backdrop why the building is being used, Mr. Speaker, and that all the other buildings of this nature have a, um, the, the, the search group that was put together has exhausted everything. And, Mr. Speaker, the, the movement of the complex has to be completed now because there are contracts signed for specific periods of time to get things done, and uh, the delays here will cost the government more money in the end. And Mr. Speaker, we can look at the rent for these buildings and say, well, well um, there's a lot of money just to move. But Mr. Speaker, one of the things I saw since we took office, whenever we move, there is a democratic process to evaluate what a government does. But, but Mr. Speaker, no movement was there before in terms of, of, of even saying, well, all right, let me fix it while, somehow while they're there or, or move some or whatever the case may be. I commend the public officers from 2017 to now for coming to work, especially in the last um, 2018, 2019, because things have been done and we must commend the facilities, manager, Mr. Donovan and all of them for what they've been doing in, in, in a very um, hectic um, time. I commend them for going to work in, in the kind of conditions that they had to work in and still have to work in, because even by the Premier's office, when it rains, Mr. Speaker, as we say in our language, church out. Mr. Speaker, when you come out walking, you better take it gingerly before 
your, your slide and go, um, and it wouldn't be the electric slide. So that's us. For me, I put all the political things aside, and, and I know that we have to move forward. Uh, it would be a, a bitter pill for some to swallow, but better safe than sorry. And, and Mr. Speaker, as I promised the public officers, that better they deserve and better they will get. And this is a movement in that direction. So Mr. Speaker, this is what this motion is about, securing one more area because of the need for everyone to move out of the Ralph T. O'Neill complex so that it can be fixed, since it was not fixed since 2017. And Mr. Speaker, the reason that this building where the member is, is part owner, it has been selected finally is because it was on the alternate list. But some of the areas that was already secured, Mr. Speaker, the movement of government to secure them paperwork wise and to make sure that the people who owned them were briefed, meaning they were paid, was slow. So other entities stepped in and went with those areas, causing them to move towards the other alternate buildings. And this is not the only one, but this is the only one that has uh, uh, elected the representative as part owner. Hence the need why we have to come to the House of Assembly. So I put this to the House, Mr. Speaker, now for DB. Is there a second? Mr. Speaker, I rise uh, to second the motion and to also give my support to this resolution here for allowing the honorable member to uh, partake in business with the government uh, today. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Constitution of 67-7 speaks to the circumstances it appears just to do so the House of Assembly may exempt an elected member from vacating his or her seat under Section 3C if the member before becoming a party to a contract uh, with the government or before or as soon as practicable after becoming otherwise interested in a contract discloses to the House of Assembly the nature of the contract and his or her interest in the contract or in any form or company involved in the contract. But Mr. Speaker, uh, today I, I must refer to 60, Section 67.8 of the Constitution where it states that any request by an elected member for exemption under subsection 7 shall be made by way of motion which shall be placed on the order paper for a decision of the House of Assembly. And Mr. Speaker, that's the reason we are here today uh, discussing uh, this motion, this resolution. And what I want to speak about is, is, is the character of the honorable member, because as the Premier mentioned, he spoke about the building and, and the, the R.T. O'Neill administration complex. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's the Premier, he, he tasked me with the with a job to get the admin, the, the R.T. O'Neill complex rebuilt and refurbished. And he spoke about, you know, I, I, I also want to, before I go into that, thank him for his, his compliment on my dress and, and how it compares to how we intend to have the complex after it's finished. He even spoke about having the sign go up. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would beg to differ because the condition the complex is in right now I cannot associate the signage up with the way and the character of the name associated with the building. So this is why we are here, trying to get all persons out, all departments, ministries, files, everyone out of the complex so that we can actually start the work. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's been long in coming, and I, I too want to speak to the public officers who have been working in that facility since hurricane, the hurricanes of 2017. And they continue to produce and continue to carry out their duties without even, you know, they have the, the hiccups with, with various aspects of it, Mr. Speaker, but I must applaud them for what they have been able to do 
um, during uh, being in the complex. And I, I'm happy to hear that the, the Premier's office would be moving um, in the short term because with personnel in the business, in the building, it would be difficult for us to do some of the work as he spoke about uh, the, the lights, the skylights. The roof, the roof is leaking the, through the skylights and that contract was signed months ago and we are waiting patiently because um, you can't have the guys working, you know, have scaffolding there because it's a dangerous situation. So we are feverishly working for all persons to leave, leave the building. And this is a process as well, where the, the, we'll be moving to, to this space where the honorable member, he is a part of the company. And Mr. Speaker, I want to speak to his, the, the member's morality, his, his, his character, because this has been in discussion for quite some time and he was a bit reluctant for us to utilize this space because, you know, even before I got here, you always hear that, you know, the, the people have no confidence in, in leaders because they always feel that persons are corrupt and, you know, they're always trying to, to reap from the government. And the memo was a bit reluctant, but through conversation and, and not having a place to, with, with this space at the time to move into, he finally agreed. And Mr. Speaker, we have not moved one thing into that building because the, the member is saying that he wants to make sure that he go through the right procedure before we go into the building. So Mr. Speaker, that's why we're here today. That's why we are here going through this motion because the member wants to make sure that we go through the right procedure. And Mr. Speaker, I applaud this government because this is something that we spoke about during the campaign in terms of um, making sure that we do everything publicly. We go by the books and we are trying to rebuild the confidence of the people in governance on a whole so that you know, more and more persons would be enticed to come and, and represent the people and not have the fear that because you become a politician, you know, you'll, you'll turn out to be um, a crook or turn out to, to, to um, do things in a, in a wrong manner. So Mr. Speaker, I applaud the member for making sure that this resolution comes to the House even before the lease is signed so that he can make sure that we go through things in the right manner. And Mr. Speaker, with me seconding this motion, I'm excited for us to get the process going. The Premier gave me this mandate, but you know, he's hindering it a little bit with not trying to get out of the building. I'm not sure what he's scared of because he has signed this his lease to leave the, the, the admin complex a long time. So I want him to hurry up, get out, and so we could get along with the, the refurbishing of the R.T. O'Neill complex. And Mr. Speaker, I can assure you that once we get to the, the point where the sign is erected on the building, then we'll see, we'll compare the character of the man with the, with the signage of the building so that we know what all it represents. And Mr. Speaker, with that, I just want to, you know, lend my support to this resolution so that we can move along with retrofitting the central, the, the R.T. O'Neill complex um, in the way that we have, we intend for it to, to look when it's all finished. With that, Mr. Speaker, I say thank you. I thank the member for the fifth district for his contribution. The floor remains open on the resolution, the motion before the House. Haven't seen anyone willing to speak. I call upon the sponsor of the resolution, the Honorable Premier, to wrap up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that this motion in uh, the House will be voted on. And I thank all members for the input. May the work of the complex go on. Thank you. Honorable members, the motion before the House is to prohibit the Honorable Carvin Malone from vacating his seat, granting him permission to engage in business with the government of the Virgin Islands. 
Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The motion is passed. I call upon the clerk. Item number seven, statements by ministers. I call upon the Premier and Minister of Finance and member for the fifth district, the Honorable Andrew A. Foy. Pause this week. Pause this week, you are correct. Hmm? correct that. I said the fifth. First. No, first district. Okay, good. Member for the first district. Good, no, that, no, that you have it correct. Mr. Speaker, I have one statement here today. And Mr. Speaker is entitled Constitutional Review, The People, The Constitution, and The Economy. Mr. Speaker, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to address this Honorable House on this matter of national importance and to advise in the spirit of transparency and cooperation of the intentions of your government. The world we live in is continuously changing. We do not need to throw our minds back too far to realize how true this is. Six months ago, COVID-19 did not exist. Today, everything we do and say is dictated by COVID-19. Technology has also been rapidly changing. Those of us who are not too old would recall it used to take weeks to get a letter by post. That was not long ago. Today, instant messaging and mobile communications are a way of life. When you left your home back in the day, you couldn't get a phone call. Now, even in your bathroom, you can get a call or respond to email, and no one knows where you are. Technology has altered the environment in which businesses and economies operate and how countries relate with one another. Globalization has made the environment more competitive. It has also opened up new opportunities and new possibilities that never existed before. Every now and then, as a society, it is therefore necessary for us to pause, assess the environment around us and the tools at our disposal, and to review where we are in our journey as a country and as a people and also to assess our position in the global picture. We have to ask ourselves as Virgin Islanders, are we where we want to be at this time? Are we on the path that we need to be on? Are we equipped and configured to compete and to face the challenges of the present and future? Part of this exercise, Mr. Speaker, involves reviewing our constitution to ensure that it is relevant to the present day and that it can be of support in taking us forward to where we want to go as a territory. It is now 70 years since the BBI got its first written constitution. The 1950 constitution returned certain powers back to the reformed legislative council in the BBI from the governor of the Leeward Islands where decision making had been vested previously for some time. In the 17 year, 70 years, the BVI has had four constitutions and a few amendments accordingly. When we look at 70 years where we started, Mr. Speaker, we should be much further. I truly believe this. Our people should, be, should have been further along the road of self-determination. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm, I am merely reflecting a sentiment on how I see the potential of the Virgin Islands people to be. With constitutional review and reform, we are preparing our next generation. Just as we recognize how technology has advanced, our young Virgin Islanders and the generations to come will be entering a world that is remarkably di different from 1950 and 2007. So our constitution has to be advanced. It has to be relevant for the time. 
During the campaign for the February 2019 general election, my team and I promised that we would conduct the constitutional reform exercise that is due. It has been 13 years since our most recent Virgin Islands constitution was enacted. A lot around us has changed since. On several occasions, our previous Premier, Dr. the Honorable D. Orlando Smith, spoke of the necessity for reviewing our constitution. He indicated both the local population and the UK government that it was time for a review. Circumstances such as the 2017 natural disasters got in the way of Dr. Smith starting this process. But having given our word to the population that as your new government, we would commence the constitutional review process, I'm here today to say that your government is moving to keep this promise and to begin the process for constitutional review. Mr. Speaker, I wish to advise honorable members that as Premier, I have caused the necessary documents to be prepared for the matter of a review of the Constitution to be brought before the Cabinet as a matter of urgency. His Excellency the Governor has already been advised of your government's intentions to review the Constitution. The Cabinet note asks for the matter to be referred to the House of Assembly, where the elected representatives from the nine districts and the four at-large representatives will debate this issue. Providing the resolution gains the approval of the House of Assembly, the next step will be the establishment of a Constitutional Review Commission. The Commission's work includes engaging the population to find out their views on our present Constitution and what the citizens of the BVI would like to see changed. Mr. Speaker, as you are aware, a Constitution is not just a set of rules to enforce upon people, as we often think it is. It is a vehicle for enabling citizens to achieve their dreams and aspirations. Your vehicle has to be designed and equipped for your journey. Otherwise, it will not fulfill its purpose and you will not get to your destination. This is not a one-man job. It is not a one-party exercise. It is about all of us as Virgin Islanders because it affects all of us as Virgin Islanders regardless of social status and political affiliation, there will be full transparency. This is why the issue will be debated in the House of Assembly and why Her Majesty's loyal opposition will have been put into the composition of the Constitutional Review Commission. Steps have already been taken to convene a special informal meeting of the House of Assembly on 16 June 2020 to discuss the dynamics of this Constitutional Review exercise. I've also spoken with the Honorable Leader of the Opposition on the matter as well. I look forward to this being a very fruitful exercise for the benefit of the territory. May I say that since we are one people on a common journey, we have to ensure that the targets that are set reflect the will of the BVI people and not anyone else's agenda. Key to achieving this is for the mechanisms to be put in place that will allow the people to lift up their voices and when the opportunities are presented. They must be able to speak up as proud, ambitious Virgin Islands people and tell the Commission to tell their government and their opposition what they want the Constitution to say and where they want us as a people and country to go. We do not want persons sitting down and holding their tongue only to disagree with whatever choices are made down the road. Tell us where you want to go and where you do not want to go as a people. In order for citizens and to participate meaningfully in this exercise, they must prepare themselves and they must be informed for the discussions. This means that every Virgin Islander must read and evaluate the current Virgin Islands Constitution. I've asked the Government Information Service, GIS, to ensure that the Constitution is easily accessible on the government's website so every Virgin Islander can download it. Through you, Mr. Speaker, your government would like there to be a copy of the Constitution in every home. Thus, I would ask the House of Assembly to assist in having the copies prepared and for all 13 members, whether they are district representatives or at-large representatives, to help us to ensure that every home has a copy and it's on every doorstep of every Virgin Islander. As always, I'll be leading by example. 
I'll be ensuring that in the first district, each household gets their hard copy of the Constitution. It is not too late for us adults to get to know our Constitution. And it's not too early for the young ones, especially those in high school, to familiarize themselves with it. I would urge that when the Constitution is read, take your time and digest it section by section. Look at the preamble, which has sought to encapsulate the aspirations of the Virgin Islands people. It speaks about our unique cultural identity and our heritage, our free and independent spirit, our moral and spiritual values, our quest for social justice, economic empowerment and political advancement, and our desire to become a self-governing people and to exercise the highest degree of control over the affairs of our country at this stage of its development. Look at the relevant paragraphs and sections and deliberate on them. Ask yourself whether what is written at present achieves those objectives or if there are gaps. Is the current constitution designed to empower Virgin Islanders economically? Is it supporting the BVI's political advancement? Is it giving Virgin Islanders social justice? Does it truly give Virgin Islanders the highest degree of control over the country's affairs? You may say yes, or you may say no. And depending on what you conclude, then the next question will be, how do we make it better and stronger? In searching for the answers to these questions, we also have to review our history, the journey that us Virgin, Island, Virgin Islands people are uh, unstarted before our forefathers landed on these shores. Emancipation, the struggles of the Theod Theodolf Faulkners and Noel Lloyds, and all the other milestones are all part of the history that defines who we are and what our aspirations are. This is a continuing journey. It will continue with us and then our children will take over from us and continue marching forward. What they will inherit depends on the work we do today and what we will hand over to them. So I want us to do a thorough job. As our people read and reflect, Mr. Speaker, it is important that they discuss these issues with friends, family, and co-workers. I encourage Virgin Islanders to talk about the Constitution in their homes as BVI families, in their workplace, on the airwaves, on social media, on the streets, and everywhere adhering, of, of course, to social distancing and the new regular. If there's an issue that is adversely affecting Virgin Islanders, then that can be solved through the Constitution. Then it needs to be put on the table now. We cannot stay silent and be distracted and then cry over regrets later on. There are things within the Constitution for which advancement of our people have not moved, and these are the areas that we have to address in the constitutional review exercise. If we liken the four-year term of office for a government to a four by 100 race, Mr. Speaker, is it right to tie the hands and feet of the government and to put it to run this race? And then after four years, with their feet and hands tied, you come to judge the government and ask why they have not even completed one lap. A lot of the power that people think the BBI government has, we do not have, because a glass ceiling has been placed over our heads. It is not easily visible, but it exists. And it affects the government's ability to raise funding. It imposes priorities on which your BVI government is forced to direct funds under threats that our ability to manage our affairs can be taken away from us. It is time we address these so-called elephants in the room. It is time we discuss these issues in a mature setting and deal with the things that have been holding back our progress. This is why this constitutional constitution review will be driven by the people. They will direct it, and we will do our part to listen. Because each of us in here 
will admit that the people are the ones who put us here and they are the ones who will determine how long we will be here. And that is why the Constitution is theirs. They are the ones who will be the driving force behind the Constitutional Review. After 70 years of having redevolved powers and four written constitutions, we should have reached further. We should be able to have a greater control over the systems and processes that affect our pursuit and our ability to realize our aspirations as a people. Mr. Speaker, the Constitution Review will be led by the people once they tell us loudly and clearly where they want to go, how far they want to go, we will fight for their cause with utmost passion. I look forward to all Virgin Islanders, belongers and residents participating in this process and collaborating to build a stronger, better BVI and to equip the territory and our people for success. May God continue to watch over his Virgin Islands people. I thank you. I thank the Honorable Premier for his statement. I now recognize the Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture, and member for the 7th District, Dr. the Honorable Natalio D. Whitley. Testing? Hello? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to read a slightly amended version of a, a statement I did on, on GIS. Uh, this is an update on the education sector. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity to share with this honorable house and the entire community an update on education in the COVID-19 era. Before I do so, allow me to recognize some precious souls who we have recently lost, who have served the education system at some point. Mr. Speaker, Reverend Idris O'Neill, who taught religious education at the then BVI High School, has gone away home. And I take this opportunity to extend, extend heartfelt sympathies to her entire family including the Minister of Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration, her son-in-law, along with the entire Virgin Islands community. Mr. Speaker, the education system also lost a young, talented educator by the name of Shemaine Bruley. Let me express my condolences on behalf of myself and the ministry to her loved ones. Mr. Speaker, I was also sad to learn about the passing of Derry Atkins, a former music teacher of the St. George's Primary School. Though Mr. Atkins passed in his native Guyana, he served for many years in the BVI and touched many lives on this soil. Also, Mr. Speaker, close family members of former and current educators have also passed in recent times. I offer condolences to the following persons. Mr. Cecil Hodge on the passing of his mother, Marguerite Scott, on the passing of her mother, Yolande, who was also the wife of the late great educator, Carlisle Scott. Uh, sorry, uh, Cecil Hodge's mother's name was Katura Maloney and Hilroy George's stepdad, Norwell Crickey, who is also the uncle of Principal Norma Crickey. Mr. Speaker, I also use this opportunity to express condolences to employees within my ministry. Lete Garin on the passing of her father, John Raymer, who is also Lorna Stevens and Charlene Smith's great uncle. May the souls of our beloved rest in eternal peace and may the comforting arms of the Father wrap around their loved ones in a healing embrace in their time of grief. Mr. Speaker, it has been just under 12 weeks since Cabinet mandated that schools be closed due to the threat of COVID-19. In that space of time, we have had eight confirmed cases of the COVID-19 
including, unfortunately, one death. I take this opportunity to congratulate the Cabinet, the Health Minister, the HEOC team, our hardworking doctors and nurses, and so many others for their leadership, toil, and commitment. I also express my profound appreciation to the members of this community for your diligence, your patience, your understanding, and your cooperation. As a result of God's grace and our collective action, the territory of the Virgin Islands at this stage has no confirmed active cases. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, we have been successful up until this point, keeping our children, one of our most valuable and vulnerable population safe. But we must not become wary in well-doing. On June 2nd, our borders reopened, and we must continue to manage this situation carefully. Mr. Speaker, we must continue to practice wisdom and use caution, because as our Premier always says, we are not out of the woods yet. Mr. Speaker, through the wonders of technology, we have been able to continue teaching and learning. I want to express my profound gratitude, gratitude to our principals, teachers, students, and parents for your enthusiastic participation in online education. As a parent of two school-aged children, I have personally witnessed the teachers and students in action. And I must say it has been impressive Mr. Speaker, I personally commend all education officials, and especially the teachers, for their hard work, their level of preparation and engagement, and all that is being done to ensure that our children succeed in this new learning environment. Parents, I acknowledge you as well. Many of you have to work your jobs and still help your children with their work. Having to help my two children at the same time is very taxing. And I know you parents are ready for a vacation. Mr. Speaker, we must all feel a greater sense of appreciation for our teachers who have to deal with all our children every day. Mr. Speaker, I participated in a Zoom forum with students from the 9th District recently and the students expressed that they wanted to continue with their online learning even beyond COVID-19. They also expressed that they were able to meet the same objectives as within the classroom. There are many across the nine districts who can attest to the fact that online learning can work. However, Mr. Speaker, online learning is not without its challenges. The two main challenges are that some students do not have electronic devices and or adequate internet, both of which are being addressed. In regard to devices, I made an appeal to corporate BVI in my last statement, and I must say they have stepped up to the plate. I speak here of businesses and organizations such as Quality Construction, donating six Chromebooks, Oil Nut Bay, don donating 25. The BVI Football Association, 20 laptops. UNICEF, 50. Rotary, donating five laptops to Ivan Dawson School and pledging to donate to the Joyce Samuels Primary School and the Alexandrina Primary School. Adventist Di Disaster Relief Agency and Deloitte have also pledged devices. I should add, Mr. Speaker, that we have many other individuals, including representatives of districts who have been pledging devices to their constituents, and I thank them, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that the 132 Chromebooks from Bitter End Yacht Club through Unite BVI are now on island and distribution will begin shortly. Mr. Speaker, it is also my pleasure to announce that the 500 laptops procured as part of the government's 
stimulus package are arriving this week. I was just told that by the vendor today, Mr. Speaker. And these will definitely help the students who have not been accessing the online learning. Walk packets have helped to fill the gap for students unable to access classes online. Parents are expected to return completed work at the end of each week and collect new information for the upcoming week. In regard to internet, Mr. Speaker, the ministry, in an effort to ascertain the needs of students to access online learning, launched a survey on the 31st of March 2020, and it concluded on the 23rd of April 2020. I express thanks to all who took the time to complete the survey. A special thanks to the principals who ensured that the parents in their schools completed it. Over 3,000 responses were received. From this survey and subsequent follow-ups with parents, we were able to determine the needs of students to access online learning. Mr. Speaker, I am happy to announce that Flo has confirmed an internet package at the price point parents indicated they could afford on the online learning survey. This discounted package will be available for parents who completed the survey, who confirmed a need for an affordable internet package for the purpose of online education. Interested persons within this category should contact the ministry and receive further direction. In addition to the discounted internet packages, work is currently being conducted to establish fiber connections at each of the public schools in the territory. Mr. Speaker, we have invested lots of time, energy, and resources into preparing teachers, students, and members of the public for online learning. The training for virtual learning for grades K through 12 educators has been pretty intense over the past weeks, as principals and teachers have been honing skills, becoming acquainted with the various platforms, and discovering how to engage pedagogy using online modes. The use of Cisco WebEx and the Google Suites have been our major online platforms. Class schedules were adjusted to accommodate the online teaching. They have been a blend of interactive sessions and assignments through Google Classroom and Class Dojo. Mr. Speaker, the ministry has also commenced a series of live educational sessions on Facebook with the aim of providing ongoing educational support at this time. To date, we have conducted should be four sessions, and these are expected to continue in the coming weeks. Our first session gave parents a full briefing of the online platforms to be used for learning during the Trinity term. We use the opportunity also to clear up misconceptions and to answer those frequently asked questions. There was a recorded 15,000 views. Our second session focused on student support services available during this period of online learning. And we also had a focus on supporting parents of young children as we focus on early childhood awareness. My ministry will continue to share with the public, but specifically parents, relevant information on how to cope during this time when the home has also become the classroom. Mr. Speaker, online education has brought some major adjustments, and I am proud of how educators have been engaging. Collaboration in lesson planning and development has been across the board. This is an initiative for which we have been longing. Public and private school teachers have been working together to formulate lessons, assessments, and activities by grade levels and by subjects at both primary and secondary levels. We have made this switch permanent. We will enhance classrooms with Promethean boards, computers, and other electronic devices to facilitate learning. The digital textbooks will continue in September. 
Currently, the content is being reviewed and updated in preparation for the new school year. We wish to see the integration of technology in education in a very real way. COVID-19 forced us to make this decision, but we will continue to engage this 21st century approach to education. Mr. Speaker, we have come to realize that in spite of our best efforts to move online learning fully, there are some groups of students that are not being adequately served. These groups include children with special needs, technical students, marginalized students, students preparing to sit standardized examinations, and some of our adult education students. We have heard the cries of those who have said that special education students need some special attention, attention that automotive students need an hour or two of practical instruction, that those with individualized educational plans are falling behind. And therefore, Cabinet, in its wisdom, decided to allow a limited number of students with specific needs on campus. Mr. Speaker, on Monday, the 1st of June, 2020, a new public health COVID-19 control and suppression measures order 2020 came into effect. Cabinet decided the following, that access should be granted to students in senior grades who are preparing to for and or sitting standardized exams or with special requirements, whether attending public, private, or church schools. <coughs> students should have access to classrooms on a staggered schedule to enable safe distancing protocols. Specific steps must be taken to ensure adequate social distancing and hygiene measures are adhered to, thus reducing the chances of disease transmission. Classroom equipment and tools, including desk, chairs, tables, and doors, must be properly disinfected between staggered sessions to reduce the chances of tr transmission among students and teachers. Schools should be inspected and certified by the Chief Environmental Health Officer prior to opening. I wish to stress, Mr. Speaker, that certification by the Chief Environmental Health Officer is required prior to the reopening of any educational institution for the categories listed. Institutions have already been inspected and approved. Therefore, in the coming weeks, the Ministry of Education will be working very closely with the Ministry of Health officials to implement Cabinet's decision. We realize, Mr. Speaker, that some parents will prefer that their children remain at home at this time. However, we need to ensure that the option for reopening schools in a phased manner is available for the categories of students mentioned. Mr. Speaker, I cannot emphasize enough as we allow this limited number of students to access our physical school structures. Safety is our number one priority. In consideration of such a decision was underpinned by a comprehensive look at guidance of international, regional, and local bodies. Ministry officials engage UNICEF's framework for reopening schools, which requires that the following six key dimensions be used to assess their states of readiness and inform planning. One, policy. Two, financing. Three, safe operations. Four, learning five, reaching the most marginalized, and six, well-being and protection. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, the ministry has been guided by CAFA's guidance for the education sector. UNICEF's key messages and actions for COVID-19 prevention control in schools, the Center for Disease Control's interim guidance for child care programs, the World Health Organization's considerations for school-related public health measures, in the context of COVID-19, as well as a local environmental health units, public health guidance for schools K-12 and child care centers, and cleaning and disinfection school guidance. Mr. Speaker, the ministry has utilized this international, regional, and local guidance to inform the development of a phased plan of action for continuity in the education system. The plan, which has been noted by Cabinet, includes various measures to address the risks presented to children's education, protection, and well-being, 
as a result of the closure of educational institutions in response to COVID-19 for primary, secondary, and tertiary institutions. It also addresses the medium through which teaching and learning will take place and how some of the ongoing challenges since the implementation of online learning can be mitigated against. Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 threat is fluid and therefore this plan is constantly being evaluated against local conditions, cabinet decisions, along with other factors. It is envisioned that moving into the future, even beyond COVID-19, we will utilize a blended approach of online and face-to-face -face education, and the public will be kept informed as we adjust to shifting circumstances. Mr. Speaker, I must take this opportunity to address our daycare centers and preschools, which have been having a difficult time due to closure. These institutions have employees in limbo and financial obligations to fulfill. While the advice of our health officials has recommended they remain closed, we cannot ignore the cries of those who look after our most precious resource, our children. That is why I'm pleased that the stimulus package announced by our Premier has included daycares and preschools as businesses eligible for assistance at this time. Mr. Speaker, no one can deny, especially during COVID-19, the importance of early childhood education centers. These institutions play an absolutely vital role, so I wish to take a few minutes to celebrate our young children and those who help develop them. We must be sure that we use every opportunity to establish the best experiences in home and school for our young people to strengthen their foundation. For this investment will pay dividends in our society for generations. Mr. Speaker, I am concerned about the vulnerability of our young people with the continued closure of daycare centers and preschools. We are aware that there are less than ideal arrangements being put in place at the moment. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I am encouraged that Cabinet, in its wisdom, has also decided that the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture, and the Ministry of Health and Social Development should undertake further work to develop agreed protocols on safe distancing, hygiene, and monitoring to enable a decision to be made in respect to the reopening of daycare centers and preschools. Mr. Speaker, I therefore ask that daycares and preschools now engage my ministry, along with environmental health, in a dialogue on the specific steps required to ensure the safest possible environment for our children. I look forward to this collaboration as we develop a detailed framework for daycare centers and preschools for the consideration of cabinet. Mr. Speaker, I must also address two vital areas before I close, examinations and graduation. I have taken the decision to cancel key stage exams and the CPEA this year. This was a difficult decision to make, but I carefully considered the strain that has been placed on teachers, parents, and students in adjusting to online education. I also had to consider the fact that there are some young people who still do not have the tools to properly function. Though online education is working for many of our students, teachers have a challenge in ensuring students are always completely focused during lessons. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, continuous assessment will be used as usual for, mo pro for promotion from one grade to another. This will include projects, investigations, book reports, quizzes, classwork, and kinesthetic assignment assessments. These assessments will be dispersed throughout the term, and many have already been conducted. This term will only be weighted as 20% of the student's overall grade for the 2019-2020 academic year, with the advent and Lent terms accounting for 40% each. Mr. Speaker, graduation requirements for our secondary schools 
will have to be adjusted based on the impracticality of doing community service hours, for example. Also, Cabinet has decided that all graduation exercises will be done virtually. This includes all schools, both public and private. Cabinet made one amendment to this decision, allowing physical graduations for graduating classes of 10 or less. These ceremonies must adhere to Cabinet approved protocols for safe distancing and sanitization. This is being done to keep the population safe as we navigate this COVID-19 era. Schools must engage the Ministry of Education for approval of graduation plans. Mr. Speaker, I will end the statement encouraging our young people to use good judgment when engaging in online learning. In a minority of instances, we have been receiving reports of poor behavior during online instruction. And I need to say that I will not tolerate disrespect for teachers and the other students. We have support systems in place for those who need counseling and other types of assistance, but we must have a high standard of conduct in our schools and society as a whole. I am therefore recommending harsh penalties for our most blatant offenders. I call on parents to engage with their children and support them in exhibiting appropriate behavior. Mr. Speaker, we are living in serious times, but I am proud of the way we have adjusted to this new regular. Yes, challenges abound, but we have demonstrated our resilience in responding to the 2017 floods, Orma and Maria. We are again demonstrating our resilience in response to COVID-19. And with God's help, we will continue to demonstrate our resilience as we navigate an uncertain future. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. I thank the Honorable Minister for Education and member for the seventh district for his statement. I now recognize the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration and member for the ninth district, the Honorable Vincent O. Whitley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the night is far spent, I'll just make one very short statement. No, National Parks Trust. Mr. Speaker, the National Parks Trust, in spite of COVID-19 and the closure of our national parks, continue to do its best to ensure protection of our environment and the maintenance of our parks continue. The National Parks Trust manages past the territorial system of moorings and in doing so, is responsible for monitoring and collecting mooring fees in the territory. Mr. Speaker, for persons who have been given approval for territorial moorings, their fees are due and payable to National Parks Trust of the Virgin Islands. Persons with outstanding bills are strongly encouraged to come into the trust to discuss a payment plan so that they can bring their accounts current. We want to let the public know that the trust has moved back to the Leona Harney building on the fourth floor in front of the Castro marking on Main Street, above the old location where it used to be. Mr. Speaker, we encourage all to make contact with the trust, visit their website, and take part in all activities which help us to learn more about our parks and the works of the trust. Please help us to ensure that we keep our environment safe and pristine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the 9th District and Minister for Natural Resources for his short statement. And I will also remind honorable ministers to make sure that hard copies are supplied to the House so we can have them for the record and also for the minutes. I call upon the clerk. Item number 7-2. Private members' business. Item number eight, other business. I call upon the Deputy Speaker and Territorial Member, the Honorable Neville A. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, I'm going to be very sharp. But I, I, I want to address something that's out there in the air. It's one thing I learned since I reached here now that you mustn't let something fester or else it will become reality. On one of the sittings that we had, I made a statement. I think it's the second. But I made a statement concerning um, there's no poor people in the BVI. Mr. Speaker, I think a lot of people knew what I meant. But I think what happened, which I'm not trying to blame, but I think what happened, the media posted a portion of what I said. So it came off in a negative way. Mr. Speaker, that statement came off a backdrop of winters. We were talking about $85 million being sent out to the Virgin Islands in a period of a year. And one of our members made a, made a statement by saying that we're um, going to kill the poor people. And I turned around and I said, be careful how you use that word. And also, how can a poor person send out money out of a country? Mr. Speaker, I want to acknowledge that, which I did at the same time. There's a lot of people here in the Virgin Islands that have difficulties, that have hard times, that sometimes paycheck to paycheck. But I still want to maintain that there's no poor people in the Virgin Islands. Because as a representative, as government, I don't think we should use that word calling all people poor. Because it's our job to make sure that this doesn't happen. And when we speak it, we speak it into existence. If we continue calling all people poor, it's basically like we're saying they're poor. So when I say what I say, it was basically saying that we should not call people poor. Not here, not in the BVI. This government have put, have put things in place and is still putting things in place to take care of our people. So I'm not going to stay here and call people poor. If some people, if I offend some people, or some people misunderstood what I said, I apologize for that. But I'm not going to call no one in the BVI poor people. There's a lot of people need help, need assistance, and we are doing that. And that's how we look at it. Mr. Speaker, I, have, I had a few conversations with a few people who met me and speaking to me about that same topic. And it's funny, because one young man I was speaking to, he started saying, he poor, I'm poor, I'm poor. And it came a conversation. And the funny thing about it is, when, before we finished, he said um, he just bought a, um, a BMW, and he had a little Jeep. So now he's broke. And I laugh, and I say, it's just, you, just, you just answered the same question you asked me, and you said. You're not poor, you're broke. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> it is funny. So I think some people get mixed up with, um, <laughs> we need to try to explain things like that. But the next thing, I mean, there's different ways of saying people poor. When you, when you go places like someplace in Africa, some places, you meet somebody who is poor. Before you, before you see the person, you can nearly smell them. You know what I mean? And then you see the flies coming behind them. They have a big belly, but I think it's food, it's gas, it's air. You know what I mean? So we have to be careful what we say saying and what we call on ourselves. And that's why I said what I said. You know, we, we have to look that a lot of times, when says we look at people, some of us, and I'm saying some of us, as I mean even myself, sometimes it depends on how we spend our money or how we control our money, and we end up in situations. But that does not mean that we are poor. You know, so I just wanted to correct that, that statement that I made in a way that people can understand exactly what I'm trying to say. 
And I hope I explain myself properly because, like I said, I'm not saying, I already acknowledge, and I did acknowledge that there's people in the Virgin Islands that need a lot of assistance. But as a government, we should not condone and calling our people poor or wishing it on our people. So I hope that the people of the Virgin Islands understand what I'm trying to say. Because I am one person. If anybody who know me, who knows me, and who truly knows me, I'm one about giving. I'm one about looking out for people. I'm one that believes that if I see a brother or sister need help, helping them. I am not going to put myself on a top and call no one down. That's not me. That's not me. I'm about people, and I came here to do a job, and I said already, I may say things that may not be popular, but I know something, uh, most of the things that I'm saying are going to be true. And we have to look out for each other. We cannot continue every time somebody says something, we turn it and twist it into something different. We have to work together as people. Every time somebody, a minister says something, somebody run back, they, they even need to wait to see whether or not I try to understand the situation. They have some comment negative to make. We have to be careful. Everybody's listening to everything that we say. It's out there. It's no media. The media puts something in paper. We have to be careful also. If we don't have the right information, ask a question. Like I said, I'm not blaming the media because they post a topic, they post a head. But if you go back and you listen to the whole conversation regarding that, that statement, you'll understand exactly where it was coming from. Mr. Speaker, we as Virgin Island people have to work together. I came to this house and I said it, and I'm going to say it again. At times, we will disagree to agree. But we have to work for one accord. That's in making the people of BVI better, and making the life of the people of Virgin Islands better. And that's what I came here to do. I didn't come here to get political gains, to get friends and mice. I came here to do a job. And that's my intention. Mr. Speaker, with that, I will not go any further. I just want to make sure to let the people of Virgin Islands know that I'm here to support you. I'm here to work for you. Thank you. I thank the Deputy Speaker and Territorial Member for his contribution. At this time, I recognize the member for the second district, the Honorable Melvin M. Turnbull. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I would first start by saying, um, I know the member, the at large member, Honorable Smith, um, was getting a lot of kickback um, for what he said, but I don't. As he said, I don't think that was his intention, um, and I hope he clarified it. But I, I know where his heart is, which is for the people of the territory, but he is true in saying sometimes what you say you know, gets misconstrued and lost in translation, and then you get labeled as, as a certain thing. So I'm glad that he took the time to address that uh, concern, because I think each of us here in this house, Mr. Speaker, be it on this side or the other side, I think what we have and should always have and maintain is that we keep the people of this territory first and at heart. Mr. Speaker, um, having learned a few things about being in this honorable house and knowing how to navigate some of the rules. Um, sometimes it, it's been a long time since members have been able to speak under other business without a time limit. And I know the hour is far spent. It is now 9.06. And the speaker has to give consent, which it seemingly has to continue. But we have had, I would say, one of the longer sessions in, in this honorable house, but I believe 
this session was necessary and everything that we were able to accomplish and achieve in this session, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, was indeed necessary. Um, and some of the bills that were passed. Mr. Speaker, today is the 8th of June, 2020. And on this day, on the 8th of June of 2015, was the first time where the people of the second district and the wider Virgin Islands put their faith and confidence in me to represent their concerns. And I shared the picture, Mr. Speaker, via Facebook um, of that moment. And, and I keep, and I will keep sharing it and keep it in front of me because it reminds me of my cousin, the honor member across from me, he asked me if I were balling. But I remember there being tears of joy because the people who helped to raise me and shape my life entrusted me for this ginormous task of leadership to re represent their needs and concerns. And I am eternally grateful to them. And then it was returned again. I was returned again to this honorable house on the 25th of February um, in 2019. Mr. Speaker, I want to take this opportunity also to recognize and acknowledge the hard work of the leaders of this territory um, specifically in the health arena um, during this pandemic, the persons that have gone and continue to work day in and day, day out with the uncertainties that has presented itself with this COVID-19, the people on the front line um, through HSA, the minister and his staff at the Health Services Authority and the Ministry of Health. I want to give acknowledgement to them for even in uncertainty, even not knowing what to do, even though we might not always agree on the procedures, I think, Mr. Speaker, they should all be commended for the work and the effort put in um, to limit the impact, so to speak, in terms of the health impact for a population of 30,000 as it relates to the persons affected um, and families affected by COVID-19 as we see that is evidence throughout the world. Mr. Speaker, we all have had a role to play and we all, to the best of, it, of our abilities, continue to try our best to play our roles and do it again for the best interest. And I am also, Mr. Speaker, grateful above all to the Almighty God for his sustaining hand and strength and power that continues to keep this Virgin Islands community under his covering and under his watch. It is no goodness of our own, Mr. Speaker. It is by his grace and by his mercy. Mr. Speaker, I been waiting to, to do this um, for a while because the first string of district meetings that I had, I was looking at my, my notes. And my first district meeting um, was recorded back in February 5th. I have the notes from the Bruce Bay meeting in 2020. And then I went to Spooners, and then I went to King Garden Bay, and I had one in Mayors, and I had one in Just Van Dyke as well. And there are some issues and concerns and questions that were raised by the people there. 
And Mr. Speaker, because I know other members want to speak, uh, I, I would just for a few seconds, Mr. Speaker, highlight some of the things that have come out of it. Mr. Speaker, on last Friday, I, I was late coming to, to this sitting. There were some issues on, on Joss Van Dyke um, with the constituents there. I received a number of complaints about policing and, and what they thought were unfair treatment by the officers, some of the officers from the police department, Royal Virgin Islands Police Force. Um, and I was able to, on Friday last week, um, travel with the Commissioner of Police, the Deputy Commissioner, um, Chief Inspector Vanterpool and um, Sergeant Aleem to Joss Van Dyke to, to have a community meeting and discuss some of the concerns and the issues there. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, it was indeed a fruitful meeting. It was a meeting that lasted about two and a half hours. Um, but at the end of that meeting, Mr. Speaker, we were able to come to a resolve that the relationship between the officers as well as the relationship with the constituents there on that island will be one that we will continue to work on to, to strengthen and continue to build uh, the island of Just Van Dyke and ensure that persons are safe and, and have that rapport and that respect for the law, most importantly. And the officers will continue to do their part to keep persons safe. Mr. Speaker, when I look at some of the areas, and we have another sitting, Mr. Speaker, uh, coming up shortly, I think on Thursday, Mr. Speaker. Um, the, the questions that are posed, and we have, I have posed a number of questions on behalf of the people of the second district um, from coming out of these meetings that I've had in the district, from Spooners to Lock Hill to Johnny Hill to all over the district to, to the relevant ministers um, to be accountable on, on, on their behalf. So I won't go through the details, Mr. Speaker, because I want to be respectful of, of other members, but I know we're still having an issue, Mr. Speaker, um, with, with, with water in certain areas. Uh, I know I called the minister for the subject um, often, and he, he, when he can, he assists and when he isn't able to assist, I try my best to, to help the people, Mr. Speaker, but I know there's something ongoing that we must address. The main, one of the main issues that I have and one of the main concerns is the community centers, which I, again, will bring up on Thursday with the Minister of Health because our seniors, um, I think he has a love for seniors, but I don't know if his love is stronger than mine. Um, I met Honorable, um, the now Honorable Premier loving his cream of the crops down in the first district, and I have my Golden Eagles in the second. Um, but the seniors are still longing, Mr. Speaker, for that opportunity, that place that they can come together and, and meet and, and fellowship um, and, and one of the places that they would normally do that is in the community centers. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Education and Culture just mentioned um, the laptops that the stimulus package is providing for our students. And I, he mentioned the honorable members, um, I and, and through, through the Office of the House of Assembly, um, have been able to purchase a number of laptops and, and uh, tablets for the students in, in, in my district um, just to help them. But there are some concerns, Mr. Speaker, uh, coming to the end of the school year um, as to how the students, as the minister just said in his statement, the students that were 
having some difficulty even while in the classroom, um, how those students will be able to transition and be able to now, even without um, the, the laptops and be able to, to finance the internet packages, et cetera, how they are going to deal with the transitioning of their educational development um, going into the new school year. Uh, Mr. Speaker, one of my pet peeves um, is, is just from Dyke Primary School, uh, which I have said to the minister that it is important that while we have a donor and donors for, for that particular school that we look at and that we carry out the wishes of the people of that community of which I have represented now for the last five uh, and almost of five and a half years that they are looking for a school that they have made a decision on and I reiterated it to the minister again earlier today um, the location that was set for the community center will be the ideal, situ the ideal location for that school uh, based on a lot of surrounding issues uh, with flooding where the current school is located. Mr. Speaker, in, in Bruce Bay, we are still looking and anticipating for the development of the restrooms uh, the Minister of Natural Resources and Labor would bear me out that that funding or budget, I must say budgeted, um, before his time in the office, I think since 2016, um, that budget for, it has been on the budget books since 2016, but uh, unable to be uh, materialized. Um, it was in, even before the member for the eighth bathroom came up in East End, but the member for the eight, um, it looked like it had an East thing, and they leave the one from the by from the West uh, 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 there. But uh, you know, I am hoping for, especially for the continued development of, of our tourism product, that the restroom facility um, can be built and finished um, for the residents and the tourists that we would soon welcome back, hopefully to our shores uh, for the enjoyment, but not just for the residents, for the persons that now visit and have been visiting uh, Bruce Bay for, for the longest while. Mr. Speaker, the Minister for Transportation and, and Utilities, um, he has a, a hard task, but I know he is he's the slimmest of us in this honorable house. But the Jamaicans say he little but he talawa. Um, he will be now responsible for ensuring that um, that, that long-awaited and long-needed sewage project in King Gardeme, while we are close to tourism, um, should get on the way. I understand the Honorable Premier is, is finalizing documentation to, to get that. I think it's in the Premier's hands because that sewage project in King Gardeme needs to happen. I, I must commend, um, I, I don't remember his name, no, his first name, but Mr. Forbes of the Water and Sewage Department. Mega is his nickname. Um, that young man, Mr. Speaker, is, is working to pump the, the stations in King Arabe almost three times a day, especially since we've been on lockdown. But I think it is high time that we, that, that that project should have been completed by January of 2018 or December of 2018. It has not yet um, completed. It's not been as long as the honorable member for the eight, but this one here, I want to fight and make sure I get ahead of you first. <laughs> because the importance of King Garden, the, the, the community of King Garden, what King Garden means um, for, for tourism. Um, and what it, what it has been established as for, for this country and this territory. Mr. Speaker, I, I want to highlight that the Diamond Basketball Court, the Minister of Education, um, has been working. The Premier, um, up until the ending of last year, had pledged uh, some additional funds to get that 
um, basketball court finish, so hopefully we could get working on. And Mr. Speaker, the, the things that I'm speaking on are not in absence of the clear understanding of where we are with COVID-19 and the fact that we will have to um, reshuffle and refocus um, our agenda in terms of where the government goes. But I must, Mr. Speaker, uh, lament on some of the things that the community for which I'm responsible for within the second district have been pushing for. Mr. Speaker, I know that when I asked the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities, as well as the general manager of the BBI Electricity about street lights and for, for the communities. There's still some areas, especially in my district, that are dark and, and people are uh, uh, beckoning for, for street lights. I don't know where that program is. I know the initial thought was that they were going to l light the main areas and, and then start on the feed the rules, but depending on where you go, and I, I always say the, the fifth and the second are connected in more ways than one. The first and the second are connected in more ways than one. The ninth district um, is connected from our competition in tourism, but there's certain areas, Mr. Speaker, if you go to certain districts, I'm not calling, I'm not pointing, I'm just saying certain areas that you see feed the roads um, have light in, in certain communities. So I'm hoping that, you know, we could get some light. We need light. Um, and I know the Honorable Premier is going to work with the people of the second district because he always says you can't get to two without one. So I need one. I need the light so to get to the people of the second district. But Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Education um, touched on the, the number of persons that have lost their lives and, and have passed away during this time, not necessarily, not due to um, the disease or having the disease of COVID-19, but they have passed away because the Lord has seen it fit to call them home. And I want to extend condolences to each and every family member the recent, most recent, which is the past premier, premier's wife, um, Reverend Idris O'Neill. I want to extend condolences to, to their family as well. And all families that have been grieving and are grieving, the Minister for Natural Resources and Labor, I know that is two of his in-laws um, in a very short time. And I just want to, on behalf of my family, continue to extend condolences to, to his family and the rest of the Iberi families within the territory. Mr. Speaker, I will conclude on this note. Throughout this COVID-19, this is about three months that we have been, three and a half months there about, we have been going through and experiencing COVID-19. And I want to highlight and, and, and salute a number of persons that have taken advantage and made this quote-unquote uncertainty and dismal seeming time one of inspiration and one that brings and has brought about hope to this territory. Mr. Speaker, I want to start first by recognizing my cousin and, and I call him the musical genius, uh, Mr. Brent Hoyt, who has taken church and the spread of gospel music to a completely different level in this territory who's brought about hope um, to many persons who wouldn't traditionally go to church um, through his ministry and now today he's launched a, in an album called um, Air Food. I want to recognize him, uh, Mr. Dirk Walters, Mr. Speaker, who has now since the, I think it's the very first day of lockdown, 
He's been doing motivational talks and inspirational talks every morning, just trying to keep people um, uplifted and encouraged. And then you look at the business community, Mr. Speaker, the young people uh, within the business communities. You have the, the creative arts, uh, Cletus Mactavius and, and, and his family and his business that has been pushing um, and grinding hard. You have KJ Headley and Nova Vita who have been doing their part, Mr. Speaker, and a, a host of number of other businesses, um, are fishermen and farmers, and I, I'm going to big up those in my second district community. So all the people that I've called, Mr. Speaker, uh, within the second district community um, who have done tremendous work, Javon Klein um, and that group that did that, that song with the unity for the BVI, um, another one of my cousins who are tremendously talented and gifted, and the fishermen, Mr. Speaker, who have held it down for us to remind us of the importance of why we are surrounded by water and why we are, why we are gifted with these beautiful, this beautiful ocean and, and territory um, who have been bringing fish and, and bringing back the tradition. When you drive through Caribbean, Mr. Speaker, when you see those boys come in and they have fish um, selling, you go through King Ghana, you go through the east, through Bruce Bay, and even in Just Van Dyke, you see them coming in, Mr. Speaker. I haven't been to Virgin Garden and Anigata, but I know um, up there the fishermen have been doing their part. And then you look at the farmers, people like Aaron Hill, and, and, and he's been doing his farming. You have um, Mr. and Mrs. Gabriel, Shani and, I call it Shani and Sugar, down in my district, Wrong, Wrong Mill Farms, who have been doing a tremendous job as well, Mr. Speaker. And then there's the innovation of everybody have, has now become a cook and a chef and found creative ways to start to market their business and market ideas, Mr. Speaker. I want to commend the business community. I want to commend the religious organization and the churches throughout this territory for continuing to instill hope um, in us, Mr. Speaker. And I want to commend the, the minister of transportation, works, and utilities for helping to ensure that the people of this territory receive water, um, even, even when the systems were down. And I know he's continued to work on, on that water system that passed through Diamond and goes up to Chalwell that feeds King Garden Bay and Bruce Bay. Um, now they are on a schedule, but we, we have to continue to build the infrastructure. And Mr. Speaker, I know that those of us that sit on the opposition will do our part to ensure that we push for the things that, that need to be done. But we all have our role to play. And Mr. Speaker, I just want to take this time to commend you and your staff for for the work that you have continued to do um, in these uncertain and trying times. We have been here now in the Save the Seed Center for some time. I, I know it is uncertain, but I will end, 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 end on this note. The Premier has announced $300,000 to each member of the House of Assembly. And Mr. Speaker, I must say, I listened with intent when he called out that figure. And then the Premier said he wants us to contact each member. He said, contact the first district representative, but he said he's going to give you a number. Don't call him. He said he's going to give you a number to call. And then he came down to the second and he said, call me. And Mr. Speaker, I must tell you, by the time he got to the fifth district. The WhatsApp them come in. They started to come in. And because it was, I think it was after 10 o'clock, Mr. Speaker. Only because some of the people have a little respect for me. They may call me. But I tell you something, 4.30 the next morning, they start to call. So, Mr. Speaker, I know that we have been asking the Honorable Premier, um, 
just for guidance. And I want the, I want the public to know um, that we have asked, we have asked and, and the Premier has assured us that on this coming Thursday, that we will have a meeting to, to discuss the criteria and how, how that money will work and, and how it will be distributed for, for the general public. Um, as well as the, the stimulus for fishing and farming, um, electricity, the housing, social security. Um, I want the, the persons within the second district community to know that it is not for no other reason than working out the details of how um, these items and these stimuluses will work for each and every individual uh, within the territory, but once we get the details and once we finalize how the plans will work, then we will be doing our part. I will be doing my part to ensure that each person, as many persons as possible, can be reached um, to help them in this this trying time. And Mr. Speaker, I would only challenge the Premier, and, and he would put it back on us. So I will accept the challenge anyway while challenging him that we ensure that the process is as effective and as seamless as possible because while we have, people have gone through three and four months of being unemployed and dealing with these situations, we can't afford to have them wait another three and four months to be able to get, get the relief that, that is so adequately needed. Mr. Speaker, um, I will do my part to continue to continue to serve the people of the second district and this territory to the best of my ability. I will continue to try every day that I get up to live and become a higher, better version of myself. So Mr. Speaker, I thank you for this time and I thank the Honorable House for allowing me to make these brief comments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the second district for his contributions. I recognize the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration, and member for the ninth district, the Honorable Vincent O. Whitley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will be rather brief, as other members have other things they want to say. But before I begin my remarks, I just want to say a word of condolences to the families who have lost loved ones, loved ones since we last met, particularly the Rhymer family and Virgin Northern Virgin Order. We go way back. I think my great grandfather was a Rhymer, so we are related somewhere along the line. And also the, the Hales the Wood family in the valley. They lost Miss Edith some weekend ago. So sincere condolences to these families. In the 9th District, we have a little dilemma going on there where crime has kind of, is trending up a little bit. You know, we are under a lot of pressure these days and some persons that are coping very well. We had an online crime meeting just last night. I thought it went very well. A few things are going to come out of it that are going to be in place in very short order. Mr. Speaker, the idea of food security is in everybody's mind, and I'm so pleased to see what is happening in the 9th District towards food production in terms of persons planting stuff from Enigada, North Song, the Valley, and interest in agriculture and planting is very, very high. And I've been working with the Minister of Agriculture to make sure that we get things in place to Get us, make us happen while persons are still interested. And we are going to make it happen. I did my first well cleaning. It's all clean now. We're getting a pump soon to make water available to persons who want to do farming. The speaker, I'm also very pleased to see the amount of construction work going on in the 9th district, particularly on our public facilities. These were destroyed during the 2017 hurricanes. So we have the Gala Flags third wing being, third phase being done, the Flax building being done, basketball court 
being done and the North Song has been building being done and that is very very good very good to see that the speaker on Friday was World Environment Day I just sent a message out because we I guess COVID has shown us that the environment is very durable and very resilient and have been shut down for so long it was amazing to see how much the environment had bounced back things we hadn't seen in the waters for a very long time were very much alive today is, is world's ocean day and again i did a message today we, we celebrate our ocean because we understand the bvi is, is mainly ocean and we have to get on with the blue economy which is a sustainable use of our oceans so there are wonderful things happening there we are having some cases of coral disease, but that will be addressed very, very shortly. Mr. Speaker, with all the stimulus packages going on, just like Hurricane Irma, because COVID-19 has revealed some, some inefficiencies in the system. And I want to speak briefly about what, what I've seen so far, Mr. Speaker, because I think it speaks of a, a bigger ill in our society. We passed the Consumer Protection Bill earlier, and I spoke a bit about it. But part of the stimulus package, one of the criteria was that persons should be, have been up to date with their contributions to Social Security, NHI, and inland revenue. And what we found, Mr. Speaker, is a lot of persons are not up to date, which means that they are disqualified from getting certain things. And we cannot ignore that reality. I do not believe that persons are not paying these things or businesses because they don't want to. The reality of what's happening in the BVA is that we need to do more for businesses to make sure they remain viable and that they can pay the overheads. So this Mr. Speaker, we have to address one way or the other. Mr. Speaker, there's another troubling thing that I, I see happening that really, really bothers me and it makes me wonder what, what kind of country we, we have inherited here, what kind of country we are living in right now. And you know, I get a lot of complaints from employers, I get complaints from employees. But I would like to get both sides of a story before I even say anything or even act. So I got some complaints a few days ago from some employees. So I decided, you know, because I did say at one point in time, one of the things I want my department to do is to do spot checks on businesses, unannounced visits. Just want to see what's going on in your business. I just show. So I decided to give it a little dry run. So I had some complaints, so I decided to go to this, this property, unannounced, so, so to speak. And Mr. Speaker, when I, when, I, when I got there, I was appalled. It made me wonder what century I was in, which country I was in, the way the, the whole situation was. And I called the manager, didn't answer the phone, I WhatsApp the manager, didn't return the WhatsApp. I got there, it was like going onto, on, onto a plantation, the gates were locked. I met employees outside, so I asked them, what are you doing? Well, we had to collect some document and the security is there. He's giving them documents. Through the, they can't even go inside. Can't even go in, on, onto the property. So I said, you know, well, I'm here, I'm, I'm the Minister for Labor and Immigration. And I had the <clears throat> Commissioner of Labor with me and her team. So it was probably like five of us. I said, I'm just here to visit the property and see what's going on. Eventually, security guard, but I told the security guard, I'm not going to stand up outside of, of any fence, like I'm you know, going to a zoo or something. I'm going to go onto the property. I went onto the property, and I tell him, let the manager know I'm here. And I guess he went and he told the manager I was there. And I waited a little bit. And I realized the manager had no intention of entertaining me. And I said, but I said, Commissioner told me, well, no, 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 let's, let's go up and let's knock on the door. I said, no, I am, this is the minister of government in your place of business in the BVI. I'm not, I'm not sure be begging you to see you. So I told the commissioner, no, 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 this, this can't happen. So I, so I left the property. I left the property. The gentleman later on sent an email. I wouldn't read the email. Eventually, my secretary printed it up and totally, Mr. Speaker, discounted the fact that I was there. I said, but this is something else. The level of disrespect, I mean, I don't understand why some people think 
about in this country. We work together with investors and employees and whoever. But you cannot be in here as an investor and think you can do what you want because we need you and we're not going to survive without your presence. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't think that's, that's a good attitude to have doing business in this country. And this kind of disrespect, you no, know, it's not going to end there. I can assure you that. But the level of disrespect that an investor will show a minister of government, I, I think, no, 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 Mr. Speaker. I, I, this, I find that totally, totally unacceptable. And I will be dealing with this matter because you're still in this country and you intend to do business in this country. And I think if you're going to be in this country and doing business in this country, at least respect, I mean, if you go and disrespect me as a minister of God, an elected representative, I could imagine the poor employees. I could only imagine. And I was so glad I went to that business and see for myself. Because you hear stories all the time. You know, people tend to exaggerate and so forth. And I said to myself, well, if I'm going to go through this as a minister, but imagine them poor employees, what they're going through. Mr. Speaker, this is not right. This is not right. Yes, I was unannounced. Well, you know I was there. I, mean, I went to two businesses. I went to another business, unannounced. The manager wasn't there. They told the manager I was there. He came out of breath. Wherever he was, he drove it, he came there. He heard the minister of labor was here to, just to visit the place and see what was going on. He showed up. I waited maybe five minutes because he was not even on property. The gentleman came. We sat down. He explained to me how he's coping with COVID-19 all his plans for his employees, who he had to cut back, who he had to shift, how many days a week they're working, what he plans to do over the next couple of months, and on and on he went for all the things he wants to do. He said, do you want to talk to my staff? I said, I don't mind talking to your staff. Took me around to every single staff, staff member. That's what you call respect. That is true partnership. Yes, I was unannounced. I respect that I was unannounced. But I'm still an elected member and a minister of government. And that should come for something, Mr. Speaker. That the blatant disrespect of some people in this 21st century in the British world. I would have never dreamed this could happen in my, in my BVI. I see, I, you hear stories about former members in this house talk about these kind of situations too. But I never thought I would have experienced this. This is an eye opener for me, Mr. Speaker. I have to go and really rethink how we go about doing business in this country. We have a country to build. We are all going through a very difficult time now. I'm from the 9th district. I represent the 9th district and the Garden of Rajanada. It's tourism. The restaurants are closed. The hotels are closed. It's a difficult, challenging time. We don't see anybody going on and disrespecting people like that. Okay, we have some break-ins. People don't break in because they simply want to break in. They're in need. And we try our best to reach out to these persons. I tell them I have my little slogan, reach out before you break in. Let's have a dialogue. But to be disrespecting elected officials? Even the chief, the commissioner of labor was shocked. The machine had never seen this kind of behavior either. And as a matter of fact, the, the labor violations that this person is currently doing, Mr. Speaker, I don't know what they even say. And that was last Thursday. So it's almost a week later, I'm still as upset as I was then to experience that. So we have some really, really good employers in this country who mean well by their staff. I've spoken to some of them, they explained to me what they're going through and how they're helping their staff, they're offering them zero interest loans, they're giving them shopping vouchers, they're giving them this voucher. But then they got the next set, they use this COVID to abuse their workers. And sometimes they, they are choosing the, the, belongers, the, the belongers first to abuse. I remember years ago when you see a job advertised in newspaper, you see Viva Lenders and Belongers first or preferred. But not a turn this are wrong when it comes to abuse of people, it's Viva Lenders and Belongers first. So, Mr. Speaker, I really you don't know what's going on here. 
in our little BVI, a country our forefathers fought so hard to build to what it is, struggle when there was nothing here, pull up with the bootstraps, left here, and we survived that to come. Hurricane Irma 2017, knock us down. People thought we were all dead. Then I realized we weren't dead. You see, you couldn't build back. Then we build back, or we're building back. And coming up nicely, then up comes COVID. And of course, during that time too, some little funny things went on. Well, there wasn't a government, but you hear stories, but they didn't get certain things done. Now comes COVID, like they would have vengeance, Mr. Speaker. They come with a vengeance. Many of the things you hear about and you see on TV, these ain't things that I expect in my BVI. And Mr. Speaker, this, this cannot continue so. We see what's happening now in, all over the world. It doesn't have to happen here. All we have to do is just do right by the people of the BVI. But if we continue to have our people sitting around at home and others are working, it is going to come to that, Mr. Speaker. We don't need that to happen. Just do the right thing. It is very clear what our policies are. We are all elected in here, elected representatives. We have a responsibility to our constituents, a responsibility to this country, Mr. Speaker. I don't know what's going through people's mind. I know we are all under COVID, we are all under pressure, but this is kind of irrational, crazy thinking. To think that now is the time to do something like this. It is, it is simply amazing. But Mr. Speaker, I will be dealing with this. Because I know where we come from. I come from Miserable, not song. I know what the way was like. Sardine and soda crackers ain't no trouble to me. In Vienna, Sasha, them things no trouble to me. So if them think that without their presence here, we're going to go hungry and die. Therefore, we're going to just take whatever they dish out, whatever abuse they want to dish out here, that we will take, we'll know. That um, is the wrong set you're dealing with, to say the least. Because I am not prepared in the least to tolerate an abusive situation in this country under a pandemic. Under a pandemic. It was bad enough after the hurricane, but the hurricane has come and gone on that day. Some little things went on here, but you're going to choose COVID? You're going to choose COVID, Mr. Speaker, to come to do some, this kind of wickedness I hear going on over there to our people? This cannot be right, Mr. Speaker. I thought of something else. I would have never thought I would see what I see here in my country. An elected representative visits a place, not even decent seat to say, well, good man, on a conference call, can you come back another time, or whatever you are doing. You might just show up to your place of business, and in the court, you just say good morning. But you want to continue doing business in this country, like nothing happened. Like it's okay. This is this is the new regular for you. Just do what you want, abuse who you want, send who you want, keep who you want, and we must just turn up, just turn up blind eye because it's COVID-19. So anything goes. Well, I think we are a country of laws, and we have to make sure we keep it a country of laws. That we don't have to be a lot of country like what we see happening around around the world. We are all under pressure. We feel we feel pressure like everybody else. Person out walking. They come into us, the elected representatives. Yes, you heard about the three hundred thousand dollars there. I would have had a million phone calls about this money. A million phone calls. Well, because people are behind in NHI, Social Security, house rent, mortgages. Everybody's behind. Can barely have food to eat. The pressure is on. COVID ain't on a schedule to say, well, in two months' time, it's all over, we'll be back to normal. We don't know how long we're going to be in COVID here. And if you're going to do this now, when we're only two and a half months in, what happens if we're here five months in? It will start killing people. Mr. Speaker, no, 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 we can't do that. We have to get a handle on how people are. We have a labor code that, that, that clearly states how people should be treated, treated in this country. Very, very clear. And if you have questions, the commission is very competent to explain what is right and what is wrong, and what's acceptable and not. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to again appeal to businesses. I said it before, if you're going to change anybody's status, 
the decent thing to do is to have a meeting with the, the, the staff. Say, look, there's a situation here. I have to lay off some persons. And we expect you to not lay off belongings and, and, and villainous first. We expect you to lay them off last. Last, not first. And find all kind of excuses. All kind of excuses. But Mr. Speaker, sorry to be so, so dampened on, in this day, but I just find it totally disrespectful what I've seen and unacceptable. So that, Mr. Speaker, I will now take my seat. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Labor and member for the 9th District for his contributions. Honorable members, the Hanson officer wants a break, so we're going to recess for five minutes and return. This house is now in recess.
Please be seated. This House is back in session. Honorable members, the numbers look a little tight, so I'm sure it will encourage members to perhaps cut their speeches in half. However, this is not a time limit that I'm imposing. Speak as long as you want. I recognize, I haven't seen any indication of anyone wishing to speak. I recognize the Deputy Premier and Minister for Health and Social Development and Territorial Member, the Honorable Carvin Malone. As, as tradition will have it, Mr. Speaker, I'll be very short. I, um, I too would like to extend condolences to uh, a number of citizens who have passed. This is, these are trying times, and um, we indeed will have the um, viewing. Public is invited on Friday from 10 to 4, Reverend Idris O'Neill, and the invitation is sent to the public to pay the respects because of the social distancing and the crowd limitations. There are going to be two areas on Saturday, and I think they have um, protocols for which will be observed during this time. But we had a number of families, so I associate myself with the member seven and member uh, from the ninth and other members who have extend condolences, and I extend this, Mr. Speaker. But in the past three months, there have been a number of statements, and of course, uh, since I'm here, we haven't been able to speak at length under the um, any other business section, and it would not be at length tonight either. Only to say, because um, I made a, I made a pledge to have a school-based um, recycling program competition and uh, have a number of parents who have called because their, their students or their boys or girls have been saving up a lot of recyclable products waiting for the competition to the competition bell to ring. So I'd like to assure the parents that it is indeed going to happen. We found out and through the association with the Ministry of Education, we have over 330 classes from pre-K straight through to secondary schools. And we have done a pricing of these um, electronic items, computers mainly, but to fit the appropriate grade. So members will be encouraged because th when we started the house to house, and I would make a complete statement on Thursday as it relates to the house to house uh, collection and recycle program because we are committed to make sure that we endorse the seven R's in the recycle program, in the whole collection program. And uh, the house to house is the best way in which we can get separation at its source, number one. Number two, to reduce the number of items going into the incinerator and the landfill. Um, the incinerator went down sometime last week, and it was the first in a long time that we had an excess amount of uh, smoke in the West. It did not dissipate in the Virgin Guarda area and in other areas. So we're going to work steadily now that you know we, we have a cleaner approach to the other items we have to do. But, but for the past three months, we've been extremely busy. So my little remark tonight is just to 
let the schools and the students who have been saving up so many recyclable items for the past um, weeks to know that by Thursday we would have more extensive information on this. Uh, so save your recyclables. It is going to be a full program and the Virgin Islands will be an example of what recycling community base, all involved base. And we're going to encourage companies, members of the House of Assembly, corporations, nonprofit organizations to stay tuned and be a part of this entire recycle program. And if you're going to change a community, it has to start with the generation now so that the environment of which the Minister of the Environment speaks of would be preserved by going into it today. And the Education Department is fully on board with this. Education Ministry is fully on board with this. Ministry of um, Natural Resources fully on board with this. And um, of course, Ministry of Finance, they're anxious to have this done. They have committed a lot of money to get the house to house because they embrace the whole comprehensive approach that we would make. So Mr. Speaker, as tradition will have it, I'm very brief. Thank you very much. I thank the Deputy Premier and Territorial Member for his brief contribution. I recognize the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities, and member for the 5th District, the Honorable Kai M. Reimer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as the night is about fast spent, I too want to um, acknowledge the residents of my 5th District for their support in getting me here to this honorable house. Mr. Speaker, I will be brief indeed, but I need to, I know it's a bit late, but I usually, when the house is done, I get phone calls from uh, my elderly gems in regard to what took place in the house. So I just want to acknowledge them this evening, all those that take the time out to listen, all those that take, take the time out to encourage me as they, they understand this is a, a tough path at times. But I just want them to know the residents of the district, young and old, that I appreciate them. I appreciate their support, their encouragement. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I know that they're there supporting me. Mr. Speaker, as we go through this COVID situation, I too want to recognize the work done by this government, especially the Ministry of, of Health, the, the minister and his entire team, the EP, what award is it? EP, epidemiologist, of epidemiologist, the PS in the ministry, the entire HEOC team for keeping us safe, the premier for, for being proactive, making the funds available for making sure that we are all we were all fed during that time and mr speaker as we are we have opened our borders to our residents i want to welcome them home those in the district those um, throughout the territory and mr speaker those that are here on quarantine i encourage them to follow the protocols uh, we hear a lot of things we've you know the Premier dismissed some of the claims where we've heard about some being on the street so far. But Mr. Speaker, I know we have security guards in place and I, I hope that those persons that are quarantined stay quarantined because uh, safety for themselves and our people is, is, should be priority. Mr. Speaker, during this quarantine and this COVID situation, 
the Premier blessed us with $300,000 for a representative. And I know it was spoken of earlier. And Mr. Speaker, just like the member from the second spoke about when his name was called, he received messages. I think that is something that each and every member in this house went through and, and still is. And Mr. Speaker, I was able to uh, create an, a, an application form uh, without knowing the criteria. And Mr. Speaker, I can say that I have nearly 150 applicants so far. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I too am um, waiting to hear the criteria so that we can start to help uh, the residents of this territory. So, Speaker, I know some of the, the requests, they are a bit um, high based on what I've been seeing. And, Mr. Speaker, you know, I want those applicants to know that as big as 300,000 songs, if you give 300 person $1,000, the money is, is done. So I want person to understand that it's not each and every one of us would get exactly what we are requesting but the intent is to help as many persons as possible. And I also ask persons to be mindful that other persons need assistance as well. Yes, we have provided other means to assist, but uh, the district, the district um, allowance, know that you know, m many persons in the, the district would be needing assistance also. And Mr. Speaker, I, I want to you know, facilitate as many persons as possible. So within my district, I will be opening the, my resource center from Monday through Friday uh, to have, I'll have persons there serving those residents that will be coming to uh, fill, fill out forms for the assistance. I'll also have someone at the Long Trench Community Center as well so that persons can, you know, elderly persons within the district, they can come and have their form fill out there. So as soon as we understand the criteria, and I understand the Premier would announce that on, on Thursday, we would hopefully start the office hours from on Monday. That's Monday next week. Just as we would have the, the, the traffic um, go live and, and turn around, where we'll be transforming the, the traffic in rural town. So, Mr. Speaker, you know, I just want the residents to know that I am making um, the facilities available. I'll, I'll have the resources available so that we can assist you uh, with getting this assistance um, that was given to us by the Premier. So, with those few words, you know, I just want to say again, thanks to my honorable colleagues for their continued support, the honorable Speaker. And, and his team, Madam Clerk, Deputy Clerk, um, my good friend, taking minutes. And, you know, I just want to say that th this journey continues, and um, I look forward to continuing to serve the people of this territory. And, uh, again, I say thank you to the people of the 5th District for your continued support. Thank you. I thank the Minister and the member for the 5th District. I recognize the Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture, and member for the 7th District, Dr. The Honorable Natalio D. Wheatley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity uh, to speak under any other business. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do, Mr. Speaker, is to acknowledge the people of the 7th District who have allowed me the opportunity to be here in this honorable house uh, so that I can make my contributions and help to advance uh, this territory. Um, I'll be, I know the, the night is fast spent, Mr. Speaker, so I will be efficient <laughs> with my words. <laughs> I, I um, want to give condolences to um, persons in the, in the East. I can't just speak about the 7th District, 7th and 8th District, as well as the entire territory. Um, but of course, uh, my community has been, been having a tough time. Um, lots of young persons pass away way before 
um, the, the time that they should pass. And we've had quite a number of persons lose loved ones in the district. And I just want to let those individuals who've lost persons know uh, that they're in my thoughts and my prayers. And we have to pull together in these difficult times and be our brother and our sister's keeper and um, extend a listening ear and a shoulder to cry on sometimes in these times. I also want to acknowledge, as my honorable colleague, uh, Minister of Health and Social Development said, we haven't really gotten a chance to speak on any other business really for this, um, since this pandemic set in. And I wanted to take the opportunity to really acknowledge persons in the district who played such a vital role during the lockdown period uh, when we were delivering food packages to persons. And it was a really a vulnerable time uh, for persons in the district who needed to get food. And we had um, persons in the district like Ali Chalwell and Clyde and Daki Letsom and Bouncer. And we had Brandywine Bay Restaurant. We had um, a roti man. And we had um, quite a number of persons in the district who came together during the 24-hour um, call few uh, to help deliver bags to the district. And we ran the numbers, Mr. Speaker. We, we have a little response team, seven district response team that we put together. And we ran the numbers, and we delivered well over 400 bags of food. And that's not the total. It, it might be much more than that because um, we weren't properly recording um, the first set that we gave out, meaning we didn't put seven district response team um, to the bags that we distributed. But the team came together, worked extremely hard to make sure that we fed as many people as possible within a very short time period. And I want to publicly acknowledge those persons. And I know it's a very tough time in the districts right now. Uh, you have lots of persons who are unemployed. Persons who are unemployed before COVID-19. You know, persons who have been struggling for some time. And COVID-19 has simply exacerbated it. And I want to assure those persons that the government, as well as all of the representatives, are working hard on plans to help to make things easier. Uh, nobody is just sitting down twiddling their thumbs at a time like this. We are working hard, 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 coming up with different investments uh, that can help persons, uh, certainly initiatives, stimulus, uh, different things to help the people's life get easier. And we need the participation of everybody, I would have to say, Mr. Speaker. If we want to get through this period of time, which I've identified as the most difficult period in our history outside of, since in the last 70 years, I would say, if you look at the the storms and the flood in 2017. And then you look at this COVID-19 situation following closely after. I mean, all over the world has been impacted. Nobody has been immune to it. This is one of the most difficult times in the history of our territory. And if we want to get through it, we have to get through it together. We can't start pointing fingers. We can't start playing the blame game. We can't resort to crime. Um, 
member for the ninth district spoke about uh, some of the things happening in Virgin God, and we know these things can happen all throughout the territory, and we have little sporadic um, instances of, of crime. Uh, we, we, can't, we can't allow crime and disharmony to take hold in this community. We have to have a spirit of love and togetherness. You know, that's what's going to take us through. We have to rediscover that unity that took us through those difficult times in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and, and those times. You know, that's when, the, when they say a village raised a child and we used to batter with each other and so on and so forth. We have to rediscover that spirit, Mr. Speaker. Both whether you're belonger, non-belonger, whether you're old, whether you're young, uh, regardless of the district you have come from. We have to rediscover that spirit of love, togetherness, and not allow dissension and hatred and all these other things to take hold in our community. Mr. Speaker, I want to let the district know I have quite a number of programs that I'm proposing. And I'm certainly interested to, to, to um, hear more guidance on on the allocation that we are given because, you know, I think it's an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, um, not simply just to, to give persons um, cash, but, but put people to work in our districts. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in our districts and a lot of able bodies, a lot of able bodies ready to be able to get this work done. And if I'm allowed to, I would like to use that money to, to fund some of these programs, that to get some of these struggling persons to work. Um, but persons will learn more about that once the guidance comes out. Mr. Speaker, we have in the world today a global movement against racism. Uh, I have not been able to pay attention to the media as much as I used to. We, we get so busy. I don't get to watch television much or pay as much attention to the international media. But it has not escaped my notice that all over the world, not just in the United States of America, but in, in far-reaching countries that you actually surprise persons are having um, demonstrations and protests as a result of what has happened in the United States of America with the murder of George Floyd. And several other persons, Mr. Speaker. And I want to associate myself with the expressions of disapproval and discontent being expressed all over the world at police uh, brutality uh, that has existed in the United States of America and other places for, for, for a very long time. Some persons might ask, Mr. Speaker, well, you know, we don't have those type of problems here in the Caribbean. Uh, we don't have these type of problems here in the BVI. And I'd have to remind persons that if you go back in our history, our people were subjected to the most brutal and inhumane institution that the world has ever seen of slavery and colonialism. Um, if persons would, would know the story of Prosper and um, Arthur Hajj, who used to um, murder enslaved individuals, our people, in some of the most inhumane ways, and most brutal ways. So we know that that type of thing has existed here. And I'm grateful to my ancestors who struggled and who fought and who had rebellions and who they, they ready the they bondong rotong, you know, and, 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 and when a, a governor or somebody like that um, annoyed them too much, um, 
they send them running to St. Thomas on a boat. And I, I, remind, I remind people, uh, when, when the gov uh, governor ran away from here, back in those times, there was some long look people. Is who, who caused it to happen. So just, maybe people get to understand me a little better after they understand that uh, Christopher Fleming, uh, Christopher Clem Fleming and, and the rest of them bad man from Long Look, they get to understand me a little better. <coughs> yeah, but we, we were struggling against this kind of oppression for a long time, and, and we might take it for granted that we live in a place where our people are in control of what's happening. You know, we have a premier, you know, we have ministers of government and representatives and, and, you know, despite the fact that we are still a territory of the United Kingdom, you know, we pretty much run the show. And, of course, the governor has his special, special responsibilities and, you know, he's over security and the, and the police and all of that. And the Premier spoke about constitutional review. And persons should not be afraid, Mr. Speaker, to continue our match. That match that started even before 70 years ago, but from the standpoint of our legislature, continue that match from 70 years ago towards greater autonomy, greater control of our own affairs. And there'll be one day, Mr. Speaker, when we'll be in control of the police force, and we'll be in control of uh, you know, the civil service, and we'll be control of all of these things. And now is the time for us to demonstrate to our people how responsible we can be. And this is what we've been doing for the past 70 years. We've been demonstrating how responsible we can be. And we are where we are, by and large, because of the actions of our people and our friends who have come to join us from, from elsewhere. So, Mr. Speaker, um, we have this racism taking place in America. And persons might ask, what does it have to do with you here? We have several individuals who leave from here, students, lots of students, and go live in the United States of America, live in the United Kingdom. Some persons may not know, Mr. Speaker, uh, when you look at me, you, you wouldn't figure it out. But I went to the United States of America, and I got in a lot of trouble with the police. A lot, a lot of trouble. I, um, I remember one time I spent a night in jail um, because um, a police officer, a black police officer actually, uh, was in Atlanta, Georgia, and at the end of the month, they have a quota to fulfill, and they just start to give out tickets like crazy. So I wouldn't tell you what I told the officer, because I wouldn't be becoming of a, a member of the House of Assembly, to repeat. But the end, I end up going to jail uh, for the night. And um, you know, you see a place just filled up, overflowing with black people, in jail in Atlanta. And then, uh, Mr. Speaker, I went on to, to Indiana. At this time, I had locks in my hair. I looked like Bob Marley's son. <laughs> I had locks in my hair. I used to drive between Indiana and, Ch and Chicago. And I, it was very early in the morning, and I was tired. So I was struggling to stay awake while I was driving. So I was driving sometimes a little slowly, and then I pressed the gas a little bit. And then I slowed down a little bit, I pressed the gas a little bit. So a police officer figured, well, something seems wrong here, and pulled me over. And I, I would never forget uh, watching the police in my rear view mirror with his hand on his holster. He actually had, had his hand on the gun and said, put your hands on the steering wheel and don't move. Um, 
And I didn't even realize how much danger I was in, Mr. Speaker. Because I started, first thing I started to do is fumble, fumble around looking for my license. And he put, told me to put my hands on the steering wheel. And I, I didn't realize how quickly I could have been gone, Mr. Speaker. And because of the threat, the perceived threat, they don't see the fact that you're from the BVI. You know, they just see the fact that you're, that you're a black man. And the way that black men are perceived all over the world. And I, I even went up to the United Kingdom, Mr. Speaker, and went through a similar experience. Uh, persons wouldn't know, but there were two uh, undercover officers in a black community. And they saw me in a neighborhood. I went to a friend's house. The friend wasn't there. And I was waiting around until the friend showed up. And I see these two undercover officers. And they end up accusing me of breaking into people's homes. And they want to search my bag. And my bag, which was full of school books. Or oh, search me for a crowbar. And I decided you're not, you're not going to search me because I didn't do anything to merit that type of harassment. And those two officers and myself had a little tussle. We had a little wrestling match. They, um, I mean, we knock off, side mirror off our, our, our cars, you know, and um, it took me, them a good while before they got me on the ground. And then I had a, a group of police officers there in the UK because they had to call for backup. Yeah, they had to call for backup for me. You know, because that Christopher Fleming kind of thing was, was present. But they had to get the backup. And when the backup came, they had a, a whole circle of officers surround me. And they started to push me around in the circle. And then I just asked, uh, I asked uh, somebody who was walking by to just, just stand up and watch. And um, after I said that, because it was, it was high day, they decided to, first they took the bags out of my, um, the books out of my bag and just threw them on the ground. And then they left. But just, I just gave those few stories uh, to show Mr. Speaker that we here in the Virgin Islands are not immune from racism. You know, we travel all the time. Um, we have many family members who, and we have children. I know the um, Honorable Rhymer's children are in the United States, I believe, going to school. Yeah, we have the premiers, Honorable Premier's children are in the United States. We have Honorable um, Neville Smith as children in the United States. So um, we're not immune from this racism. And I think it's important that all of us stand together globally against uh, racism. And because we, we still have a very far way to go. With those few words, Mr. Speaker, I will um, take my seat. But just to say, Mr. Speaker, it's, it's been a historic day in the House of Assembly uh, with the passage of, of some of the bills, the Trade Commission Bill, um, the Consumer Protection Bill. And I know we have another sitting on Thursday. So I would say, Mr. Speaker, that we are active. We are active government um, putting forward the policies, the legislation, the initiatives to be able to advance this territory. And I'm, I'm proud to be a part of this government. And even though it's a very difficult time, I think we're going to make a lot of progress here in this territory. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the minister and the member for the seventh district. I recognize the leader of the opposition and member for the eighth district, the Honorable Mallon A. Penn.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the opportunity to make my contribution first for a very long time under other business. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I know you're tired. You've been at it for it's the third sitting, third session of this sitting, and all of us have been at it. Uh, the Premier, through the farm, I'm here to make sure that this sitting is official, to make sure that the numbers um, continue, because I, I, I believe that we all have a responsibility to ensure the business of the people, not the business of the government. It's the business of the people is conducted, and I'm, I, I take that responsibility very seriously. Specifically, I want to acknowledge the people of the 8th District who sent me here, who've sent me here now for a third term to represent their interests. I am always grateful whenever I get an opportunity to speak, to acknowledge them for the confidence they've placed in me and for the privilege that I have to represent their interests and represent their concerns in this honorable house people that I love, people that I care deeply about, the Eastern Lalo community, Hope Hill, and all points in between. Mr. Speaker, I too, before I go into the details of what I want to say, I promise to try my best to be brief because the night is far spent and I think we need to get home. All of us staff has been here a while working tirelessly. Um, give condolences to persons who have lost loved ones over the last few weeks and months as my colleague and, and neighbor in the 7th District has said, well, our community has been wrapped with death after death of persons within our community, um, extended all the way up to the 9th District, persons who have lost um, loved ones during this difficult time. I remember um, Reverend Idris O'Neill, former First Lady, who passed recently. My condolences go out to our daughter, Abby, and the extended Christopher family and all the other relatives. Um, persons like the Bryan family who lost Mr. Bryan recently, my classmate, friend, um, QT, um, KK, and, and, and those individuals, they originally lived in Sikaos Bay and were in their district, but they have now resided up in Shepherd Hill in the Lambert Estate area in, in East End. I want to express deepest condolences to the extended family uh, Kishma George uh, from in Greenland, cousin Charlie, his mom, Flory, who lost their young sister just recently. Um, condolences go to the extended family um, within the Rapsat Thomas family in Long Look, very large family. I know they're, they're mourning the loss of Kishma during this very difficult period. And all the families in our community throughout the territory who has lost loved ones, if I have missed anyone, I know Ms. Ketura Maloney, who passed recently, the family of, in Greenland, uh, Konosis go out, and the Foy family up in Foy Hill, uh, Matcha, um, Ms. Foy, Fort Hill, sorry, Matcha, and Ms. Foy, who lost her son, Konosis extended to that family. And all the other families, as I said, who have lost loved one during this very difficult time. So, Speaker, I would also like to join my colleagues as well to acknowledge the work that was done by our frontline teams as, we, as they work diligently, the Premier, the Minister of Health, and all the members who played their role in ensuring that this territory remains safe during this very difficult time. Through COVID-19, all the persons within all the communities who worked when we had, as a member for the seventh, so rightfully raised, who worked to support and be their brother's keeper. It's something that is innate in us as Virgin Islanders and Belongers. We always rise to the occasion when we are in need, when our brothers and sisters are in need. It is something that we saw during Hurricanes Irma and Maria. It is something that we must find a way to ensure that we have that spirit of togetherness and brotherhood consistently throughout this territory because once that is instilled in all of us, in our, young, our youngsters coming up, the sky's the limit in terms of what we can achieve as a territory, as a people. And I want to commend the persons, my committee, the people from the 8th District who came out and went above and beyond, many of those persons are already listed, to help 
their brothers and sisters in need. And that need will continue as we move forward. As a territory, as the concerns deepen, because the reality is, though we've made tremendous strides during this COVID-19 pandemic, we have to be mindful of some of the realities coming out of this situation and cannot rest on our laurels and be able to put things in place to ensure that, one, we learn how to coexist with this disease because it seems like it's not going anywhere anytime soon. It is important for us to have the necessary protocols in place to keep our people safe, but also to ensure that we cultivate and maintain their livelihoods as we move forward as a territory. And we have the ingenuity and the ability as a people to ensure that that is accomplished. The reality is that we have to do it. It's not the same um, necessity is the mother of all invention. And COVID-19 has, has put us in a point where we have to adapt. We have to innovate. We have to figure out how can we walk and coexist with COVID-19. And that is our burden to bear as leaders, as persons put in charge of the public's, um, are put in charge of the people of this territory to ensure that we make life better for those individuals. So, Speaker, there's an issue. I, I am typically an easygoing guy, very thick skin, and you grow up in Eastern and Long. Look, you learn to be, have skin like crocodile. You learn to be tough. You learn to be rugged, rugged, rugged and rigid. You heard about the Christopher, Christopher Flemings and, 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 and of that nature. Um, I am a descendant of that breed of individuals, as is the member for the seventh, as is that large member Smith, as is that large member Malone. But sometimes, as one of my former cousins in this, of this armor house used to say, you have to take up your law and look sense. And, and if a lie is told often enough without a response, it tends to become the truth. And I'm not suggesting any other members of, in this house of lying, but what I would say is that they talk, spoke their truth as they know it. And we all are entitled to our opinion, but we're not entitled to our own facts. And that was Honorable Eileen Parson, my good cousin up in up Long Trench. Because a statement was made recently, and it's been playing over and over on the radio. I, 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 tend, I said I would forget it and I would let it move on. But there were things that are being alleged. Persons continue to call me and said, if you said these things, or if you imp imply these things, and if you are suggesting these things, it means that persons are believing some of the things that are being said. And I need to clarify some of the things that were said. Like my honorable colleague in the back clarified today, I think it's important for us to ensure that the record is set straight. And I had to go back and actually read what was said, because I, didn't, I don't normally pay attention to those things. And, and I think it was important for me to go back and read based on the calls that I was getting. And I know the member, the member means well. The member is, is somebody that I like, is, is, a, is a good guy. We, 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 we share a border. I'm sure he's trying to be, I don't know, I, let me not speak for the member. But I had to go back to what I actually said and what incited the comments that were made. And I'll break it down. There, there, there are some things, Mr. Speaker, you have to bear with me as I, as I deal with this. And I promise I won't be more than 10 more minutes. Mr. Speaker, concerning, I first, I first want to say that as members of this honorable house, we all have our role to play. We have our, our roles and our responsibility to the people of this territory. Responsibility of accountability and transparency in all our dealings. Because at the end of the day, we're dealing with public funds. We're not dealing with our own funds. 
the initiatives, the plans, the things that we're pushing forward for the best interest of the people must always be, we must always be forthright and accountable to the people of this territory. That's why we have the systems of accountability, the Public Accounts Committee, the different audited financial reports, and the things that are happening to ensure that when we conduct the public's and the people's business, we do it in a transparent and accountable fashion. Mr. Speaker, in response to the Premier's release concerning the stimulus, I express not just my concern, Mr. Speaker, but concern raised by many members of this territory regarding how the funds were appropriated as relates to the $40 million that were appropriated as grants from the Social Security Board. And the comments that I made was that I call on the Premier to explain, to justify, in the context of the Board's financial position, its long-term sustainability, and more specifically, its legality in terms of the grant that was given, considering the grant was one of the largest in the history ever given by the board. And it's something that I believe that if you're going to take $40 million of pensioners' money, it is important for you to clarify, to give reason how and why that money is being used and appropriated as grant. I think that's a fair request. And I, 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 wanted, I said that because I wanted to be clear what I said that's prompted, that seemed to have prompted the response that is playing three or four times at the on the radio. And I did put out the response in writing and verbally so that persons could hear what I said. But in the response, and, and I was forced to go look, to look at it, Mr. Speaker, and there were of three or four things that jumped out at me, and I think it was important for me to address those issues because, as I said, if these things go unchallenged or unchecked, they form a perception of you, of your character, and of your intent. And I'm not going to ever let somebody's opinion or their perceived view form who I am as an individual. And I wanted to make sure that these five issues were addressed this evening. So, Speaker, one of the areas that was of concern is that there was this attempt by the minister responsible for Social Security Board to equate the grant given to grants given previously. And he listed out some of the grants that were highlighted. And somehow, the, the most and the highest of which was $1.5 million, which was given to the Health Services Authority to ensure that there's the requisite equipment for that, the hospital to function. $1.5 million, Mr. Speaker, in comparison to $40 million as a grant. And as, as I said earlier, the intent was to understand and to clarify the rationale for the monies being used. And as, as early on two weeks ago, my colleagues and I put out a document that outlined some ideas, some, 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 some um, proposals, suggestions to the government, and how they could go about assisting the people of this territory, which included support from Social Security, but in the way of a funded support, that the monies will go back to the pensioners of this territory. Because at the end of the day, the $40 million that we're talking about, when you talk about a grant, that is monies that will leave and never to be returned. And a grant of that magnitude requires proper explanation. The minister went on to say that I have selected memory about the grants that were, were given previously. And there's no way 
that you can equate $1.5 million at the highest end to $40 million grant of the pensioners and people's money. One of the other areas that concerned me was the aspersion that was cast, or the, con the comment was made in terms of I didn't have make any comments when it related to monies that were given to the National Bank of the Virgin Islands. I don't know what's being suggested there, Mr. Speaker, but what I will say is that that particular investment, and that's what it was, not a grant, but an investment made by the Social Security Board at, a, at that time in 2016 was an investment in the bank, the government-owned bank, I might add, where the government has subsequent, the Social Security Board owns 33% of the National Bank of the Virgin Islands. Anyone who understands how banks work and how they operate, banks require capitalization. There are certain ratios that are required for a bank to be able to lend money to persons who engage with business with banks. And what the Social Security did was an investment in the National Bank, not a grant. And to suggest somehow that something untowards occurred, especially coming from the minister responsible for the portfolio, who should understand that the way that the Social Security Board works is that it ensures that it invests the funds that are being deposited by the, the contributors, the, essentially pension funds, to enable that is amortized in a way to have the monies over a certain period of time. Considering that persons are living longer than the NAMI do, the NAMI did, keeps people are living up in, in the 80s, 90s, some persons, and will continue to get their contributions. And there's a formula that is used to ensure that those persons have that support over time. So the monies have to be invested to ensure that that obtains going forward. The reality is, is that the Social Security Board invests its monies around the globe. Investments are made in Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, in the United States. These are banks. These are banks that borrow, borrow money to U.S. Um, persons within the U.S. to build homes, to buy homes, to do all sorts of things in the U.S. So I don't want the people to, of the territory to get the idea, because you see this floating around in the public space already, that somehow investing in your own person, your local bank, and investing in your people is a problem. It's a bad idea. So I wanted to make that clear, that that investment was an investment for the people of this territory, so that that bank could offer loans to our people. It's our people who borrow from National Bank. It's our people who have mortgages with National Bank. All people who have land loans with National Bank. And Social Security made an investment in this territory and in our people. So we need to not, when we're in leadership positions, not play politics with very critical institutions, the very serious issues that all people face. Speaker, another suggestion that was made is that somehow the assertion that why is the Honorable Leader of Opposition trying to taint and block legitimate assistance from reaching the BVI citizenry at the greatest time of need? Mr. Speaker, that is dog whistle politics. And it's suggesting to the people of this territory that somehow me, that I am trying to taint or or black person from this territory from getting support and assistance. Speaker, it is false, it is alarmist, and it creates an insinuation about my character, what I'm suggested to do. I think it's unbecoming, and I think believe that's something that I, I think needs to be addressed, and something that I'm deeply concerned that a minister of government will make these assertions in the public space. Speaker, and, and, and the most alarming of, of the comments that were made, and I think I have to say this, and, and, and to suggest that 
somehow I was trying, I somehow with the comments, and you heard the comments that I made, and I read them out, tried to malign the character, the reputation of the Minister of Finance, not the Minister, the Financial Secretary, the Chairman of the Board, the Executive Director of the Board, and the members of the Board of Social Security Board. So Speaker, again, dog whistle politics, destructive, disruptive politics, has no place in this territory, Mr. Speaker. And I, and I wanted to make it clear that I hold those individuals in the highest esteem, the highest order, and their contributions to this territory that they can make and continue to make to this territory. And I think it's important for me, I think it was important enough for me to put on record that those statements are inflammatory, they're very suggestive, and, and borderline def defama defamatory, if you ask me. So Speaker, at the end of the day, and I'm happy that I heard the Premier today mention that he will bring to the Honorable House what happened as it relates to the $40 million grant that is being provided for the people of this territory. I think that's a good point. I think that, is a, that should have been first and foremost on the, on, the, on the docket on the agenda to ensure that we have a discussion as a house because if you're taking $40 million of pensioners' money, $40 million that is going as a grant, there needs to be some clarity. We need to understand the financial position of the board. We know that the board invests a lot of its funds in the U.S. stock market. We know that there were some challenges recently with the U.S. stock market. We don't know what is the current state of affairs with the funds invested in the U.S. stock market. And if it's strong, that means that's good for us as a people, good for us as a territory. But the people of this territory, the pensioners of this territory, we need to know. We need to know all the details because at the end of the day, this is public funds. This is funds that the pensioners are looking forward to when upon their retirement at 65. I have been a contributor to the Social Security Board since I was 17 years old. I left high school. I stayed out for two weeks, and for the, for the next 27 years, I've contributed. And as a pensioner, I think it's important. I should know. All of us who contribute to the fund should know how that money is going to be spent, how that money is going to be used, and what it means for the fund in the, in the strength and stability of the fund and the longevity of the fund going forward. So, Speaker, it's important for us to be transparent, to be open and accountable with the people's funds, and I, agree, and I commend the Premier for making that statement earlier today to ensure that that information is forthright in this Honorable House, that we have that discourse as all 13 members elected by the people. The Social Security Board is established through statute, and we as elected members have a responsibility to the pensioners and the people of this territory as it relates to their finances. So, Speaker, additionally, I am, I just wanted to ensure that, that those comments and comments suggesting that, that we somehow are destroyers and dividers and selfish individuals are not so. We as a, I in, I in particular came forward with ideas to move this country forward because I believe that people of this territory are hurting. We see it in what is happening around the territory. The level of unemployment is through the roof. We have serious and, and serious issues. Uh, my colleague for the ninth, who's a good friend, he's a good guy, I think we're gonna have a, a cup of juice sometime over the weekend. Um, and discuss some of these issues, but I think I needed to let the public know that that is not the position of myself, not the position of any of my colleagues on this side. For us, it's important for us to ensure that there's transparency in what we do, there's accountability in the process, and we have to ensure that we account properly for the funds of the people of this territory. The issue of unemployment, I heard the member for the ninth Minister for Natural Resources and Labor talk about it. Um, the, the, the issue 
Typically, unemployment breeds crime. When you have large um, fractions of unemployment in a territory, it breeds crime. And I want to commend the member, though. I saw he had an a, a online forum to discuss the issue of crime with the people of the territory, the people of that nine district in particular. And it speaks to the issue that I raised early on in this process of COVID-19, the issue of the economy, the issue of we might survive the health, health aspect of it, but we have to figure out how we're going to strategically navigate the economic issues that we're facing as a country. How are we going to, as a, as a government, not just the executive, but as a 13 elected members of this territory, assist and support the people of this territory in transitioning through these economic issues. Just because I have some concerns, and I heard one of the members discuss that, Premier, I think you're having Thursday, you're gonna tell us how the details of accessing the $300,000 and details of accessing support, members accessing support of social security funding, unemployment funding, accessing all the other issues with electricity and so forth. But members have already reached out and they've expressed some of the concerns that they have in terms of ensuring that, that funds, those funds get to them as soon as possible. So Speaker, one of the concerns raised in terms of the eligibility through Social Security, uh, I think that eligibility issue is something that we have to have a discussion on, because you have persons who have been struggling between Hurricanes Irma and Maria, just up about COVID-19, to get employment. I know persons who've gotten employment two weeks before the shutdown and are told that they don't have any support because they're not affected by COVID-19 or they don't meet the eligibility, but they are infected by COVID-19. So how are we going to support those persons? And it can't just be through the district funds. We have to, and those are persons who are working prior to Hurricanes Irma Maria and have made contributions. So we have to figure out how to support persons like that. Then you have persons who have been working with an employer, worked for many, many years. Employer has been taking out their contributions. Contributions have not been paid into Social Security, but the employee is now being told that they're not eligible. They can't get that support. These are real concerns. You know, we have to figure out and we have to be in a, in a, in a streamlined way to ensure that the people who are truly in need of the support gets the support. And I, I know, Premier, once we sit down, we could discuss this and figure out a way to ensure that we don't burden the system at the same time, but ensure that people who really need the help gets the help. One of the issues that we'll raise is specifically with a taxi, the taxi men and persons who are in the taxi industry. Those are individuals who are going through a very difficult time because tourism is down. That's their main bread and butter. Even if they could run locally, there are restrictions because of COVID-19 and the passenger base that they could run. And you're talking about running vessels or their buses with a passenger load that can't pay for the fuel or the operation costs to run the bus. So we have to figure out a way, and I, and I, and I, and I commend you for giving that support and bringing that support forward. But the process for accessing that support, there are persons who their main business was traffic, was transporting school children. That is gone. How are we going to then help those persons transition? Um, so, so just the details, Premier. I think one of the challenges that people are facing is that they don't understand the details and the bureaucracy to how to get through the red tape to ensure that they get the support that they need. And, and we need to figure out how to ensure that we help our people through that process, make sure that it's clear in terms of the details so that we, as the elected members, also could point persons in the right direction to get the support that they need moving forward and ensure that the people get as smooth as transition as possible through in this very difficult time. I too would like to also say to the people of the district, I know I'm wrapping up now, Mr. Speaker, that the, we're still waiting on the guidance for the $300,000 to support persons during this very difficult time to supplement the support to persons. I too, like the member for the seven, believe that some, much of that money could be used for in initiatives within our communities. 
um, to get persons back to work, get them you know, mean, get meaningfully engaged into the development of their communi or communities around the territory. I think that's an option that should be on the table, Premier, option that we should utilize uh, some type of work for pay program that's important for us to really get our people back to work, help to build up our infrastructure at the same time, help prepare us for the economy as we reopen, to look at reopening the economy. And I believe tourism is a critical component for us to get this economy back up and running. I really want to encourage us, Premier, to come up with a strategy. We propose a strategy to transition the reopening of tourism. I think the conversation needs to start in terms of how that will happen. BVI has always been leaders in this area, and we need to continue to lead and not follow, and come up with an innovative approach to one, keep our people safe, keep the territory safe, and two, to ensure that we find a way to get employment going within the territory. Um, we have to figure out how to ensure that that happens. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's too, the member is saying it's too late for those kind of deep conversations. Um, but you have the conversation when you can. But I will, we have another meeting on Thursday. Uh, I think I will continue the conversation there. But I want to say that we really need to figure out how we can make that happen how we could get the right protocols in place, because especially the sister, sister mm -hmm. islands. My colleague in the ninth district, his people are suffering. They're hurting. You see it lashing out in a way things are happening there right now. We need to find a way to get Jasmine Dyke moving again, get the aid moving again, because we in, had, was enjoying a little bit of the tourism dollars. On the Long Bay Beach was employed over 60, 50 persons, I counted the other day. 50 persons were employed doing various things on that beach, from the taxi drivers to the person with the umbrellas, the chairs, the, the little beach bars that were there. 50 persons were employed. The little, the little um, cabanas and boats that those guys were renting. So, so there's opportunities that were lost. So we have to figure out how we transition back to giving those persons opportunities again. And I'm, and I'm open up suggested ideas. We've suggested ideas, and I will continue to do so because at the end of the day, it is what's in the best interest for the people of this territory. It should be first and foremost on all of our minds, all 13 of us in this humble house. So again, Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to clarify those couple of things. I, I know the minister has to do what he has to do, but I, has to do, I have to do what I have to do as well. And, and I want the public to know there's no ill will, no animosity, but at the end of the day, you have to ensure that there's clarity. I continue to fight for the people of this territory, fight for their interests, fight to ensure that things are available to help persons transition through this very difficult time. So we have to ensure also, while we do that, ensure there's accountability and transparency. So I look forward to the discourse, Amber Premier, as we talk about the funding and how this fund is going to be allocated, and as we move forward as a territory to get the economy going again, get our people back gainfully employed, and ensure that this country continues to move as we transition through this COVID-19 era. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank you, Minister. I crave the members' indulgence, and have a pleasant good evening. I thank the member for the 8th District for his contribution. At this time, I recognize the Premier and Minister of Finance, a member for the 1st District the Honorable Andrew A. Foy. Mr. Speaker, I really will go ahead and close off and say good night. But where the leader of the opposition gone there, I have to praise him up because he went a little low. We're going to be honest with you. So I'll start on a simple note for us. I want to thank the people of the entire territory for working with this government. During this COVID-19 era. Because it's not a simple time. And, and the, the government is not immune to what all is happening. So when persons are giving the people the impression that we could just 
get the money and get everything back going as how it was. That, Mr. Speaker, is misleading. The government itself was shut down for nearly two months. So the government has to do some, some rearranging and reassessment of expenditures also because we don't want to fall into deficit spending because when you lose two months of revenue, that's quite a bit. So we, we're in the process of doing some rearranging of the spending. But Mr. Speaker, you see this Social Security money? This thing will create an issue, you know? Because everyone um, listening would think that you just walk in, went in for the Social Security with an empty bag and come back out with a bag full of $40 million, and that was it. We had to produce a plan. We had to produce where the money was going. And Mr. Speaker, if we're going to go deep into Social Security funds, well, this is going to have some people feeling get hurt. Because a lot of things hasn't been told to the people over the years dealing with all Social Security funds. But the minute you're going to get money to invest in people in the middle of a, a pandemic where you don't want your people to, 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 and us to have to go to the reserve force, and you come out with a grant of $40 million. Mind you, there were pressures from, from, the, from the governor and the opposition, both of them telling the people he can spend the reserve, go bring a plan, 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 go bring the money, go bring a plan, go bring the money, go bring a plan. You bring the plan with the money, and they said, not so, not so, not so. You should get a loan. You should get a grant. You should come here for us. Well, we're going to come and bring it, because the house needs to be known. The people hurting, and let us not fool ourselves. People need clarity because there are those in the opposition intentionally misleading the people on the street. They're intentionally doing it. I'm hearing it too. I wasn't going to bring it up, but I'm hearing it. And they're intentionally making persons feel like the government don't care about them. That time you're working hard to keep everybody safe and alive with COVID, and you're in the middle of a financial crisis, and you're still trying to find ways to help the people. And the $300,000 for each district representative, we're going to have guidelines for it, but you're going to use it to help the people. Don't run from it. You're in your own district. Be your own government. Help the people. But I want to just take some time to thank the people of the Falls District for giving me six storms to be here. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to take some little time off soon to make sure that, um, not time off, but spend some time down in the force to attend to a few matters now that you're trying to get things on a little even keel nationally. Go along there and give them some TLC. Just want this week here to finish off and we get the clear access of the funds so that they don't lose out on theirs neither. But Mr. Speaker, I have to ask the leader of opposition, my good friend, because he's, he said we don't want to play certain kinds of politics. But I am amazed and I am thankful because some said don't go back there. But I didn't hear this voice from the leader of opposition when he was over here and they took his $8 million for the sewage project, which he didn't get done yet for East End Long Look, and put it to the pair pack. I didn't hear it. But it didn't come out as loud as it come out now then. But I didn't hear you, if, even if you said a whisper there, I didn't hear your voice when they went with the $7.2 million for the plane. But more so, and, and, and it, it's beginning to look like that money came from, based on the figure that should have gone into NHI. Which means years later now, we, to catch an NHI, we had to go for the grant and still take out $7.5 million out of the grant to put back for NHI because that money seems to have gone to the plane and not the people. So it went to a P, which was a plane, but it went to the people. But Mr. Speaker, let's go into Social Security and we have to bring out everything. Because when you bring out the money to help the people, Every, there are those now who make this sound like you commit a federal crime. But let's go into Social Security. 
up to now, we ain't finished getting those 60 million dollars down packed with the roads. Remember that money that we took out to do roads? The roads was there, never. So we have to go, go, go into that since people going into Social Security for the 40 million, and the 40 million is properly, properly passed out, you know. 7.5 million dollars to NHI. One million dollars to help with the same transportation. One million dollars with social development to help with certain programs. 6.5 million dollars to help with the grants of businesses. Nine million dollars to help with the housing um, project. And a and million dollars to, to do some research in terms of legal in, 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 um, and also legislative changes to NHI to make it more um, sustainable, or make it sustainable, God, right now it is not, make it sustainable and broaden the scope so that it can even mushroom like the Social Security and also while at it to create the unemployment grant that the, the leader of opposition, the opposition is speaking about. Can I tell you that that, that grant was on the record now for years and nobody brought it forward? Where was the zest to bring it forward then? What we're going to bring forward was then Social Security told us all the time that these things here, they were asking for them to come forward, but they never came forward. So we told them to bring the unemployment um, um, grant or, or scheme forward. The member, at large member, Deputy Speaker, made a great suggestion. Since we're doing 8.5%, just take off 1%. And put it towards the unemployment, and then let the social security part, what we're paying all the time, remain at set, go to seven and a half percent, rather than tacking on another percentage. But we have to speak about this social security because, in case there are those who are running saying as if we did something wrong, all I did is try to, with this government is to help the people out of the Virgin Islands with their money, their money. Who pays it? We. The leader of opposition said he pays Social Security since 18 years. When, he, when will he get any benefit? Only if he takes sick. He can't get pregnant. So it's only if he takes sick. So at the end of the day, when, when will most people get any benefit out of their Social Security money? And you're in the middle of a pandemic. Well, some people say, well, if you, if, if you don't be careful by 2050, there'll be no funds. Well, if you're in a wrong by 2050, what funds are you worrying about? We're in a pandemic trying to save lives. And let me put it this way. It is not a handout. It's an investment. Because if you don't help the businesses to get back on their feet, you can't get employment. And if you don't get employment, nobody can start to pay back Social Security or Inland Revenue or NHI. So you could hold the money and have it there till 2050, but most of us dead, in terms of businesses gone, persons gone, or you could put some investment over here and say, all right, let's bring back up the economy, because the more the economy becomes buoyant, the better for Social Security. But let me move a step further. Let me move a step further. They're going in some areas that you need to Social Security and borrow tomorrow. How much of our money that they invest abroad and lost? How much of our money was invested abroad and lost and the people of the Virgin Islands don't even know that? And they'll tell you lost on paper because it, it was on top of what was invested and whatever the case. The point is, no matter how it was lost, it was lost. The markets went down, they failed. And we're talking about more than $70 million. But yes, when it bounced back, they get back some of it. So how could we have so much confidence to invest abroad? and lose sometimes, although they've done well. But let's face the fact, since people won't be tackling me on it, I'm coming forward too. I ain't going in no corner. So how we could lose so much money abroad and can't spend $40 million now, people have the investment locally? Well, let's go a little further. Since we're going to the Social Security money, did anybody ever ask how much money was paid for all these lands and who they were bought from? Well, let's find out. Ask us that question. Let's see if it was help for the needy or if it was help for the greedy. 
So what is wrong now if we help the people with some money as an investment when others don't get help? I learned a long time ago to be respectful, but at the same time too, you can't have people punching you and you have information and you start to go behind a wall singing Kumbaya, my lord. We coming forward? Banana tree. A banana tree. Let's look now here at some other areas. I like every investment social security did, even abroad. But did anybody ask me what to do with my money? I pay anything, I, all of us is part of it. When they invested it abroad, they asked me. They couldn't possibly come to everybody. They had to make one of the most calculated, intelligent decisions, and they made it, and it was good. So they did it abroad, that's fine. They lost some of it, they made some monies. That's fine, but that's never reported. Then you turn around and you look and you see they made investments in land. I don't mind. 80? Is, 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 I won't say the figure. We can get that correct. I don't want to say the wrong figure. But it wasn't a little bit. And even while we are negotiating, I could tell you, one of the negotiations was they told me, well, if you have that amount of a land in government, we could buy it from you rather than giving you the grant. So I said, well, I don't understand that. I went about three weeks negotiating hard to try to get this money to help the people. And I'm going to defend my wicked. Then when you look and you see, Social Security gives money out and they have a social, civic, socioeconomic duty to help the community. But do they ask us first? When they give to all them NGOs, they give to the hospital, they give all about. Those are things I'm glad for. I'm not against them, I'm for them. But do they ask us? So now the time come where you're going and you say, well, you need this for the people. You know why persons um, on the street chattering about a $40 million grant? Let's tell the truth. They were hoping that we fail. They were hoping that we didn't get no help for the people. And we're supposed to bring it here to the house. We want to bring it here, cabinet and everywhere. But they were hoping that we fail. Because I learned some people, you have to be careful and some people tell you they're praying for you because they don't know what you're praying, what you, what they're praying for you for. The opposition have their job to do and they don't intend to fail it on it. And we have our job to do and I don't intend for us to fail in it, neither in us does any minister, any backbencher. I'm not going to let anybody make me feel bad for doing good. And I could account for that $40 million, left, right and center. We're putting systems in place and not even to me could touch it. And when we see in the systems are put in place, if they're too rigid, then we ask them to review it. But they won't say that Iris Bay went there, any other money. But can we say that with a lot of other money that come out of Social Security before? No. It's too late. But look in the middle of COVID-19. In the middle of COVID-19, the pair pack now could pay dividends for 2018. That's what the dividends is for, 2018, in the middle of COVID-19. And Social Security was an investor in that, and they got a check for over $400,000. And that should have been given today, and the investors given their money today close to a hundred and something, almost two hundred thousand dollars. They give a statement on it last week. And that's in the middle of COVID-19, and then help the, the store owners there to get one month off, and then 75% off, and then 75% off. That's in the middle of COVID-19. So we got to start to look and see what was happening all the other times. So here now, the same. Government make sure that we put things in place to get them back some money now for their investment. We ain't hearing anything about that. Then you hear some telling you that you should get $20 million in a grant and $20 million in a, in a soft loan. Well, 
The point about it is we got what we went in to negotiate. But I will ask the opposition, all of them over there tonight, all of them that are over there tonight, I will ask them, well, why they didn't went into Social Security during 2017 when all hope was lost and negotiate the same thing? They had the same Social Security there. They, they, they had the government, 11. Why didn't they go in and do it then? What did they get out of Social Security then when people had lost hope? Do you know what $40 million would have done for us from back then as a grant? But we also, I'll bring that for you, we also got getting a grant for $2 million to help with the East End Lagoon Sewage Program project. So I'm going to bring that so we could get that started for the people. But I'm telling you, I know you have your job to do, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. And I, I know some of them send you to make sure that you make some of the points and you did it. So I admire you for that. But you know, I have to answer back. So, so when you have the $2 million now, we are getting a grant for the East End Long Look, and we just launched a program just now that you all started again, but didn't get it off the ground, which is the recovery um, um, fund, the resilience fund. And that was a restoration on the, the farmer government. A good thing again, where they were supposed to set it up so persons from the America could give grants, not to government, but they give um, contribution and tax write-offs to help to do anything with government or NGOs or whatever the case is. Couldn't get it off the ground. Imagine it had donors waiting to give money but couldn't get it off the ground. How come? And we went now and we just launched it the other day and say take off. And we don't get some grants for NGOs through that and get a lot of grants for the government where persons could put their money at that abroad from America and say, I want a tax write off. Put this $5 million towards the sewage in the East End Long Look, for example, or put this money towards this because they have to specifically say where the funds is going. Why wasn't that done in 2017? And why didn't the opposition bring that at the time to because most of them were in the government? But I guess at that time, most of them who are speaking abroad, the plan. They were in the back bench and their voices weren't heard. Now they're letting them who don't lose outside mislead them. But they have the work to do. I won't be disrespectful at all, but remember, Joe Smith said, you trouble me first. But when you look and see some of the things that we're trying to do in COVID-19, since I'm forced to ask this, where was that will to help the people during 2017? We saw the leader of the opposition came in as Minister of Health and coming on the election, you did a marvelous job trying to help the people get their place watertight. But then what stop you? They take most of the money and they put it over the same national bank and turn it into a loan. Send the people them for a loan when they're in distress. I guess it was to slow you down, because you're moving fast, I must admit. When you, I see those actions, and I hear nowadays what's being spoken, I said, no man, this can't be. No, we just take $9 million and put it to start to help people get watertight homes, not a drip drop I dealing with. And the areas where I don't bring clarity yet is what didn't pass by cabinet in terms of policy. Because there are those who are saying this ain't come to the house, they ain't come to cabinet. Whenever they tell me this thing, I thought they were calling to tell me, well, I'm glad they're here helping the people, them calling to see what section of the law they could find to, 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 to hold you on while you're trying to help the people. Man, even if you forget a little section of the law and shut his eye and say, Lord, I have mercy on them because they're trying to help. But whatever section we need to, to adhere to, we adhere to, but all had pure to help the people at the Virgin Islands. And that was an easy grant to get. Now, when we analyze a lot of areas that we're working on, 
Let us even lead out our opposition. My good friend, because when we're done, we're going to drink a cup of tea together and discuss this. Let me look at you, my comrade. Today we pass the Consumer Protection Bill. I'm talking about not only now, but the 40 million. I'm talking about the will to help people. And you did a lot of work. And this is not for you. This is between you and I alone. I don't want anyone to say it. This is just for you and I, the opposition. And you did a lot of work on that. And they said that they couldn't put it in during the hurricane time. And it didn't have on the section that protect people for the, from against price goes in. We got the bill, and it still didn't have on the section that protect people from price, the price goes in that's going on. But when we sat down together and we went to the public meetings and we sat, we said we have to find a way. And we sat down with the attorneys and said, listen, we can't wait for that bill to come in COVID-19. The people are being taken advantage of just like 2017. So we amended the, the, the bill that was passed today to have a allow for regulations during disasters to be implemented by the minister to protect from price gouging and other illegal activities. So now that can click in any time there's a pandemic by the minister with those regulations because the substantial act hasn't been passed yet to protect from price gouging. But we have passed where now we can allow for regulations to do that, to help the people of the Virgin Islands. Where am I going with it? It's late. But when this play over, they'll understand they'll be fresh. Where I'm going with it is this. That same legal vehicle that we use was there for your team to help you if they want to help the people during the hurricane. But we used it. Now, I, I really don't like to have to tell you these things because you are not the author of most of those things. I tell you, don't bring, don't carry those people baggage and bring it, put that thing down. I don't like it because you and I get along well, but when you start, I have to remind you there are a few things well clear enough or certain things here. Now, what we have here too is the, the Minister of Labor make a little speech, you know, and, and you say, well, that he's, he's out of place for what he said. I, I listened to it. I didn't, I didn't hear anything that, I, I didn't hear anything that caught me that he was out of order. I know that in my song had, but he don't mean anything by it. He's just saying that the National Bank, the Social Security Board invested in the National Bank. But I asked persons here now, anyone in the house, to jump up and tell me really quick how much money was invested in the National Bank. I asked anybody here tonight, jump up on your feet quickly and tell me how much money we invest abroad and how much we made and how much we lost. With the Social Security money I'm talking about. I'm asking anyone here for the $16 million that we're doing roads, if what was submitted to Social Security is what we're done. So if we're going to ask to open the chapter on Social Security, and if those who are wrong at asking for it to be open, know that you ain't going to open it and just turn to the chapter name Andrew Fry and close the rest of the book. We're going to open the whole thing. But you are ain't asking to open the whole thing. You're just coming for all 40 million. But all 40 million going to the people as an investment in the people of this territory. Because when the businesses and we pass in cabinet, the process for businesses and they start to get the grants that help them with the, with the taxi fellows, with the transportation, and Honorable Roma start down, start to help them. But the truth of the matter is, I don't want to fool the people of the Virgin Islands. They are hard times ahead. And what we're trying to do is make the best of the hard times ahead, unless a vaccine is found for COVID 19. This is going to be going on for a while. And I'm not going to lose the fact that while we're working on the tourism product, because we have some ideas coming out, 
And I don't get tempted to start by every wind that blows. But notice how if we go on that ball field just looking at that alone, everyone eases off. Okay, you might have done a good job over here, but let's just look at all these other things. The reason we could look for them is because we are alive. And we spend the money to make sure those preventative measures were in place. We, we have done better, and I don't want to say um, in a negative tone or a gloating tone, but praise be to God when I say we, the public officers, HEOC, the minister, and all of us have done better than some of those who want to dictate for us what we need to do. We have saved more lives than them because for, for us, lives matter. And for us, we, the economy matters also, but the lives to be a life force so that you could spend later is what we cared about. We didn't calculate like others how much we could afford to, to die and then start to look about the economy. We didn't do that. Nobody going to make this government feel bad about doing good. Do we have issues? Yes. Do, will we have some more? Yes. But as we go through them, we're going to make sure that we go through them with as a calculated a plan with prayer as possible. Now, I wouldn't go too much further tonight. Because I hear my voice, that's enough. Because I know more things coming with Social Security in the future, so I don't want to let go of all what I have and wait to when the rest come. Because I sense my spirit more coming, more coming, more coming. But as it comes, I don't mind to open the book and say what we did and what we get from Social Security. I have nothing to hide. All I want to tell the people of the Virgin Islands is for all who jump, not talking about this $40 million grant, and it ain't much enough. Seven people saying the same thing seven times a day, and it, it sounds like 49. The rest, people try and look to see how they get the help, and them there in the air, try and confuse the people. Man, tell the people, go by Social Security, apply, see if you can get something in there. And then when trade ready, go by trade, the fishermen, them, go by the premier's office. Tell the people the truth, where they could find the help. The people looking for hope. They ain't looking for confusion. <coughs> They're looking for hope. I'm so glad to know that I give each of you $300,000 so you could go in your district and, and bring hope. So remember the eight, fifth, and all of you, you can put what you want up, do what, do what you need. Be your own government in your own district. And look at it, I ain't play politics with a soul. Whatever one get, all get. So you now could plan out and say, well, all right, I have $300,000. Let me see how I could run an employment program in the district for about two or three months to see how I could help some people. Come up with creative ways. This here is when the Lord had given all of them the same amount um, of, of, of oil in the lamp, the talents. In the, in the know how to use the talent, all 13 of us can get it. We, we get the talent. Let's go see what we're doing, how we use the oil in our lamp. And then, no, 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 no. It's, 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 it's exactly the same thing. Let us see what you do with what was given to you. All of us have the same amount. Let us see. Let me break it down to this and then so it could be accurate. Let us see what we're going to do. All us given the same thing. And the systems, what need to, other systems, we will complement them rather than competing with them. But, but all of a sudden, some, some representative want to run from this money? Is it that they don't want to help the people? Is it that they don't trust themselves to be accountable? What is it? I thought we'd have been welcoming this. But nevertheless, you could run from it right there. You have to deal with it and work with it. This is because I end on a soft note. I'd like to express my sympathies to all those who have lost loved ones in the territory because we have more time to come back to, to these topics. I want to express my deepest sympathy, especially the loss of our dear farmer for us lady, Mrs. Idris O'Neill. You know, and, and I want to thank her for the service over the years that she has given to this country. Uh, being the wife of a premier, a chief minister, or anything is not a simple thing. I always sit down and I have a lot of respect for, for all the force ladies.
no matter whether or we agreed with political methodologies or not, or, or they want within my time. It takes a lot to be married to a leader of a territory because your, your, your time is not yours, and you have to, to juggle between family and for the constituency and the entire territory and the ministries and the ministers. And I went to a primary school here some days, Enos Adams, and one young lady asked me, how does your day begin? And how does it go? And I explained to them how the day goes. And when I was finished, one said, well, I, I don't want your job. Innocent class, I think it was grade three or some of them. But I told them, no, you want to get it handled and you want to do well. But I said that to say that we take these things for granted when people give service. And that's why I love my government side and I love the opposition. Oh, my, I hear speaking, no, I have to speak to lay down the lines because when the opposition say, they say that if said long enough, it will seem as truth. But if they say it long enough too, without we answer anything, it will seem as truth. So what we have to do is keep the balance. I went in opposition for years, I was a professional opposition member. So I understand what the opposition is doing there. They have to do it. That's their role. But remember, I was over there so long that I understand it. So I have to make sure that I cut off these things before they go any further. Because I was in government when I used to be telling them, you have to answer this, and they leave it, and they leave it, and they said they don't want to get in anything. And then they meet some people say, well, don't answer it, leave it alone. God will take care of it. God put us here to do the thing. He said, you are, you are his hands and his feet and his mouthpiece. I saw I lost. When a government lost because we won't answer one thing what was said. So God put us here to defend. And the good thing is when I go sleep at night with that $40 million um, grant, I could go sleep like a baby knowing that there's nothing that anyone could go look into to find. That's not right. The only thing in my mind and my soul and my spirit and the government members keep saying is, is how we could make sure things happen a little faster. Because there are those who didn't want it to happen, so they put things in place to sell on some of the money and then make it look like it's us. And I'm going to call them out since they want to be giving information and playing it in the river and on the bank and think I'm going to be one of the premier. I'm going to sit down and let them play that game with me and get away with it. No, let them continue. I'm going to bring them right here to the people because the people need the help. And if they get in the way of the people, I'm going to hand them over to the people of the Virgin Islands. Because whatever needs to be passed was already passed by the government. Let them go do it. And if what is in place is not helping the people, let them meet again and get them some better packages. I ain't going to be the kind of man that's just going to stand for these things and just stand back and say, well, I don't want to, to ruffle anybody feathers that time. What happened is only creating pressure on me alone. So we're going to get it fixed. We're going to get it fixed accordingly. That's why I don't go out too much, you know. I don't want to get too familiar with, with certain entities here in this place. So when I got to lead and make decisions, I get, get in um, anybody's way. I sit right there at home on my porch, or I go in the village, sit down, speak with some of the old fellows. I want to shoot in a while, but start to do it. And I sit on my porch. I was set of cats there, all of them coming, dog into the neighbor, dog and all the animals coming and sit on there and I cool out. And I make sure that I keep my head clear and say my prayers to help the people of the Virgin Islands. Because a lot of people's future get destroyed in this country through to people getting relationships that they didn't want to offend the people to do what I had to do for the people. That's why I could come in here and pass the consumer protection because I don't have no conflict of interest. Something I should have passed from long ago. That's why we're going to do what we have to do with TRC because I don't have no conflict of interest. Things what could have helped the people from long ago. That's why whether people like it or not, I could have gone and said, listen to me, let us find how to bring people, whether it's popular or not. I believe in that if you help build the Virgin Islands and you're here for years, let's regularize you and we did it. 
That's why you can make those decisions and come and still walk around because I tell God every morning I wake up, don't just bless me, but help me to be a blessing to others and help the government to do the same. And I said this speech as a premier because I've been in some settings where persons try to jam me in a different direction that was not in the best interest of the people. And my government members were me in a meeting and I tell them not I, Andrew, I'll two five. I don't care how much money you have, I can respect you for it. I don't get angry with people who have money because this is what I want to aspire all people to be. But I'm not selling out my people. So whatever I decide for one side, we have to also make sure there's something for the other side. So that's why I had to stay away from certain crowds and they said, well, the Premier didn't come here, you didn't go there. But when I finished making the decision, they said, well, Larry Premier, well, thank you. And then I want to say something else when people telling me, Premier, you're going good, but this member, so Premier, you're going good, but that member, the devil's a liar. I cannot do it without my team. If they don't vote for me, you think it's easy sometimes when I wake up, see them there, the member, Minister of Transport, I said, Premier, where are you going with this one? And I tell them, look, Mr. I have a download. And we have to go in this direction. And they, they, they know when I had and fast on it, I just let it flow. But when I tell them we're going here, they're not in trouble. They're not out for a long day. And when I hear these members say, Premier, I fully agree, but they haven't let us down yet. Let's go ahead. So when people see how we get fast covered with the decisions made, I couldn't do it on my own. And my government members could tell you, you know, I told them we have met more as a government than any other government that I've seen. Nearly every night they want to meet on Zoom to the life while I sleep while they're talking. And we meet and we meet and we talk and Premier, we have to adjust here, we have to do because you need everybody to make it. So my success is sheep in Neville Smith success. My success is Sherry success. My success is Shireen success. My success is Karen success. Is Kai success? Is Natalia success? Is, is Vincent success? Is, is Alva success? So it isn't me alone, it's all of us. So, but all, some of our people believe in trying to get division. So they're going to tell them, well, you need to do a little more. Are doing a lot of supporting the premier. If the last administration has supported their leader, we'd have been further. They're too late for that. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you, and then we'll, uh, we'll adjourn this house, sign a die, because I know that this has stored up enough to have a continuation down the road. And I want the members of the opposition to know you have time, because we have a lot of meetings. I'm running from a thing. Whatever we could answer, we answer. Whatever we can't answer, we get back to you. What, whatever we need to adjust, we adjust it. Even if things sound good. But what I'm not going to let the opposition do is come here with a wish list as if COVID-19 ain't happened and trying to make the people think that we could still get all of these accomplished because um, don't mind the government. Let's fix every basketball court. Let's fix every light. Let's fix everything. And the government was shut down for two months with certain revenue not there. We're trying to help people in the essential areas. So, so there are those who are going on the street and making people think we could do more than what we can do. So I'm watching that, and I'll have last one for y'all. <laughs> so far, all worst case scenario has shown, so far, that the 7% that was put into the money services, I need to end with this one. At the worst case scenario, the 7% right now, so far for the worst week of monies leaving this territory, will yield a minimum right now of $500,000 a piece for each of the five funds that we put the money in. 500000 to help build a senior citizen home, help our seniors. 500000 to help with first-time land and home owners. 500000 to help with scholarships in key areas to help build our economy. 500000 in the fishing industry to, to strengthen that, and 500000 in the agriculture industry to strengthen that. And this is at the worst-case scenario where the economy even ain't booming as yet. 
So if it stays at that amount per week, that is where we're heading by the end of the year. Could you imagine when it picks up? Like we have to build our senior citizen home. I came in here for 20 something years, meeting it, building team, build yet. And soon one of we might need it to sell. The minister I help, he's done up there, he might need it soon. I got to build it so when he ready for it, he could get in and say, well, bye, thank God, if I do something I didn't see first, but I hear in good style, retired. Most of these funds that we do, we attach them on to certain areas to get things done. And even during this COVID-19 area, when we, re we do the budget, some of our funds are going to be attached to specific things. Because I've learned over the years, if you don't do that, you're not going to get anything done, whether it's 4, 12, 16, 20 years later. Because in this business, people don't like to hear this, but in this business, the greedy don't like to get to help the needy if you're impersistent. So, Mr. Speaker, on that note, I want to thank everyone, and we adjourn this house sign and I, because I know we're coming back on Thursday for a fresh sitting with more things to come to be passed in bills to help with the economy. Some controversial, but, but do we shall, because I believe that the Lord has placed a special anointing on the Virgin Islands. And who, and a special appointment of us with destiny to greater things. And who the Lord appoints, he anoints. And who he anoints, he maintains. And who he maintains, he sustains. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I say thank you. Is there a second on adjournment? Yes, Mr. Speaker, I stand in support of the adjournment. A motion has been moved and seconded to adjourn the Honorable House. Those in favor? Those against? This House is adjourned. Signy die.